que además tenemos que, tenemos que demostrarlo de cara al consumidor y la forma de demostrarlo es con una, una autocertificación o una certificación externa. Antonio, Alicia, Manuel, I totally agree with you. And I think this is the information that people from all corners of Europe should know. The European Animal Welfare Commitment. Financiado por la Unión Europea. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. El bienestar animal es un compromiso con nuestros animales, con convicción y por decisión propia. Nos basamos en las directrices de la Organización Mundial de la Salud Animal los avances tecnológicos y en la legislación vigente. Creemos en un mundo donde los animales tienen que ser respetados y se trabaje por su bienestar en toda la sociedad. Ninguno de nuestros animales debe pasar hambre, sed o desnutrición. Garantizamos que tengan una vida libre de temor y de angustia. Que vivan libres de molestias físicas y térmicas. Y que puedan manifestarse con un comportamiento natural. Trabajamos con el compromiso de una sola salud, preveniendo lesiones o enfermedad. Mejoramos la relación entre los animales, su entorno y las personas que los cuidan. Porque en nuestra casa los animales deben tener una protección y un cuidado incluso mayor que en la naturaleza. Financiado por la Unión Europea. We are in the middle of the countryside, a stone's throw from the nearest provincial capital, not to mention Puerto del Sol or Las Ramblas, where thousands of consumers Eduardo. are increasingly concerned about animal welfare, Eduardo. as it should be. According to the latest Eurobarometer, 94% of consumers demand the protection and care of farm animals. More importantly, the public wants to know about the animal treatment of the products they buy in the supermarket. Even if we are a handful of kilometers away from the nearest supermarket, here too, we are fully committed to animal welfare. For a start, because they are our life. 
Isn't that right, Manuel? Yo mi vida sin el campo y sin la ganadería, sin los animales, no me la imagino porque porque para mí esto es un mundo y, y, y yo me divierto en, en mi oficio y, y, me, y le echo mucha pasión. Would you be able to dedicate yourself to this profession without your passion for animals? Yo creo que una persona que no le guste el campo y que no le gusten los animales, en la vida se puede dedicar a esto porque esto es muy sacrificado, el reloj no se puede mirar ¿Aló, porque ¿Aló? la mayoría ¿Aló? de los días, vamos, eso de las ocho horas, olvidado. Y, y, y muy sacrificado en los días de fiesta y los días de esto porque los animales hay que cuidarlos todos los días. And I think you have passed that passion on to your daughter, the farm vet, Reyes. When did you decide that you wanted to do this? Pues yo decidí ser veterinaria desde prácticamente desde que tengo uso de razón. Nunca he, me ha gustado otra profesión ni he buscado que me guste otra cosa. Es más, cuando hice mi bachillerato y mi selectividad, dije si no entro en veterinaria. Me voy directamente al campo y no hago otra cosa, no me lo planteo. Los animales son muy gratificantes. El tú haces una cosa sin que te puedan decir, porque indudablemente ni hablan ni te dicen me duele aquí, me duele allí, pero el ver que mejoran o, por ejemplo, el nacimiento de un ternero, de un parto complicado, es de las cosas más gratificantes. Manuel, I think your daughter has inherited respect for the welfare of animals from you. Yo creo que sí, vamos, yo, yo intento inculcarle a ella que un poco la escuela que yo he tenido y le he visto a mis padres y a mis abuelos siempre dándole el toque de modernidad porque el mundo evoluciona, pero, pero que vayan, hombre, que se acuerden de sus raíces. But welfare must be respected both in the field and on the farms where Manuel and Reyes calves pass through. Miguel, how is it working here? Pues en este sabadero trabajamos cuatro veterinarios en el que continuamente estamos velando por su sanidad, garantizando además que cada animal tenga eh, superficie suficiente, controlando la densidad de corrales para ¿Aló? disminuir problemas ¿Aló? sanitarios ¿Según? y ofreciéndole al animal puntos de agua eh, suficientes para evitar jerarquía y alimento al libitum que garantice su correcto bienestar y su correcta sanidad. Antonio, a colleague in the profession and more of the countryside than puppies, also knows what we are talking about. Pues el bienestar animal consiste en respetar las cinco libertades de, de los animales, libres de enfermedad, libres de presión, libres de estrés, libres de dolor, de lesión y de enfermedad, y libres para manifestar un, un comportamiento natural. This is why it is so important to certify animal welfare. Para mí es básico, no es que sea importante, es que es que es básico. Porque no soy, eh, no solamente hay que, que respetar las cinco libertades, sino que además tenemos que tenemos que demostrarlo de cara al consumidor y la forma de demostrarlo es con una una autocertificación o una certificación externa. Antonio, Alicia, Manuel, I totally agree with you. And I think this is the information that people from all corners of Europe should know. The European Animal Welfare Commitment. Financiado por la Unión Europea. El bienestar animal es un compromiso con nuestros animales, con convicción y por decisión propia. Nos basamos en las directrices de la Organización Mundial de la Salud Animal, los avances tecnológicos y en la legislación vigente. Creemos en un mundo donde los animales tienen que ser respetados y se trabaje por su bienestar en toda la sociedad. Ninguno de nuestros animales debe pasar hambre, sed o desnutrición. Garantizamos que tengan una vida libre de temor y de angustia. Que vivan libres de molestias físicas y térmicas. Y que puedan manifestarse con un comportamiento natural. Trabajamos con el compromiso de una sola salud, preveniendo lesiones o enfermedad. Mejoramos la relación entre los animales, su entorno y las personas que los cuidan. Porque en nuestra casa los animales deben tener una protección y un cuidado incluso mayor que en la naturaleza.
financiado por la Unión Europea. Hace 60 años, la activista británica Ruth Harrison marcó las líneas que ningún productor deberíamos sobrepasar. Animales libres de temor o angustia, libres de pasar hambre o sed, libres de dolor o enfermedad y libres para moverse naturalmente. No hay excusas para no respetarlo. Y para asegurarnos de que cada granja, cada establo y cada animal tiene estos derechos, hemos establecido más de 80 requisitos que debemos cumplir sin medias tintas. Porque si hay algún comprometido por el bienestar de los animales, somos nosotros. Compromiso Bienestar Animal Europeo. Cuidar de ellos es cuidar de todos. Financiado por la Unión Europea. El bienestar animal es un compromiso con nuestros animales, con convicción y por decisión propia. Nos basamos en las directrices de la Organización Mundial de la Salud Animal, los avances tecnológicos y en la legislación vigente. Creemos en un mundo donde los animales tienen que ser respetados y se trabaje por su bienestar en toda la sociedad. Ninguno de nuestros animales debe pasar hambre, sed o desnutrición. Garantizamos que tengan una vida libre de temor y de angustia, que vivan libres de molestias físicas y térmicas y que puedan manifestar su comportamiento natural. It's okay. Trabajamos con el compromiso de una sola salud, preveniendo lesiones o enfermedad. Mejoramos la relación entre los animales, su entorno y las personas que los cuidan. Porque en nuestra casa los animales deben tener una protección y un cuidado incluso mayor que en la naturaleza. Financiado por la Unión Europea. We are in the middle of the countryside, a stone's throw from the nearest provincial capital, not to mention Puerto del Sol or Las Ramblas, where thousands of consumers are increasingly concerned about animal welfare, as it should be. According to the latest Eurobarometer, 94% of consumers demand the protection and care of farm animals. More importantly, the public wants to know about the animal treatment of the products they buy in the supermarket. Even if we are a handful of kilometers away from the nearest supermarket, here too, we are fully committed to animal welfare. For a start, because they are our life. Isn't that right, Manuel? Yo mi vida sin el campo y sin la ganadería, sin los animales, no me la imagino porque, porque para mí esto es un mundo y, y, y yo me divierto en, en mi oficio y, y, me, y le echo mucha pasión. Would you be able to dedicate yourself to this profession without your passion for animals? Yo creo que una persona que no le guste el campo y que no le gusten los animales, en la vida se puede dedicar a esto porque... Esto es muy sacrificado, el reloj no se puede mirar porque la mayoría de los días, vamos, eso de las ocho horas, olvidado. Y, y, y muy sacrificado en los días de fiesta y los días de esto porque los animales hay que cuidarlos todos los días. And I think you have passed that passion on to your daughter, the farm vet. Reyes, when did you decide that you wanted to do this? Pues yo decidí ser veterinaria. Desde prácticamente, desde que tengo uso de razón, nunca he, me ha gustado otra profesión ni he buscado que me guste otra cosa. Es más, cuando hice mi bachillerato y mi me? selectividad, Good. dije, si no entro en veterinaria, me voy directamente al campo y no hago otra cosa, no me lo planteo. Los animales son muy gratificantes. El tú haces una cosa sin que te puedan decir porque indudablemente ni hablan ni te dicen me duele aquí, me duele allí, pero el ver que mejoran o por ejemplo el nacimiento de un ternero, de un parto complicado, 
es de las cosas más gratificantes. Manuel, I think your daughter has inherited respect for the welfare of animals from you. Yo creo que sí, vamos. Yo, yo intento inculcarle a ella que un poco la escuela que yo he tenido y le he visto a mis padres y a mis abuelos siempre dándole el toque de modernidad porque el mundo evoluciona, pero pero que vayan, hombre, que se acuerden de sus raíces. But welfare must be respected both in the field and on the farms where Manuel and Reyes calves pass through. Miguel, how is it working here? Pues en este sabadero trabajamos cuatro veterinarios en el que continuamente estamos velando por su sanidad, garantizando además que cada animal tenga eh, superficie suficiente, controlando la densidad de corrales para disminuir problemas sanitarios y ofreciéndole al animal puntos de agua eh, suficientes para evitar jerarquía y alimento al libitum que garantice su correcto bienestar y su correcta sanidad. Antonio, a colleague in the profession and more of the countryside than puppies, also knows what we are talking about. Pues el bienestar animal consiste en respetar las cinco libertades de, de los animales, libres de enfermedad, libres de presión, libres de estrés, libres de dolor, de lesión y de enfermedad, y libres para manifestar un, un comportamiento natural. This is why it is so important to certify animal welfare. Para mí es básico, no es que sea importante, es que, es que es básico. Porque no, soy, eh, no solamente hay que, que respetar las cinco libertades, sino que además tenemos que, tenemos que demostrarlo de cara al consumidor. Y la forma de demostrarlo es con una, una autocertificación o una certificación externa. Antonio, Alicia, Manuel, I totally agree with you. And I think this is the information that people from all corners of Europe should know. The European Animal Welfare Commitment. Financiado por la Unión Europea. El bienestar animal es un compromiso con nuestros animales, con convicción y por decisión propia. Nos basamos en las directrices de la Organización Mundial de la Salud Animal, los avances tecnológicos y en la legislación vigente. Creemos en un mundo donde los animales tienen que ser respetados y se trabaje por su bienestar en toda la sociedad. Ninguno de nuestros animales debe pasar hambre, sed o desnutrición. Garantizamos que tengan una vida libre de temor y de angustia, que vivan libres de molestias físicas y térmicas y que puedan manifestarse con un comportamiento natural. Trabajamos con el compromiso de una sola salud, preveniendo lesiones o enfermedad. Mejoramos la relación entre los animales, su entorno y las personas que los cuidan. Porque en nuestra casa los animales deben tener una protección y un cuidado incluso mayor que en la naturaleza. Financiado por la Unión Europea. Hace 60 años, la activista británica Ruth Harrison marcó las líneas que ningún productor deberíamos sobrepasar. Animales libres de temor o angustia, libres de pasar hambre o sed, libres de dolor o enfermedad, y libres para moverse naturalmente. No hay excusas para no respetarlo. Y para asegurarnos de que cada granja, cada establo y cada animal tiene estos derechos, hemos establecido más de 80 requisitos que debemos cumplir sin medias tintas. Porque si hay algún comprometido por el bienestar de los animales, somos nosotros. Compromiso Bienestar Animal Europeo. Cuidar de ellos es cuidar de todos. Financiado por la Unión Europea. El bienestar animal es un compromiso con nuestros animales, con convicción y por decisión propia.
libre de temor y de angustia. Que vivan libres de molestias físicas y térmicas. Y que puedan manifestarse con un comportamiento natural. Trabajamos con el compromiso de una sola salud, preveniendo lesiones o enfermedad. Mejoramos la relación entre los animales, su entorno y las personas que los cuidan. Porque en nuestra casa los animales deben tener una protección y un cuidado incluso mayor que en la naturaleza. Financiado por la Unión Europea. We are in the middle of the countryside, a stone's throw from the nearest provincial capital, not to mention Puerto del Sol or Las Ramblas, where thousands of consumers are increasingly concerned about animal welfare, as it should be. According to the latest Eurobarometer, 94% of consumers demand the protection and care of farm animals. More importantly, the public wants to know about the animal treatment of the products they buy in the supermarket. Even if we are a handful of kilometers away from the nearest supermarket, here too, we are fully committed to animal welfare. For a start, because they are our life. Isn't that right, Manuel? Yo mi vida sin el campo y sin la ganadería, sin los animales, no me la imagino porque, porque para mí esto es un mundo y, y, y yo me divierto en, en mi oficio y, y, me, y le echo mucha pasión. Would you be able to dedicate yourself to this profession without your passion for animals? Yo creo que una persona que no le guste el campo y que no le gusten los animales, en la vida se puede dedicar a esto porque esto es muy sacrificado, el reloj no se puede mirar porque la mayoría de los días, vamos, eso de las ocho horas, olvidado. Y, y, y muy sacrificado en los días de fiesta y los días de esto porque los animales hay que cuidarlos todos los días. And I think you have passed that passion on to your daughter, the farm vet. Reyes, when did you decide that you wanted to do this? Pues yo decidí ser veterinaria desde prácticamente desde que tengo uso de razón. Nunca he, me ha gustado otra profesión ni he buscado que me guste otra cosa. Es más, cuando hice mi bachillerato y mi selectividad, dije, si no entro en veterinaria, me voy directamente al campo y no hago otra cosa, no me lo planteo. Los animales son muy gratificantes. El tú haces una cosa sin que te puedan decir, porque indudablemente ni hablan ni te dicen me duele aquí, me duele allí, pero el ver que mejoran o, por ejemplo, el nacimiento de un ternero, de un parto complicado, es de las cosas más gratificantes. Manuel, I think your daughter has inherited respect for the welfare of animals from you. Yo creo que sí, vamos, yo, yo intento inculcarle a ella que un poco la escuela que yo he tenido y le he visto a mis padres y a mis abuelos siempre dándole el toque de modernidad porque el mundo evoluciona, pero, pero que vayan, hombre, que se acuerden de sus raíces. But welfare must be respected both in the field and on the farms, where Manuel and Reyes calves pass through. Miguel, how is it working here? Pues en este sabadero trabajamos cuatro veterinarios en el que continuamente estamos velando por su sanidad, garantizando además que cada animal tenga eh, superficie suficiente, controlando la densidad de corrales para disminuir problemas sanitarios y ofreciéndole al animal puntos de agua eh, suficientes para evitar jerarquía y alimento al libitum que garantice su correcto bienestar y su correcta sanidad. Antonio, a colleague in the profession and more of the countryside than poppies.
Yeah, okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Uh, welcome to the second symposium, European Symposium on Animal Welfare. Uh, my name is Andrea Bertaglio. I'm a journalist and I'm dealing uh, since uh, nearly 20 years with the uh, environment and, uh, and agri-food and I'm dealing more and more with, uh, with animal uh, uh, agriculture. And today I have the, the pleasure and the honor to, to take you through this uh, uh, very interesting, I promise, uh, uh, event co-funded by the European Union and uh, organized by Provacuno, Interovic, and JTT. Provacuno is the interprofessional organization of beef uh, farmers in, uh, in Spain, while Interovic and JTT, I guess you know better than myself, are the interprofessional organizations of uh, uh, goat and sheep meats, uh, respectively, in Spain and Hungary. Um, the first, uh, well, is the second symposium, the first one was held uh, last year, in November, in Madrid. And uh, why are we in Brussels today? Because uh, we're speaking of animal welfare. And as you know, animal welfare is a pretty uh, important topic at the moment, uh, particularly in the, in the European Union, I would say. Uh, and uh, well, uh, we are all expecting since uh, a while the, Europe the European Commission to uh, make a revision of the legislation on animal welfare which was supposed to be ready by September, then October, then the end of the year. Now it's a bit uh, um, confusing because uh, I guess you have uh, all read this, uh, this article on the Financial Times uh, a few days ago in which uh, apparently some EU officials were saying that uh, this revision will be dropped. So the, the, this uh, legislation would be, wouldn't be revised at all. and. Uh, and it's a bit uh, a, a peculiar situation because uh, uh, there is we, we, all, we all have seen that a lot of effort uh, has put on it. Uh, some other official has said uh, still to, to the Financial Times that uh, uh, this revision will be uh, offered, let's say, in a scaled back version. Why? Because uh, in these last couple of years we have seen big changes. So with the aggression of Russia, uh, on, in Ukraine, uh, we've seen uh, uh, the, the food costs rising a lot, so apparently uh, this is the main reason for which everything is uh, uh, in doubt right now. And I hope we can clarify a bit today with, uh, with our uh, prestigious guests uh, who are coming from very different contexts, I have to say. We have uh, uh, people from the industry, from uh, uh, NGOs, uh, from institutions, uh, from the academia. We have. Uh, quite some uh, researchers. Um, so I hope we can also clarify a bit the situation, because in any case, it's a very important topic. And uh, um, we are going to deal with that now briefly. I guess you have seen the program in a, uh, with three roundtables. The first one will be focusing on the current situation of animal welfare in Europe. The second one is uh, uh, about the fact that animal welfare, even if it's often treated uh, pretty much emotionally, I have to say, uh, also as a journalist, uh, must be science-based. And that's why we have uh, researchers and academics today. And the third part, after lunch, will uh, focus on the importance of, of animal welfare, not only for the producers, but also for the entire production chain and the consumers. Um, we have. Uh, also people following on streaming uh, and i thank them apparently over 600 people have registered so uh, they can also check the program and have more info uh, on the website of the event european uh, animal welfare.eu now without further ado oh important thing uh, after every round table there is a, a question time uh, if while you're hearing the speakers you have a question just raise your hand we have a young gentleman there who's spending all the day checking that you're raising hands to give you uh, some cards i know it doesn't sound that digital but uh, you can write your questions and then they will be collected and i can find them here later for the question time now without further ado i welcome on the stage uh, uh, javier lopez the general director of provacuno uh, giving you his welcome thanks Thank you so much, Andrea. 
and thank you all for being here today. Have a very good day. Welcome to this second European Symposium on Animal Welfare. Whenever we start such an important event, uh, the first chapter is to express our gratitude. So on behalf of our interprofessional association of the bovine sector in Spain and on behalf of Inter Ovid, our Spanish partner and GTP from Hungary, I would like to briefly address you, uh, pronounce some words. You know me that I tend to extend myself, but I promise you I'll try to be as brief as possible. First of all, I would like to thank Andrea. If we are here, it is thanks to promotion programs for animal welfare. This is, has been a possibility thanks to finding from the EU. We started our journey two years ago with a clear objective objective, fostering welfare, animal welfare, by the knowledge and use of accredited certifications. During our second round table, a lot will be said about uh, uh, accreditation, certification and accredited certification. These are notions and concepts that deserve, uh, well, uh, further consideration. So I can't resist mentioning the importance of these plans for the meat sectors. Those plans and programs are essential because they help us disseminate the quality of uh, um, agri-food production in Europe within our frontiers and beyond. And also it stresses cooperation and synergies among um, member states. So today, together with our Hungarian colleagues, we well, must highlight the importance of establishing links. So at this moment, um, it's absolutely relevant over our two years of track record for, for our project, we've carried out many, many actions. Organization of the first symposium held in Madrid last year, last November, that was a meeting point for all stakeholders involved and engaged in improving welfare and animal um, quality of life. So we will conclude this year with the second uh, successful activity we we've convened more than 600 people on this second symposium and we thank europe and its institutions for their support i extend my thanks to all of you our audience today our face-to-face -face audience and those of you that are following us online this is one of the single good things that the covid pandemic brought about it uh, well promoted connectivity we can be connected from all over the world to give you a general idea we don't only have uh, european colleagues and friends but also people in that registered from argentina colombia ecuador and costa rica in in uh, latin america so that gives you an idea about uh, the importance people give to our uh, to, to this topic throughout the world. So we are uh, over the moon about uh, the panels, the agenda we brought up, brought up. I would like to mention the attendance of members of permanent representations from over uh, ten, more than ten countries in the EU, participation of politicians, associations, NGOs, companies, universities, research centers, and so on and so forth. Please allow me to read out, read aloud the extents, the to comprehensive list of countries present here. Spain, Hungary, France, Italy, Latvia, Lit Lithuania, Estonia, Portugal, Germany, UK, Belgium, Czech Republic, Poland, Netherlands, Greece, Romania, Croatia, Slovenia, Denmark, Sweden, Malta, Luxembourg, and Austria, apart from third parties in Latin America, as I said. In total, more than 23 nationalities that are represented in this symposium. A good 
sign that welfare, animal welfare, is a topic that concerns us all. It's a, it's a shared interest and concern for our society, and we are all part of it. Last but not least, I would like to sincerely thank those that made possible this conference. Those are speakers. <laughs> the efforts they made to, to prepare their interventions and to travel and be with us. Thanks from the bottom of my heart for accepting the invitation for your high degree of engagement. I'm sure you will guarantee the, a great success of our symposium. Interovic, GTP and Pro Vacano, the conveners, the organizers, we Assure we will have a highly fruitful conference and if we'll leave here with the feeling of a, a job well done and the, and the conviction that there is a lot to do, a lot has been done, but having uh, animal welfare, welfare is a permanent improvement process and journey. Of course, there is always room for improvement, for increasing cooperation among member sta states. Europe is a very diverse country, so we need to find common ground. It's all, always interesting and uh, beneficial. So we believe that this symposium will be an interesting opportunity to share insights and um, we will delve deeper in 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 important topics as expressed by consumers at the EU. Without further ado, we will well give way to our next speaker. So we hope to live up to your expectations. I don't want to lie to you, it will be a long day. <laughs> we have a long day ahead, but hopefully it will be as intense, as interesting and an appealing for all of you, we made sure that uh, uh, we'll have uh, distinguished speakers, high quality interventions, so enjoy them and uh, encourage you to take an active role, participate in the Q&A rounds. So the three organizations organize um, convening this event are working hard so that the world and not only Europe is a better place. So we. Of course, we work hard and intensely to achieve that goal. Goal. So I give the floor to our uh, dear friend and colleague Sandor, so that he can greet you. Sandor, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. While the gentlemen are changing these places, uh, um, Sandor, Professor Sandor Kukovic is the. The, direct, the general director of uh, JTT, a researcher specialized in uh, small ruminants with uh, over 40 years of experience. Yes, well, <laughs> so congratulations. Please, for your opening remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests and participants, here in the room and in front of the screens, I am as the executive director of the Sheep and Goat Bo uh, Products Board in Hungary, have the honor of welcoming you to this symposium, where the goal is to analyze and discuss animal welfare issues. In addition, with the successfully compl uh, completed symposium, we want to have to the EU's goal of creating a regulatory system approaching the production of the animal meat products in addition to existing animal welfare regulations. This symposium, as you heard, is the second one in the row, which takes place in the framework of the cooperation between Spanish uh, Interovic in Provacuno and this Hungarian Sheep Products Board, which is defining part of the multiple uh, promotional tender which is co-financed by the European Union. In the framework of this application, the partners not only undertook to jointly develop a system representing animal welfare quality and labeling re regulations based on it, but also the promotion 
of the results of the work is a part of, of our joint task. Well, within the framework of the consortium, the partners' organizations have done a great job. These results were also presented in the framework on this symposium, along with the other research and development results affecting help and helping given sectors like cattle, sheep, and gold. An animal welfare symposium cannot be held without mentioning the five fundamental freedoms of animals. These, which cannot be repeated enough, are the following. Freedom from hunger and thirst, freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain, injury, and disease, freedom to express normal behavior, freedom from fear and distress. Of course, in addition to this and within this, there are many tasks and requirements that we have to be aware of. Fulfilling these freedoms is the basic duty and interest of animal keeper because it is possible to actually produce healthy food for our consumers by processing and using these kind of regulations. So, once I had a director in the research institute I was worked for, who drew, me, my, drew my attention to the fact that it is not enough if you know how to run. You also need to show to the others so they should believe in. By way of analogy, it is not enough for the actors working in the ruminants meat production to fulfill the animal welfare requirements. The uh, consumer must also be convinced of the performance and its quality so that with this, uh, with this uh, purchase, the consumer acknowledges the extra investment, energy, and time involved in such a pro products and also willing to pay uh, for the kind of products. The farmer has to meet many expectations in the production systems, and he has to face often unfunded criticism from many animal rights activists. These, the effects of this must not be prevented, but also uh, necessary to prove with appropriate labeling that the products in question not only meet the animal welfare requirements, but also exceed them. This, but the animal welfare labor for, which in, other, in addition to quality, also give uh, the consumer a guarantee that the animal welfare requirements have been taken into account in the production of which of the products on the store counter. This label provides a guarantee that producers of animal husbandry has been examined and checked with scientific correctness, and the product produced by the producer has been qualified as a suitable for the use of this label. It is in more than distinguishing label of the products with protecting origin. This guarantees and verifies the, the existence of the animal welfare background of the production and meet the consumer expectations of getting extra value for the extra money. And the animal welfare labor is scientifically based guarantee for that. As a result of the process, we got uh, closer to fulfilling the uh, farm to fog requirements and the goals and have the uh, 2050 carbon neutral uh, objectives to be a reality. At the same time, the animal welfare labor system is distinguishing at the point of sale those European products that, pro, uh, that comply with uh, requirements and there are above and beyond those established by current 
uh, European legislations on animal welfare and from those which products is not uh, Hungarian, uh, not uh, European ones. Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests and speakers and participants, I will conclude my welcome speech with three animal labor design developed and recommended for the use of organization cooperating in this application. We can serve as a model to the adaptation of EU regulations. I wish you a successful symposium with a lot of knowledge to consider and that at the end of the program you can decide in yourself that it was worth participating. I wish you good work for the um, presentations and for the, the table discussions. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, mic check. Okay, thank you, Professor. Uh, now, it's more my style. I'm not a big fan of podiums. I invite uh, here on these lovely chairs the first uh, four speakers. Uh, Estelle, Estelle Hamlan, I, I trained for that. Uh, Carolina Cucureja, Ines Ajuda, and uh, we are supposed to have um, uh, the last, on the last one, please. Uh, Miguel Angel Higuera, uh, whom I'm afraid is still on a plane right now, so we'll see. But uh, let's hope that he's joining us soon. So I will sit closer to you for the time being. So we are going in this first uh, round table to analyze, uh, as we've said, uh, the, um, the situation of animal welfare at this moment. So. Should I introduce you properly now? So Estelle Amlan is the uh, sub-regional representation in Brussels of the World Organization for Animal Health, WOA, correct? So she's having a, a global uh, vision, not only European, but of course uh, the fact that you're based in Brussels is very uh, interesting. And then we have uh, Ines Ajuda, I jumped, uh, Eurogroup for Animals, Everyone knows Eurogroup for Animals, and you are the program leader for farm animal welfare. So you're really the, uh, the, the, the right person to, to have here today. And Carolina Cucureja, uh, veterinary advisor. You're all veterinary, I think. Or, yeah, there are many veterinary today. Uh, veterinary advisor for, uh, at the European uh, Livestock and uh, Meat Trading Union. So the U, U, UAC BV, my God, sorry. Uh, so I would start already because we are already a bit in late with, uh, with the stay. And I'm asking you, um, as uh, I said, you have a global vision of this, uh, of this topic. And uh, as far as I know, we are not all carrying the same way uh, of animal welfare around the world. How can you uh, describe uh, the situation of, of animal welfare worldwide? Well, I think uh, worldwide what we can say is that uh, you have an increased interest and in work done on this topic. Uh, it shows through WUHA work uh, through time because uh, it's, I would say it started in 2001 uh, with uh, the identification as animal welfare as a strategic topic uh, by WOHA under the, uh, the mandate granted by all its members. And WOHA has 183 members, uh, and one member is one country, so it's a lot of, uh, of representative of the, of the world. Uh, and after that, through the years, uh, the region uh, of WOHA, we have five, worked on uh, developing uh, strategic uh, plans and work on it in different level, in different uh, ways, but there was something everywhere. And after, I would say uh, a turn point is 2017, where at the general session of WOHA, a resolution was voted by the German General Assembly by establishing uh, the WOHA Global Animal Welfare Strategy. And so with this, this strategy, it really established uh, the work on animal welfare, and it was built on uh, lessons learned from countries and also the region, as they were working on the topic. And it aims at, uh, I would say, work on the, fin, help, guide, giving guidance on the different uh, activities that WOHA is doing on animal welfare. So 
we see this progress and this uh, animal welfare strategy is uh, based on four pillars. One is developing standards, uh, big work at WOHA, uh, also uh, on capacity building and education, also implementing the, uh, to be assured that the standards are implemented and also on all communication aspects. So we have this strategy and I think it represents um, well, the members' needs and the member request, as WUHA is in an intergovernment uh, organization and works for his members. But if you want uh, some numbers, I will send you to the um, uh, to the first report of the WUHA Observatory that was published early this year, and there is a part that focuses on uh, animal welfare. And I can give you one number, I think, that uh, shows uh, the importance of uh, animal welfare is the increased number of reg animal welfare regulation that were being published uh, in, uh, in the last year, because the number is from 2096 to 2000, uh, no, 1996 to 2021. And so it's 25 years, and in 25 years, we have 336, if I remember correctly, animal welfare regulation that were passed in 58 members of uh, WOHA. So I think it shows the increased interest and the work done on uh, animal welfare through the world. Indeed, and uh, um, now focusing on Europe, because we speak of Europe, but uh, Europe is not the European Union, and the other way around. So something making me pretty curious from your perspective, um, the difference in animal welfare, the differences in animal welfare implementation uh, between the EU and the rest of Europe. Can you explain them please once and for all because I'm yeah, of course. Uh, yes, it's true. Europe and European Union is very different because in total, uh, at least in WOHA, uh, how we work, we have 53 countries uh, in the Europe region. We go from, I would say, uh, Ireland to uh, even Iceland to uh, Central Asia so countries. So it's a large region. And uh, yes, there is a lot of differences. That's for sure in implementation. But there is also a lot of differences, I would say, in itself, EU, because for many reasons inside of the eu inside of the okay. eu but for many reasons uh, because uh, you have different livestock production systems so that impact how uh, the, uh, the things are implemented uh, because of the political and social uh, willingness and interest in the topic because that will influence what is done uh, because of the how the everything is organized if the who are the competent authority because uh, you have a Usually you have better services, but they can be in, uh, under different authorities. They can have different roles. All the animal welfare topic can be covered by different administrations. So everything, uh, all those, uh, those facts uh, influence how uh, things are implemented. So you have to take that into consideration. But I think uh, an important point, it's also to consider that yes, Europe is uh, where countries are all interconnected and so i think the goal to uh, to go to is really to uh, see how we can harmonize the better way how all countries are working and i th think the first step is uh, to have a common agreement and i think uh, the members of WOHA in europe with the help of our offices that we have in, uh, in different countries in europe are working on that through the animal welfare platform for europe so it's a platform that was created 10 years ago uh, to respond to members' need in Europe. And uh, in this platform, there's five priority topic. And on that, we develop activities that uh, correspond to the needs of the countries. And through that, I think we worked on to have a common ground and harmonization. And uh, if I can give you an example, is one on the priority topic of transport. Um, the members, show the need to create uh, a network of uh, of the different countries to try to better interact etc so we help them uh, create uh, a network uh, that we call the network on uh, national contact point on long distance transportation and that way in each country of the europe region there is someone that another country can co contact and that will facilitate coordination communication and also help in the implementation of WOHA standards you said something uh, very important, I think, to take care also of the differences 
also cultural, I think, because uh, with my job, I go around and I speak with farmers and people, and I see the perception also of animal welfare is absolutely not the same inside of the European Union. Now, from the global to the European context, and now uh, speaking of the European Union and, and, no, and no other Europe, uh, how can you compare the um, the animal welfare legislation in the EU to your standards at war? I, I don't know if we can really compare them. I will say, uh, well, they have a main goal that is identical to better the animal welfare, but how they were created, why, and all the, and all the secondary objectives, will say they are very different. So I will not say that we can really compare them. I would tend to say they are complementary. Because you use the global uh, approach always. Yeah. OK. Yeah, yeah. So I would say they are complementary. Uh, one thing to understand is the WHO standard on animal welfare is 18 chapters. 14 are in the animal, uh, the terrestrial animal health code, and four are in the aquatic animal health code. And well, we have a general assembly of 183 countries, and what it has to be understood is to have one chapter unit the agreement of 183 countries. So uh, I am a European citizen. I know that uh, to be uh, agreed on something between 27 countries is already not easy. Right to do this with 183 countries, so it's not easy, and it has to take into account all the different livestock systems, all the cultural differences, etc. So uh, it's uh, quite, I would say, a difficult job, but we made it as uh, already 18 chapter exist. So I would tend to say, yeah, they are complementary because um, they should be used uh, as, yeah, as WOHA standard has to be uh, able to be adapted to all the system through the world. The idea is more for the country after, or a group of country, to see how they can adapt the, the standard to their own uh, situation, needs, etc. Uh, because, uh, as I said, there is a many different uh, livestock production system, and so uh, the whole standard has to be large to be adaptable to all the system. So uh, if you want to some differences on that, uh, it's for sure uh, the, the standards are less precise in the stress hold that they give on some different topic. And um, if I take once again uh, the transport, you will not have specific requirement in a WOHA standard like uh, the time of traveling or the specific space allowance. You will not have this uh, level of detail because it will depend on the, on the different part of the world. But if you want some common points, I think, uh, well, the goal is the same, the animal welfare, uh, bettering the animal welfare, but also on the challenge, because yes, it's important that standards of regulation are based on, on the scientific domain, but in animal welfare also, as we spoke earlier, we have to take the cultural, the ethical, the economical, the religious, the political aspects. And so even if uh, science is important, we also have to consider that to make a regulation. Can we say that in Europe is uh, advanced? I'm sorry. That's, uh... <laughs> yeah, there is a lot of regulation in, in Europe, but I don't it's think it's, it, but, okay. uh, no, but a lot, there is a lot of work done on that, but it's not the only place uh, in the no, world no, sure. that is, uh, where there's things. And also you can have a different approach because uh, some countries will, will have approaches more on certification, oh, yeah, etc. Religious uh, differences, I can imagine, impacting pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, thanks. No, because I go around the world and I often hear or often have the feeling that in Europe is taken seriously. I'm watching you because now I have to speak with you, Ines, about these, uh, these topics. And uh, uh, I'm going to ask you, of course, uh, uh, how the, so there is always room for improvement. We say that already. But how is, from your perception now, seriously, the animal welfare situation in the EU? Um, I think that uh, we, we, we tend to say that the EU is a leadership on, and has leadership on animal welfare. And I would say it's not entirely wrong, but I always challenge this uh, sentence because I think uh, we, we can do more, as you said, but also we start seeing, and uh, thanks to uh, observatory and uh, other publications, that other countries outside the EU are standing up 
on issues that we are lagging behind. Animal transport being a very good example, you know, we see New Zealand banning live export, uh, Australia phasing out uh, sheep uh, live export, Brazil is now going to WTO to talk about their possible ban on live uh, animal exports as well. So it's one of the examples, many examples that we are, well, maybe losing the leadership on the animal welfare side. And so I always say that it's nice to be able to say that, but we shouldn't sit too comf comfortably on the throne of uh, being the leaders on animal welfare. Um, and of course, you know, private standards and accreditation schemes are one way of moving uh, animal welfare. And they usually are very good at creating case studies at making uh, show that uh, higher animal welfare can work. But the best way to go uh, and be actually progressive and throughout and have a, a true improvement is via legislation. And re you referred to that when you were op on your opening speech about the revision of the animal welfare legislation. And in uh, you know the animal's perspective, but on just the progress on animal welfare, this is what we really need to do and do it as quick as possible for the animals, but also even, for example, for the farmers, you know, the more time we take uh, to actually update this, uh, our legislation according to science, according to the findings, the more it, it gets outdated and the more there is a higher risk for farmers to invest in systems that are not fit for the purpose and mainly fit for the future. And that's a massive risk for, you know, everyone that really is taking, as you are, animal welfare uh, seriously. Yeah. Because it's also, I could see going around, uh, it's pretty costly for farmers, I mean, mm -hmm. to implement all these things. So, um, so we don't need to, yes, you had to make me think of myself at school when I was doing something well, then for six months I was not, no, I, I get your point, it makes sense. And uh, now, seriously, you were, you were uh, mentioning, as uh, Javier Lopez has done uh, during his uh, opening remarks, uh, the accreditation system, which is a, a, a pretty... Uh, interesting topic and, and I guess we are going to touch it often today and uh, speaking with you because I had the chance to uh, know you in person uh, for the first time uh, for, for this symposium I uh, I knew that you were working uh, with certifications so you had you have experience uh, uh, with with the accreditation certification so what's <clears throat> your opinion about that about an accreditation an accreditation let's say mm -hmm. in general uh, I think well past life uh, working on that, it was always the natural next step. So, you know, firstly, usually this is driven in this case by farmers, but also by companies that, you know, they have their supply chain, they are doing great things, but they want to show it to the world. And a way of doing it is to do it by themselves and establish standards and say, this is where, what we want to achieve. But then in terms of winning trust uh, of the consumers, but also really actually proving that they're doing it in a very transparent way, the natural next step is have someone external to come and check that and certify that they are doing the right thing. And that should always happen because, you know, it's, uh, it's the fair and more transparent way of it's doing it. So reliable. it's an es essential step. Uh, as sometimes, you know, um, it's a hard decision because it means bringing someone external to actually look at what people are doing uh, in the supply chain. Also, it's an extra cost. But I would always advocate that it's a cost that it's needed because uh, transparency, uh, transparency reason is also because it keeps the momentum and the challenge as well for the for the standards. Okay, no, makes absolutely sense. Um, now, to you, I, I must speak about because I was mentioning before the the, the emotional approach that uh, many people have uh, with this topic. I see that uh, you know leaving unfortunately quite a part of my life working life on the social media that uh, the, the animal welfare is taken really too emotionally not too scientifically uh, people in urban areas on top in europe mostly we we are from urban areas are tending to treat animals like humans and it's not really good that's my opinion i'm asking you one thing um because you are really in the position probably to to, influ to influence a lot of these, these things. Uh, is it not time, considering the importance of animal welfare, to take uh, in a more rational way everything? So what I say is, it, can we finally, I say that as a journalist, so I, I'm starting to be much more involved into this uh, uh, world, animal production. And uh, I'm now uh, collaborating also, starting with the li European list of voice. Mm -hmm. So I see, much more from inside the all these dynamics 
And I ask myself and I ask you if it's not possible, finally, to work uh, all together. I mean, uh, farmers, uh, producers, uh, institutions, uh, uh, NGOs, and decision makers, and to help the decision makers uh, to, to make the right decision in a not conflictual way. If yes, because I hope you say yes, so it's all a rhetorical question, <laughs> how? <laughs> Um, so, picking on the f uh, point of the emotion first, I think, you know, the answer there is it will always be an emotion bounded topic because food is emotional. We all have a feeling about food. You know, once I heard someone saying, you know, we've managed to do renewal energy, we've managed to uh, do other, you know, sustainable stuff. So, why can't we just uh, deal with uh, animal production the same way or food, sorry, the same way? But we can't because we all have an opinion about food. Food is part of our lives since the moment we, we breathe. So, um, so emotion will always be part of the debate. And I don't think it's a bad thing. You know, farmers are passionate about what they are doing. Uh, citizens are passionate about what they eat. Uh, NGOs are passionate about their work. So that's not a bad thing. That's what drives us. And that's a good thing. But yes, we should work together. And you're right. I, well, you knew I was going to say yes to that question. But even if you wouldn't, um, I think we, you know, Progress comes from when uh, the, all these parties actually sit on the table and start trying at least to find some common points. And we all agree that animal welfare is important. So that's done. That's, that's the first start. step, yes. you know? Then, uh, of course, we have our passions and we should keep them. But then let's sit around the table. Let's find some synergy points. We will probably not agree on everything. And that's also fine because I think, you know, that's what pushes people to do better. You know, if we all say, yes, we agree, we'll never move and we'll never progress. But we we'll definitely should at least allow for an opportunity to, to try it and, uh, and work. And I'm sure the institutions would appreciate uh, the agreement because it makes uh, everyone's life easy. Agreement may not happen, but at least, uh, an, if nothing else, an There's attempt good, good should phase. happen. Yes. yes. <laughs> and you know, it's, uh, it's, it, you, you mentioned the uh, kind of the farmers and the NGOs, but also there's the science and I'm a scientist uh, and a vet uh, from background. And I think, you know, one of the first steps is to take science seriously and say, okay, even if, you know, the scientists are concluding things that are scary and not maybe commercially viable, we should take it seriously and think, okay, but well, but they are flagging this. So what, how can we address this problem? Instead of, the, instead of just pushing back, for example, on the facts, as you said, on the science. We should, you know, drive from it. And with you, completely <laughs> reasonable uh, approach. Now, I hope it can work because it's it's uh, it's uh, really important. And as you've said, food animals, uh, who, who's uh, not uh, caring of them. So, well, thank you, uh, Carolina. I go back to you. Uh, well, with you, I start uh, with a banal question. I would say, asking you why animal welfare is important, also in your field, I mean, for meat, uh, for the meat trade sector. So what's the importance of animal welfare? Well, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, colleagues of ProVacuno and, Inter and Interovic for inviting me to this session, uh, to this second symposium. Uh, well, <laughs> animal, animal welfare is important, not only for farmers, not only for meat traders, not only for livestock traders, not uh, it's also important for citizens, because citizens uh, don't need to to have ethical concerns or ethical struggling for consuming animal products. Uh, it is also important for animals because they are the most affected for the conditions they are they are being raised. So, uh, for uh, for for farmers and breeders, it is important because as long the as the animals have been raised and kept in uh, in good conditions, these animal animals will be healthy. These animals will have uh, good uh, production numbers, let's say. But this could be a very old speech, and this this is the the old speech we have ever heard for 20 or 30 years that the first interested is the farmer because the uh, as long as the animals are okay so they have more incomes yeah this is an old speech so we i think we we have to move on and uh, we have to to realize and uh, to be conscious that the way we 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 keep the animals the way we transport animals at the end it, it will uh, it will have a consequence a global a global consequence 
in terms, even in terms of a, of a, of environmental aspects. Uh, and but we we need to find a balance between the conditions that the animals are being uh, kept and transported and slaughtered, and the. Uh, the, 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 the continuity of the business of farming and producing meat products and dairy products and, uh, and poultry products and eggs and so on and so on. So there must, there must be a balance. It is important to, to make sure that we need to produce and to keep say, uh, healthy animals because we, that way we will also reduce the use of antimicrobials it, this has also an impact in every, everyone's health, uh, and, and we must provide uh, citizens safe products and products that they will be sure that these animals have been produced under humane conditions, under decent conditions, under good conditions. So, and, and in addition, uh, for, the, for the trade, for the trade, you must be able to make sure that your product, your animals, uh, are the are the best, are the best. And as long as long as we do that, and we are proud of our products and the way we produce our products, our customers will be more satisfied, and consumers will be more satisfied. So it is uh, it's it has a global uh, a global effect in my opinion, in our opinion. But, and we have to keep moving and we have to improve what we have learned that we, are, we could do better. So now we are in this process to find this, this balance to keep business going, to keep the activity in the rural areas uh, going and, and, to, and to keep all the social uh, net that is behind the livestock uh, farming and industry. Yeah, which is often not really taken into account, I have to say, or to admit, because uh, as I was saying, we always watch uh, from an uh, urban perspective and we tend to forget these areas. I, I, I see, I mean, speaking with people that uh, they, they feel it a lot. So basically, animal welfare can take you to have uh, quality products, because uh, of course, it's in the east interest of the producer and the consumers and can also help uh, in uh, uh, reducing uh, animal uh, sorry antimicrobial uh, antimicrobial resistance which is another pre yes, that could be one of the issue. consequences but we also have to produce products that will be affordable to people affordable. because we cannot lose uh, the perspective of, of what is our mission the mission of farmers is to feed people yeah. and and we have to produce good products uh, with a high nutritional value, protein, animal protein is the best protein we can we can take. Uh, we can take iron. We can take a lot of a lot of uh, nutrients that are only present in meat and, and only present in animal products. But and these products have to be affordable because children have to develop in a healthy way. So affordability. You take me to the to uh, this what we were mentioning before the fact that the food costs are so high compared to to a couple of years ago so it's it's quite a, it's quite a point and uh, i ask you now uh, starting from this we understood the european uh, uh, union animal welfare legislation is not that bad let's say the the, the regulations and uh, that uh, there is always room for improvement sure how through how can that be through a new legislation if it really comes? Uh, let me focus more on the aspect related to transport, mm. uh, because in my opinion is the most controversial. I think I think Ines, you will agree with me, is the most controversial part of the of the whole livestock uh, activities. Uh, yeah, we need to transport animals. We need to transport animals within member states. We need to transport animals between member states. And we need to transport animals out of the European Union. There is room for improvement, of course. And uh, our association and our members, we have spent hours and hours of meetings and working groups and, and producing documents. 
and so on and so on and try to find how can we uh, commit to the improvement of this uh, of the conditions of the animals when they are transported by road in long in long journeys what to do with calves uh, what to do in vessels so uh, we have some points that we can we can we can accept and we are committed to do because uh, it is of our interest to improve the conditions of animals and to keep going and to keep to keep trading animals so uh, for instance uh, the the, the track, tracking the, the 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 whole journey and uh, and and to use the new technologies for tracking the journeys to, to track the the weather conditions to track the uh, road accidents uh, to track uh, uh, the environmental conditions or to find uh, animal welfare issues during the during the transport uh, in real time so this is this could be one of the, the of the solutions we are committed to to do in, in in a transitional period of course because we cannot do it overnight um second uh for um ah, of course the contingency plans have to be uh well done and uh, and have to be continuously updated uh training for all the people that are involved in the management of animals is also a key for 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 us because at the end uh, everybody is responsible of a, of a big or a small part of what is happening with animals and uh, regarding the transport by vessel uh, we seriously believe that a stocks person in the vessel during the transport is absolutely necessary because a stock person doesn't have to be a veterinarian because uh, sometimes a person ha that has experience in handling animals has much more knowledge than a veterinarian in solving little problems that could be very easy to 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 solve and to keep an eye on animals and to and to find quickly what is happening if there's something wrong if there's a, if everything is going right and to give orders to the to the crew to to do the work uh, um, during during the journey uh, and uh, there is one uh, very specific um, point uh, for the export by road and by vessel to third countries. As... Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you. Yeah, okay. You know, yeah, no, please, because it's, uh, it's also connected to the accreditation, uh, reliability, and uh, uh, so can I, I want to combine, I interrupt you to ask you exactly that about the third countries. So if you can clarify with this thing, but what I'm asking you is, is if uh, appropriately standardized accreditation system can help particularly when we export to third countries even where i dare to say the eu legislation doesn't arrive maybe so in controlling until the end of the journey of an animal so can the accreditation accreditation help with that we believe it is possible uh, and and we believe that it is necessary and may I explain myself? Uh, as you probably all know, and we have uh, people from the Commission here, one of the most uh, elements of pressure for the Commission is the decision from the European Court of Justice that says that the uh, requirements of the regulation for transport have to be met until the animal arrives to its final destination in the third country, even, even if it's in the third country. The problem is that uh, the competent European competent authorities are not competent in, a, in the territory of a third country because there's a sovereignty uh, issue. It's, it I mean, you be, cannot go to tell them what to do. It. You cannot go to tell them, <laughs> really? you have to do it or I will stop selling you animals and they will say, okay, bye, I will start buying animals from Somewhere another else. country. Mm. Okay, so, but what we could do is to, to design uh, a kind of insurance system uh, that allows, uh, allows the exporters and the sector to show, uh, to provide more transparency on what is happening to the animals from the moment they step down from the vessel or the moment they cross the border uh, in a third country. 
until they arrive to its destination, that is the farm or the slaughterhouse or, or the, 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 the final point of the journey. Okay. And uh, yes, we believe that uh, a sort of a certification or accreditation that could be audited is, uh, is, could be a solution that will provide us uh, a way to keep uh, trading animals. And one more important thing, um, it's not realistic, I have said this sentence several times, but it is not realistic to believe that banning the export of livestock to third countries will save the world. It will not, because the main countries we are exporting livestock are the countries of the north part of Africa. In these countries, they are not able to import meat. And if they import meat, they will not import European meat. We, would, we will never have that market because it's a matter of prices. And price is important here. Second, they have no fridge capacity. So it is not possible for them to keep meat. Uh, it would be great if we could export only carcasses and meat because it's easier it's cheaper and we don't have all these problems that we have seen in the last three four years in the mediterranean with all the scandals and uh, and the media and the and the ngos pushing they are right because we have seen very uh, uncomfortable uh, scenes and and we don't want we don't want to be uh, the under, under this focus we don't want that we don't want to lose all those animals like that so it's it's not it's not nice to us. Um, it would be perfect if we could export all the animals. Okay, we don't export animals anymore. We will convert them into meat. Then we give the added value in our territory. That would be fantastic because we would have a more robust industry. But it's not realistic to believe that that will happen. Then, if we start exporting, if we stop exporting livestock these countries will keep importing livestock from other countries like colombia or brazil well you said now brazil is planning to ban uh, okay when yeah i i understand that the political situation in brazil is different than in two years ago uh, and there is an additional risk first more animals in worse conditions because these animals will not be covered by the european regulations in terms of transport uh, with a deeper footprint, because the journey will be longer. It's not the same to export animals in the Mediterranean than bringing them from the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, it's a, it's a, we have to also keep in mind what are the impact, what is the impact of our actions and our decisions we make here, the global impact. And, and, uh, and third, uh, the sanitary risk of moving animals across the ocean from one point to another. And uh, I'm sorry, I have to remind a scandal uh, that happened like six months ago, uh, a vessel with uh, cattle from Colombia to- Oh God, yeah, the, the drug- uh, Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, to, to Lebanon. It was uh, stopped in Canary Islands because there was uh, one ton of cocaine inside. So, so the, the livestock was the excuse for bringing another kind of goods. Yeah. And what happened to this livestock? Uh, the livestock was, could not uh, go into the European Union because it didn't meet the uh, sanitary requirements. I think it, was, it did not continue its journey. Sorry. Unfortunately. Well, <laughs> there's one ton of cocaine, okay. Um, so, ladies, thank you. Let's do like that. Uh, I, I still did wait for Miguel Angel Higuera. I guess he's not here because I still don't see him. Uh, no, thank you, ladies, for the time being, for the for the competence, the passion. Uh, it was uh, it was very interesting. I hope for you too. I wonder, as Miguel Angel Higuera is not here, uh, if uh, the young gentleman, keeping an eye on you all the time, has uh, collected some questions. Let me see. I promise I don't break it. Let's see. So, 
So in Spanish, after this experience, oh, okay, wow, yeah, a few, ban a few questions actually. So let me, for whom it's written? Yeah, come along, madam. Uh, what is the EU level of regulation in the framework of the uh, animal welfare compared to the rest of the world? Okay, so this is basically what I kind of asked you already. Or, um, uh, yeah, so to, to again, to compare the, the European uh, regulation with the global one, which is a quite a question, but again, you, re you already said it, I would say. Again, another one for you, uh, Estelle. Uh, if each part is, uh, uh, sorry, so I started, I need glasses, I think. Uh, if each part of the world has to adapt to its different realities, do you think it's possible to have an EU-like animal welfare standards or all over the world? Uh, well, it's to each country to determine what they need. If it cannot be EU, if it's, uh, if it's in the state, it's in the state, in Australia, it's in Australia. The basis is not EU, uh, is not EU system. So that can, but it's, that, it's not because it's not EU that it's not working. So it's more that uh, it has to be adapted to the culture, to the yeah, way of, of producing in each country. And yes, they are not the same, but it's not because they are not the same that can, they cannot be, have the comparable positive effects. Okay. And as you're already talking, I see there is another one at the very end for Estelle Amlan. So you said there are 150 animal welfare certifications. Uh, do you know approximately how many of these are third party certified and how many are more committed and go as far as accreditation? I don't think I told that. Uh, I don't know how many certifications there is. So... Who asked that? <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know. No, I said that there is countries that are using certification or developing. I know in the state there is uh, the, uh, there there are developing something. The USDA also in Argentina yeah, okay. uh, they are developing certification, but I don't have the. Please pay more attention, okay? <laughs> also from home. Uh, now we have a question from Ines Ajuda. Taking science seriously, do you believe that science is responsible? responsive to the standards that have been put in place in the EU now and if and in the foreseeable future do we really know the effect of the measures we have now and we are we sure that the future measures will be better um, so on the science part I think if we can produce more, we can always produce more. A lot of the papers finish with uh, more research is needed. But nevertheless, at certain point, uh, you know, decisions have to be made. Uh, are they reflective of uh, what's happened, you know, what happens in reality? I think it has improved tremendously, animal, especially on animal welfare. I think the question probably is about animal welfare, though it's not referred to that. It has completely, you know, uh, ramped up in the last uh, decade or 15 years. Um, and I think there is, and also a lot of thanks to, to EU financing it, there is a lot of more collaboration among science and farmers and, you know, your, the institutions that are organizing uh, this today prove it. So, yes, we will never be 100% happy, we will always question, yeah, but you haven't looked at this specific system or that specific system. But, you know, if you ask me now, is science uh, um, strong enough to help us make the decisions and move forward, I would say yes. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. And then there is one now for Carolina as well. In your experience with, uh, in your sector, do you believe that some livestock farmers, industry, transporters, or anyone who has a relationship with animal is not the most interested in a perfect animal welfare status? So, as you probably already said, it's in the, in the interest of people working in the field to, to care of welfare. I, oh, thank you. Okay. I, I don't fully understand the question, but they are interested, of course. Of course they are inter interested. Unfortunately, maybe some individuals don't do their best job, of course. Uh, otherwise, we could, we, maybe maybe we don't have these issues. Uh, but uh, but farmers and uh, transporters and uh, traders and industry uh, are are the most interested and the most committed to 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 meet good uh, standards of animal welfare. 
otherwise they will not be reliable anymore uh, on the eyes of society and consumers yeah and they wouldn't sell their goods and this I mean, it doesn't make sense simply oh, of course. and it's uh, important not to sorry uh, if i insist not to give the message that if one farm is not working properly all the farms are like that it's like a, when i when i read about uh, teachers beating up children in a school it's not that i'm going to ask to close all the schools so it's uh, no it's uh, well but I think you already said that before. Uh, I, I understood that Miguel Angel Higuera didn't manage to, to arrive yet, so I will use these, uh, these still not, these 10 minutes of, uh, that, we are, that we have more. It's probably the first time in my life I, I'm not in late uh, in the moderation, so uh, eventually we will use it later uh, to, to let uh, Miguel Angel speak or to deep another subject. For the time being, I thank you very much again, ladies, for your uh, participation. And uh, I welcome now the next four speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So yes, uh, second round table. Let's do like that. Now I, I sit here because my, my neck is broken because I watch all this. So uh, I ask please to join me on the stage laura godoy don't hide sorry i didn't understand okay uh paolo ferrari oh here he is and then uh, la la laura laura boyle i hope she she managed to arrive because uh, i know that she Please. I know that she, she had to take a, a flight at four o'clock from Dublin to join us, so I don't envy her and I hope she managed because if not, we have another, uh, she's, she's here. Okay, cool. Uh, and then, uh, oh, uh, okay, Andrea Gavinelli, I've seen him. I don't see you. If you, if you tell me something, I'm blinded by these lights. Uh, it's not there anymore. Okay, just one second. Yes? Okay, cool. Sure. I thought they had it already. They put the microphones. Paolo Ferrari, I start to introduce you at least. So, he's a, he's a, an, another uh, researcher with uh, quite a few years uh, of experience. You can take this one if you like. You're working as a research, your senior researcher at the CRPA, CRPA, so in Italian because it's in Reggio Emilia, uh, Centro di Ricerca e Produzione Animali means uh, uh, Research Center on Animal Production. Uh, and you have been working since uh, 33 years there, you told me. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, because it's funny, like uh, Professor uh, uh, Kukovic uh, before, uh, it's funny to, when I'm dealing with people uh, working in this field now, because I feel sometimes not a, never an expert, but that I have a clue. And then I have people that were already working with these things when I was at the, at the, at the primary school, but it makes me feel also better. Um, so basically, uh, the, uh, the research center is promoting the technical, economic and social progress of the livestock sector and also eco-friendly agriculture. Uh, do you want to start as a, we're waiting for the next speakers to yeah. wear the microphones. By the way, you can use also these ones here, eh? uh, as we are doing, you're not obliged to wear the other ones for the next uh, round table. I take this, uh, this moment, uh, this uh, unexpected uh, opportunity to let you already explain, please, uh, what uh, your uh, center is doing. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the invitation. So I'm representing here Research Center for Animal Production, and we are a, a, a research center. We do apply research in the livestock uh, sector in Italy, and we were founded uh, 50 years ago as uh, to act as an agricultural knowledge and innovation system, which is a definition coming from the OECD and uh, 10 years ago so and before that definition we were uh, set up as a, a system a group of researchers collaborating with other research bodies to do um, to improve uh, the sustainability of the livestock sector 
And uh, we run this activity according to a, a bottom-up um, uh, approach, multi-actor approach. So uh, we have a, a mix of uh, public and private uh, company with the representation of the agricultural sector and livestock sector in Italy. So we do apply research, research, apply research, but also training at European level for vets of the competent authority within the Better Training for Safer Food program, but also at national and regional level for vets and most, most important for farmers, livestock farmers. And also we collaborated with the certification bodies like at the European level and at the national level to promote certification of animal welfare uh, for our products. So you're really representing perfectly what we're talking about uh, now in this round table. So from science to the table, uh, so you're really in touch. Uh, you're, you're a scientist and then you're in touch with everyone, basically. Yes, uh, also with the um, uh, NGOs uh, for animal, pro um, animal production for, uh, sorry, for animal protection, like uh, your group for animals. So we did this good job for, uh, certain, yeah, to develop and to disseminate uh, good uh, practices for transport, transport guides you can find in, in, in the net to better implement uh, Regulation 1, 2005, and, so, and okay. also other. Thank you, now, I'll so, be back to you that, because I take the opportunity. Sorry. Thank you, thank you for helping me in, uh, in, uh, in uh, facing this unexpected, uh, uh, moment. Um, so, thank you for being here. Laura Godoy. Uh, Laura Godoy is the technical responsible in Spain uh, for animal welfare at Buro Veritas, who is a company, again, uh, uh, acting globally, uh, specializing in testing, uh, certifications, and, uh, and inspections as well. No? Thank so, thank you for being here. Then, thank from you. Laura Godoy, we have Laura Boyle. <laughs> so, it's the same name but uh, we say it differently. Thanks for being here because I know you are coming directly uh, from Dublin and uh, you are the sci senior scientist in animal welfare with uh, Chajask, thank you, which is the Irish National Food and Agriculture Authority and also president of the Health and Welfare Commission of the European Federation for Animal Science, the EAAP, which is in Rome. Huh? So, thank you for joining us. And then, last but of course not least, uh, Andrea Gavinelli, the head of unit of the animal welfare at the European Commission. Thank you very much for joining us. So, I would start with uh, uh, Laura Godoy because we finished the, the previous roundtable uh, speaking more or less about uh, certifications, accreditations, uh, which is not the clearest thing for me at least. <laughs> so, as you work exactly with this kind of stuff, can you tell us, please, basically, the difference between certification and accreditation? Good morning, everybody. Thanks for inviting me to the second symposium. This is a very suitable question. It's normal, it's not only natural that we feel confused with the two terms, because apparently they are synonyms and they tend to be clearly related. Technically speaking, we could say that certification is the process uh, carried out by a third party body and independent authority, such as certification authority. It verifies a specific company meets the requirements of a, of a specific standard. So if they fulfill those requirements, a decision is made. And if positive is favorable, a certification is issued. So that's the definition of certification. On the other hand, we have the accreditation notion. It's an assessment process we, the certification agencies, need to implement. We need to verify we fulfill technical competencies to carry out certification processes. So who's in charge of uh, assessing us? There is an official government promoted body in Spain, the highest authority is the LAC, the National Accreditation Authority. That's the main difference between certification and accreditation. Accreditation is us certification agencies are subjected to an assessment process so that we can 
well, uh, properly certify companies and businesses. And that leads to generating more and more confidence in the in, in, in the sense that certification processes are reliable. So customers can feel, um, I mean, at ease and, uh, and uh, they see that we are trustworthy. Our auditors are trustworthy so that companies that are certified are, I mean, good to go. So our role is key to provide confidence and trust to customers. That is correct. Just to give you a practical as example of how this trust-based chain works in our market. On the one hand, we have we could have the market, public administrations, they demand producers to provide reliable um, products, high quality products. Therefore, companies, businesses should prove and uh, show that the, their products and services are fully reliable with all guarantees and safeguards required by the market. How are they proving that they request an evaluation, an assessment, a certification to a, a, an authority, which is us? So now we come on the stage, we do our job and certify that the process, the product, the service is reliable in, enough. And this is the best way to show the market and stakeholders that the company fulfills all requirements imposed. So those of us that need, I mean, that do that job need to fulfill technical qualifications and requirements. So we are accredited. We have been accredited to carry out that job, to perform that task. So accreditation is a layer that is higher, a higher level compared to certification. I know it can be a bit tricky. Uh, so you're dealing with accreditation and you're dealing with animal welfare. How many uh, accreditation schemes do you know uh, focused on animal welfare? Based on my experience, first of all, I would like to, to establish the difference between an accredited certification and a non-accredited accredited certification. So the accredited certification, it is the owner of the benchmark of the scheme that oversees certification processes to entities. They are the owners of the scheme, generally speaking. But when we speak about an accredited certification scheme, that benchmark, that reference, had to go through an ENAC accreditation. This is the highest body in Spain, ENAC, E-N-A-C, so as to achieve an in a scheme that can be accredited. So we, a certification companies or authorities, sorry, need to get accredited for that scope, for that specific scheme that entails that every year ENAC assesses us, carries out a monitoring process to all of us, to all, um, bodies and authorities. So we have a public body behind underlying everything. And uh, how are these schemes uh, uh, implemented, carried out? So how do they work exactly? I can ask the first question and I will link it to the second one. Your first question was about my experience with accredited schemes for animal welfare. In Spain, currently, we have accredited schemes supervised by INAC. We are in the process of that, of so because it's relatively new. 
So it's us, the certification agencies that need accreditation to be able to carry out audits. This is a, a, a ramp up time. And so this is a transient moment because if we do not get that accreditation, we'll not be able to carry out certifications. There is an initiative by the Interprofessional Association of the Meat Sector. So we have schemes. So, um, so the commitment, the commitment by Intervacuno, Valle, so animal welfare commitment by the Interprofessional Association of the Goat and uh, Sheep uh, Meat Sector. And more recently, they were the one by Interpor, Interprofessional for, for white meat um, pork sector. So these are the three other professionals. So poultry, meat, rabbit, they already developed their own seals and labels, and they are about to finish the process with uh, INAX accreditation. All of them launch, launched an initiative last year so as to develop a commercial brand called B Plus Commitment for uh, Animal Welfare. So that brand will provide... Uh, confidence to consumers whenever they go to shelves in supermarkets, they'll see a logotype of this commitment on the products. So as to have full transparency and trust that the meat product comes from farms, slaughter centers and industries that uh, passed that accreditation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, I go back to you, Paolo, because I, I interrupted you pretty harshly. Uh, as you have realized, I am very much into this uh, fact that, that we deal emotionally often with, with animal welfare, and you are a scientist. So basically, uh, animal welfare regulations must be science-based, okay? We all agree with that and objective. So how, how can we guarantee that, and how can we uh, approach to all this uh, in a scientific way in a scientific way, sorry, rather than emotionally. From a, from the, uh, from a scientist point of view, how can that be possible? Uh, of course, uh, as, as said, um, the regulation should be science-based according to the ev science evidence, updated, of course, and uh, to this regard, the F's opinions are yeah, uh, we have uh, many, and that uh, they should be the, the baseline for developing updated regulations. At the same time, if you look to the uh, recent uh, evaluation of the past regulation, um, it, is, it is very important that the regulation should be very clear. Clear, I mean, uh, uh, shouldn't be subjective. Uh, in, a, in, in the interpretation and so and um, some terms terminology like uh, enough sufficient uh, proper adequate should be avoided as much as possible because leading to subjective interpretation by the competent authority and leading to unfair competition between uh, uh, livestock farmers across uh, EU countries and, and regions so we have to talk about regulation and their uh, interpretation and application so and this is very important of course at the same time of course regulation should be uh, should be matching with the uh, scientific evidence but should be also feasible and applicable and um, and in the in the real uh, conditions and also it should be environmentally and um, economically uh, feasible in the short, medium and long term, of course. And this is a challenge, of course. But sometimes some provision to improve animal welfare that are not on, in the same direction of environmental sustainability. I'm talking about uh, carbon print uh, and uh, so animal uh, welfare and can be impacting so more. Could could in some in some 
situation, I'm not talking, but uh, uh, this is something that should be taken into account because uh, according to the Green Deal, we want to be sustainable in terms of uh, ethical and welfare, but also environmental uh, and, and also e economy also is important. When I talk about economy, the economy of uh, the, the farmers, uh, but also economy of uh, the, the European Union. And also I would like to talk about uh, the one welfare concept. So when we talk about welfare, we are talking about the welfare of the animals, but also we shouldn't um, forget the, the, the welfare of the farmers. And when we talk, I'm talking about the work safety, the environment in which the, 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 the farmers are doing their job. And um, so, of course, this is a challenge. We have to try to find a compromise between all these challenges, which are related to animal welfare, but also the situation in which animal welfare is a uh, uh, guarantee and it is managed by, by, by the farmers, not only by the farmers, by the vets, advisors, and the other um, actors of the livestock chains. Yeah, that's a, quite challenging and also why I find so fascinating all this topic because to I mean, you improve animal welfare, you, you risk to raise the carbon emission. Uh, and then you risk to raise the cost of the farmer. So they cannot, it's, it's, it's pretty challenging. So that's why I, I like to, to deal with that. Now, speaking of uh, farmers, but also of consumers, and going back to the accreditation point, now I ask you, Paolo, uh, how can, in your opinion, be easily uh, and properly understood an accreditation system by farmers and then by consumers, maybe also through labeling, uh, so, how can it be understood I, yeah, in your I opinion? Think that's, uh, of course, uh, animal welfare standards should be well understood, of course, by the competent authority, but mainly by the consumers. And when a consumer goes in, into a shop and want to buy a uh, certified animal welfare food or, or product of animal origin, uh, that consumer should be acknowledged, should be aware about the minimum requirements of EU legislation, and so, and also what is a, a plus, what is more than, uh, what is above the minimum requirements, in order to be able to consider the, the balance between the higher cost, if there is an higher cost, and the benefit for the animal, which was uh, certified by that certification scheme. And this, this is a matter of, uh, Clarity, well, for instance, some uh, animal health standards talk about uh, the five freedom that Sandor mentioned before, or some other certification scheme talk about farming systems. And farming systems, usually when we talk about cage or out of cage or free range or organic, are well known. For instance, if you look to the egg labeling system, this was uh, very clear to the, the, to, the, to the consumer because, but sometimes is not totally true that uh, free range is better than uh, a barn system. It depends on the management. Sometimes well-managed barn systems are better than free range, uh, not well-managed. So. So this is important also to take into account the farming system, but also the way in which the animals are kept, the management and, the, for instance, the five freedom. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, Laura. No, so Laura and Laura, so you understand without say, saying the surname. Um, we are saying that, uh, and I like now to have the opportunity also with uh, with Andrea Gavinelli, maybe to have uh, clarified a bit the situation. But uh, from my point of view, it's a bit confused, no? The the, the animal welfare uh, situation, and uh, I wanted to ask you, again, as you're a scientist, how can we improve properly on uh, an animal welfare improvement if the general picture is uh, not that clear. I mean, it's not uh, contradictory. I mean, yeah. 
You're a scientist. Help me, science, please. Exactly. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, is it on? Yeah, okay. So I think it's very clear, it's very clear what people want from a society point of view regarding animal welfare. Maybe you mean in terms of the science itself, it's kind of been plagued for many years with being considered not scientific or subjective, as you say, and um, not objective. But I think, you know, it's still a relatively young science, but we're 30, 40, 50 years into the science. and. It is very clear we have objective measures and very um, clear welfare indicators that have been validated that we so we know very well, you know, what is good and bad welfare now. But in terms of implementing it and getting getting actual improvement, I think what we're doing today and what today is about is one part of kind of a three or four pronged approach to improving animal welfare. So we need market driven initiatives like like what we're uh, talking about today we need government i think i think we can't have one without you know we, we can't just go down one avenue we need this kind of three-pronged effect um, um three-pronged approach education obviously of consumers we know the consumers have a very poor understanding of production systems through no fault of their own there's a complete dis or detachment between um children even and how how farm how farms are operated um i think so the, the education is a very important role market driven initiatives like the one we're talking about today but also it has to come down to policy and i think there's two parts of policy with policy when it comes to um, welfare legislation but really we have some huge successes like we got sows out of sow stalls in 2013 and um, but Arguably, we swapped one set of welfare problems for another, but it was a huge progress to get animals out of cages, if you like. But in general, legislation is just protecting against the very worst practices, and it's very hard to demonstrate real improvements in welfare through legislation alone. So it needs a combination of, of these, these approaches. There is very one big policy issue, which is an elephant in the room, if you like, which I like to talk about elephants in the room because um, the cost of the welfare improvements that society wants and the consumer wants um, come, with, come with the cost and nobody is prepared to pay it. Not the consumers, they say they are, but um, when it comes to the shopping trolley, and I know myself, we see these increases in food, they're not prepared to pay and farmers don't want to and shouldn't arguably have to. So there is a segment of society out there that are talking about the, the need for food prices to rise to make farming a viable option for, for producers so that they will go into it and be able to implement the standards that we know, baseline standards that are being eroded because of the need to achieve economies of scale. So it's an area we don't really want to touch, um, but food, cost of food only makes up 10% of our, of our shop, of our budget. So there is potentially room to raise prices, but we see a potential rollback on some of the welfare legislation because of the fear of raising food prices. It's, 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 not, it's not palatable, but we can't have it all without, without, without some of these unpalatable measures. So, you know, I think they're the only, I think they're the mechanisms through which we can raise animal welfare, albeit still a science that's plagued with being considered a bit hazy <laughs> and uh, and when you speak about uh, because you're from ireland i was in ireland last week and, uh, and you're speaking about education which is taking me to to the next question i want to ask you which is similar to the one i asked already paolo so i was there and uh, and i've seen i was reading that uh, there is a, a state-funded project which is taking teachers to teach sorry children to eat less meat and dairy and uh, I was wondering why, because I was there and my hotel was by a school and I've seen hundreds of kids, teenagers, I think 90% had in their hands either chips or sodas. So chips we, or what? Sodas and, uh, and uh, soft drinks and, oh, and jokes, sweets yeah. and stuff. So I was uh, wondering what uh, uh, is uh, education about. Uh, but anyway, this is a polemic that we'll keep yeah, for another time because I know you're very passionate and we yeah, risk yeah, to, yeah. To, to go out of time. No, what I wanted to ask you about education, about information. First, uh, something similar from a, your scientific point of view, how can we set a reliable accreditation mm. system? And as we are speaking about that in this round table, how can we take it from the science to the table? So how can a consumer understand it easily because it's really not banal for an average person maybe again through labeling so i ask mm. you more or less the same thing mm. 
Yeah, well, to be reliable, first of all, it has to be verifiable. And you talked about this as well. I mean, without good data and being data driven, we're at nothing, you know, so there has to be very good evidence base for 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 the for the accreditation scheme or whatever. And it has to be data driven. There's a lot of untapped data resources out there, you know, routinely regulatory collected data that we could be tapping into that tell us about animal welfare. So that is um, that is very important. Then, of course, we need to use a validated welfare assessment scheme. And ideally, that's one that involves a lot of animal based measures, which is really tricky to balance because they take a lot of time to to collect data on these measures and even aggregating them in scores and that we have the welfare quality val uh, scientifically validated protocol for measuring welfare of cattle and pigs and it really isn't being implemented there was a nice study recently came out from the clear farm part project and they were saying very few of the schemes they evaluated in europe actually were using very many of these um, welfare quality type assured um, metrics and indeed, they are the ones I guess the consumers relate to, you know, behavioral ones, they like um, evidence of natural behavior of animals and things. And they are the ones that are even the lowest um, used in most of the accreditation schemes that are out there, um, indicators and measures relating to appropriate and natural behavior of animals. And yet that's what the consumer wants to know about when they buy a product that's very important to them the behavioral side is very important and we know from success with things like um organic milk and that in denmark it's the naturalness of the product and things that that gets buy-in from consumers so we have a bit of a way to go there in terms of matching what we know from the science to bring it into accreditation schemes such that they meet consumer expectations and such that they deliver for the animal because obviously what's really important is that if you're going to make a claim about animal welfare, you have to be able to verify and demonstrate that claim against baseline data that you're showing continuous improvement for the animals on the farm, because otherwise it's it's greenwashing or, or whatever, you know, so and, and then you lose trust from the point of view of the consumer then as well, if, if they sniff that there's some greenwashing going on. So it's an iterative um, process, I think. And the last thing, uh, one last thing, what are the benefits or the limits, in your opinion, uh, of, uh, let's say, state-run uh, versus uh, NGOs-run or uh, uh, private-run mm. accreditation systems? Mm. So, because there are different uh, schemes, so what are the benefits, uh, the yeah. drawbacks, uh, the differences? So we actually did an evaluation recently of four or five dairy cow welfare um, schemes that are throughout Europe and some were state run, like in Ireland, we have Board Bia, the sustainable dairy, the SDAS scheme, uh, which is state run. Um, but really, you know, our, our evaluation of that scheme was that it was really just guaranteeing minimum and baseline standards. It wasn't really raising the bar above legislative minimums. So that was a state run. And then we had some in the middle company type um, schemes that they're, they're, they're named in the paper. It's no, it's no secret what they were. And then the, the other extreme, I guess, was the Freedom Food or uh, RSPCA Assured, which is an NGO run, which of course is very good on the welfare side in terms of raising standards and continuous improvement of animal welfare and farm. So they were the two extremes. But I think we know from the literature that consumers at least prefer a blend. They trust better, uh, say an EU mandatory level labeling throughout the EU will have more buy and more trust from consumers than a food business operated one. But, but I think a food business operated one at a voluntary level within countries is very important because it shows huge commitment by the industry and it's re really important. But we know that consumers would prefer to see maybe an NGO sitting on the board or something like that to show that there's that they as stakeholders are being represented in the development of the scheme. So I think probably the best blend is is a blend maybe, you know, of different tiers you know, different tiers with government, different levels of government involvement, and then down to voluntary business run ones, but with stakeholder societal representatives maybe on them. So some kind of blend. I don't know if there's any perfect answer to that, but. Uh, I can imagine there's not, but uh, yeah. you have a surely a better view on these things. And uh, <laughs> it must be difficult to be a, a company based uh, system, because if you don't do that, 
you don't do anything. If you do that, you're just protecting your business. So I guess yeah, no, we are pretty there. demanding. Yeah. As well. okay. No, no, but uh, thank you very much. Um, Andrea Gavinelli. So thanks again for joining us. Uh, I ask you, first of all, uh, so we were saying that the EU legislation about animal welfare is pretty good compared to, to others. And I guess I can say it's uh, in a big part thanks to, to you. So, but you're still humble and objective. <laughs> so how uh, is, from your point of view, the current EU legislation on animal welfare compared to the rest of the world? It's working? I think so. No, you shouldn't yeah, yeah, push. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, good morning to everyone, and thank you. Now, um, I've been in this uh, a long time, doesn't mean that I have a responsibility in total of this, <laughs> to be clear. <laughs> now, um, we have been talking about uh, science and animal welfare. It's true that uh, at least uh, one thing is uh, a merit of the European Union work uh, that uh, with the first measure adopted in the 90s, uh, that were coming from uh, a discrepancy in the internal market, uh, UK was leading at that time. Uh, we provoked uh, investment in research in the area of uh, so techniques and welfare together and in end with public health and animal health at the same. Now, the problem of our uh, situation is that in fact, uh, we have uh, uh, an authority, the European Food Safety Authority that is uh, capable to condensate, analyze, and report about the advancement in science. And uh, they've been working uh, very well and hard, uh, and Paolo knows very well, in the last 20 years. And they brought uh, knowledge that helped even the colleagues from uh, the World Animal Health Organization to bring on standards and references that we have to be proud as Europeans. These are helpful for certification schemes, for a way of uh, connecting the private uh, schemes with the, a public uh, authority that is having an independent opinion. And I think this is a good way to look into the way to analyze uh, from the technical point of view the state of the art of zootechnics today. Now, animal welfare legislation that was born uh, some more than 25 years ago is confronted and uh, we've been, as you know, working on the process of reform of this by the demand we got from the farm to fork uh, and the Green Deal, uh, is uh, now confronted with uh, an incredible challenge because uh, it's a battle that we cannot lose today. It's the battle of the future of zootechnics versus uh, climate change and the resilience of the food system. Are three big world, three, three big words, three big challenges. That of course I don't think that uh, it's easy to condensate in a debate uh, about uh, the quality of the legislation versus the system. I think the transition for this answer require a visionary work together by all the stakeholders that uh, we had the opportunity to meet uh, in the process of analyzing and building the impact assessment. You know, every proposal of the Commission is based on a huge work of social and economic analysis, uh, and not only scientific. We had more than 300 meetings in the last two years uh, with the different stakeholders, every day practically. And um, when we come to the system of certification, one, one issue was clear that uh, we met more than uh, 50 different uh, responsible of different type of labels in Europe that have been developed only in the last 15 years. Um, this means a lot from the point of view of, of uh, the internal market, because this uh, is uh, really an element of fragmentation that um, in the resilience of the system is surely impacting because it add cost to the system and difficulty in terms of competitiveness. The other element that we have is that uh, the, this certification system costs to farmer. Uh, the product at the very end uh, is costing more. Certification system like the Better Leaven or many other that we can quote uh, more than 10 just by heart. Uh, here, this system are bringing revenues that are 
from the 3% to the 20% on the market in terms of the cost of the final product. But how much is transferred to the farmer, uh, to the producer, is much uh, uh, is uh, really uh, connected also with the capacity of the farmer organization to represent this market chain, to be part of transferring this cost to the consumer. Clear cut, the loser in this game, uh, and we saw from our meeting, and this is what we analyze, are in particular the small and medium enterprise. The huge enterprise, when they're confronted with a label in the system and dealing with the retailing, they survive. The small one, and I was meeting even the Swedish farmer uh, recently, I was in Uppsala, they, to improve animal welfare, to be in a scheme, they had to pay to get back, to get out of the business, some of them, to be competitive. So it's clear cut, a challenge, why? Because in a way, the resilience of who is producing and the fact of the food security is the big demand. In 25 years, less water, less resources, less protein. This will put extra cost, extra burden, and is not the project of the common agricultural policy to let the small and medium enterprise that are the 90% of the farmer in the concept of this grow, go away. And it's not the business. Why welfare is on the plate? Well, welfare is on the plate um, because um, it's a way to communicate a lot to who is choosing something on the shelves, the consumer, the citizens. We are, uh, as, as I was joking uh, with my team, extraordinary team of people that uh, was assisting this work in the last uh, two years, I will print out a T-shirt one day at the end of all this, because I have three T-shirts in my, I repeat this everywhere, but this one is what you just said before, that People are always saying that they're ready to pay for animal welfare, but when you look into the trolley, they don't pay and they buy the cheapest. Well, this is in any case uh, something that uh, when we look into the capacity of people to understand what you have on the shelf, you realize that practically, and there is a study here from the University of Bologna and on Naples, just brought this one of the hundreds of paper and of social analysis, this is one that was an Italian investigation carried on uh, very recently by the Dipartimento di Scienze Mediche Veterinarie Bologna e il Dipartimento di Agraria Federico II. Just clear cut, when you ask to the Italians what you understand about animal welfare, it's very basic. Practically, the 62% of the, the people of uh, female and they are interested, but they say, I don't understand. When you go to the males, that are not going to the retailer, to the shopping, the 38% only understand what we talk about. The rest of the men, sorry for the men, and I, this is really bad, they don't even know what you talk about. This is also reflected in the sensitivity, sensibility towards animal protection that is between the gender, no? And it's clear. So we have to build a lot about that. That's why, practically speaking, uh, when I look to the work we are doing, we are working uh, towards the options that are public in order to look for an EU multi-tier label, probably voluntary, uh, that could help these 50 more labels that have been growing up to put together their resources and to transfer to the consumer the energy they have already. Because it's clear from the analysis we have that when we go to the farmer, and the data we have uh, is still mysterious when uh, you have uh, the transfer of the price uh, that is getting from the 18% to the 94% of their cost. Sometimes is very low what you gain back. When you go in the reality, the price difference is the fact that you have, of course, games about the price of food played by retailer, and I don't blame any retailer here, but it's the case that we have with the analysis of the price in the supermarket in the last 12 years, 12 months. Practically speaking, we go to the fact that, again, the small and medium are the one more at risk when they invest in quality. And this is not good, in my opinion. This is not good for anyone. Because quality means, and we come back to the three elements of the beginning, resilience, food security, protection of the environment. These are three elements that are essential for the future of the Europeans, not, to, not only of the farmer. And this is our end-in-end -end discussion that has to be brought very urgently on the table of everyone from the public and the private. 
And that's weird to say, and very weird, uh, we're talking about animal welfare, when in fact, uh, it was mentioned before, there's a concept of one welfare that I would extend um, as a transition to really one resilience, because the survival of animal species and human species in this global uh, challenge of climate change is the, the big thing. So I will even push further from one health to one welfare to one resilience. And this is the real issue we talk about. Now, and I conclude, one element that was always uh, uh, close uh, to my heart is to see how much uh, technology you need to run a farm today. And it's true, there is a lot of technology more and more demanded. And Paolo, from an institute that is on this business, knows how much technical is to build and to breed. Sheep and goat could be less, but when you go to poultry and pigs, it's a lot. And uh, to be honest, how much transfer of capacity is going into young farmer to make them understanding how to use properly technology and invest in technology, in digitalization, in artificial intelligence, how much transfer of resources is done today? It's only the 15%, one five of the total common agricultural policy budget. And it's not just for extreme technology, it's for the basic ones. So be careful about that, because the future, in my opinion, needs improvement. And uh, when you go to welfare, fantastic to say, the breeding uh, of animals pass through genetics. And genetics is a masterpiece of technology today for certain breeds. You know, we have poultry growing up. Uh, how much per day now? Uh, I forgot. Uh, 50 grams per day? I don't know, someone knows better than me, is in our impact assessment, but our IA 800 pages, you know. So anyway, the problem we have is that technology to keep this animal alive costs resources, cost energy, cost protein, because in fact, protein to feed animals is protein that is used in large amount comparing with the amount we use to feed humans today. These are all elements to be put in a square circle. Next week in FAO, there will be a four days event on the livestock transition towards sustainability, a global event with uh, 500 uh, and more experts that will gather about that. I will be pleased to be there too. But I believe it is a strong message that FAO is launching to all these communities saying, here, we have to take this very seriously. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, holistic <laughs> approach, I would say. And uh, yes, because we are, uh, I would like to go on speaking because it's such an important topic because we're speaking of, again, food scarcity. So the food security at stake, uh, climate. I would say even personally, I'm even more scared, scared of uh, biodiversity loss. And then migrations, it's all connected. So I, thank you very much for this, uh, this, this approach. Uh, but it would take too long, so I, I, as we're speaking of science here, I go back to this interesting study I didn't know about the University of Bologna and Napoli. Uh, no, the fact that uh, uh, most uh, uh, of the people apparently don't have a clue about this thing. So my question is, uh, in Europe, in the European Union, but I would say in, uh, in many other places, a lot of research has been done. You've made yourself hundreds of meetings and, and you worked a lot on this. Uh, but finally, not so much was taken literally uh, onto the field. Huh? And uh, uh, so farmers, consumers are still not really knowledgeable about these things. So my question is, in your opinion, how can we do that? How can we take science from uh, from the research centers to the table or to the shelves or to the farms? A million dollar uh, question is called in Italy. I know. Indeed, indeed, I tell you, thank you. It's a very important question. DG Research, uh, our colleagues uh, in many areas, and DG Agri, that is responsible for the research area here, um, are really investing a lot in this. I think this could be a good seminar about that only to organize with the competent uh, colleagues. And um, personally, I feel that um, 
In many areas, this process has been already developed outside agriculture. The transfer of knowledge and science to the real field practice in certain industrial area is ongoing. Transport, for example. So you have, in fact, a, a transposition of knowledge and technology. You have now electric cars with artificial intelligence that are creating an optimization of their energy and the consumption of it. You have a capacity for, far, for uh, factories to reduce the impact uh, in their production of cars. All come from research and has been transposed to the producers straight. Um, probably in the agricultural side, uh, um, we have a lot of uh, uh, possibility to learn from the other fields. With the big problem here. The big problem is that uh, the 90% of a farmer are small and medium enterprise. The concept, when we tried in the impact assessment to define how many small and medium enterprises you have in, in, in the EU farming sector, we went to DigiGrow and say, how you define a small medium enterprise? And they told us, this is below some hundreds people employed. <laughs> that automatically means that every farmer is a small medium enterprise because we are below any threshold that is decided. So it means reconsidering also the fact that in transfer of technology and knowledge, we have a we need an infiltration of information and capacity building and so on that starts probably from the from the schools agri technical institutes in europe should be another important spinal cord of the transformation because they have to become the heart of transferring this knowledge and being connected with, with the research, not only at European level, of course. Especially when we connect this with the sustainability part, the environmental part in particular, where we are talking when we talk about welfare. I noticed a statement before because uh, um, we said sometimes welfare is not uh, sustainable from the uh, environmental point of view. Okay, uh, this statement is something that we analyze in our impact assessment too. And it, Currently saying is has been also I saw some um, uh, information also from the industry that we met about the, the lack of sustainability of certain animal welfare practices today. But in fact, this is an important uh, element to consider, and uh, this is an important element that makes us thinking about what we want in the future from our animal welfare. I mean, we are far from the idea of the 90s in which for us animal welfare was the idea that you take an animal you put it outside and then it's happy now we are not thinking about this concept this concept is what is a romantic idea of animal welfare today i think that modern zootechnics and modern technologies in farming cannot survive without a concept of ethics and morality that recall certain romantic ideas of the past. But they have to also confront themselves with the incredible reduction in availability of resources that will come in the next 20 years. And that's an important alarm bell that people that are connected in this world, because they have, in my opinion, a larger culture and larger vision in terms of what is mean in farming an animal, and I speak about farmer as consumer, eh? I mean, the 38% the of men, only 38 in Italy, <laughs> this is in case, something I can share you a copy in, without a problem, it's published anyway. So I would say these people should, should be the one driving this transfer of knowledge, because they understand the urgency of it. I hope I reply. Well, yeah, thank you very much. Um, one last thing, now oh, the journalist is coming, it's, it's stronger than me, now without gossiping, but I have you here, I have to ask you what you think, we are mentioning about this uh, Financial Times leak, about uh, the European Commission risking even to drop the uh, revision of the plan, uh, so I'm, I'm asking you of course, when you, what you 
can tell us about that or what you think about that. And then I ask you to um, what you think about uh, uh, the a particular part of the speech of Ursula von der Leyen last week in her State of the Union speech. Uh, and I quote, we need more dialogue and less polarization. That is why we would like to start a strategic dialogue on the future of agriculture in the EU. It is my firm conviction that agriculture and nature conservation can go hand in hand and are both necessary. So your opinion about this statement, statement of uh, von der Leyen, and uh, which is I, again, is kind of rhetorical because we were already uh, saying before that we need to go to work together and you said it yourself with all the stakeholders and uh, what you can tell us about the situation because uh, when i read this thing of the this article by the by the financial times i got confused <laughs> you too maybe <laughs> exactly but i mean article uh, we know we do not have particular comments on a press article now this uh, this is the typical um, issue of the brussels bubble no that you have voices running here and there and especially when a file is becoming a uh, something that is on the hot, hot spot because it's one of the latest uh, files uh, connected with the far to fork we are uh, we are going into a political uh, situation i have no comment uh, specifically on this because i uh, really uh, we are accustomed to have this uh, type of statement on every type of uh, policy and uh, as uh, more than 20 years in my life here in brussels uh, uh, teach me that uh, uh, Every day you can see a new a new title. So whatever it is, we are keep we are keep working steady and hard, and exactly reflecting what has been in the speech of the State of the Union. That is in fact uh, uh, reflects uh, and is the leading uh, of the policy making for us because he's our president. To be honest, it's a speech to the rest of the European citizens in front of the European Parliament. I'm only proud of, uh, I'm proud of many things of the work of this last year. One of the things that I see reflected in this speech is exactly that uh, the more than 300 uh, dialogue we had with the stakeholder on animal welfare in the last two year and a half with my staff and the groups we have created in the animal welfare platform have been really facilitating uh, the communication and the sharing of experience between the experts of all Europe. And uh, we're a lot working in favor of uh, demolishing uh, the ignorance of the different stakeholders between the fact that there were no opportunity to talk and we created this opportunity. So, I mean, animal welfare in a small world is really a, a place of dialogue. Uh, it's not the general common agricultural policy that the president was referring to. Uh, of course, but uh, we will be proud to offer our experience to what will be the next uh, dialogue uh, to teach uh, something of our experience, how to avoid polarization, how to build up on this. Um, there is uh, no, uh, as I said, uh, no possibility to advance uh, without dialogue, but at the same time, and this is easy to say, but at the same time it's urgent to find a solution. So whatever you have to do is in any case a negotiation at the end of the story so it's, it's fundamental but is it taking long still in your opinion okay so thank you very much uh, before moving to the questions i pleased to say that uh, i've seen michelangelo Ligera uh, arrived so i ask you please to come and improvise so if you because if you want we can do that now or uh, in the next round table, you will start. OK, because I've seen you, so I thought maybe I leave you my chair. I'm so kind. So because I'm staying uh, enough on this chair today. And uh, let's see if there is some questions for our speakers. Wow. OK. Are you comfortable there? Cool. Because I think we stay. I was thinking to be early for once, and I think uh, no, let's see here. I see, I see many times, Gavinelli, Gavinelli, Gavinelli. No, it's a bit for all. There is, no, no, it's, I, have, I have questions for all of you, I think, yes. So, let's start. Gavinelli. If we have high standards and also high prices, 
why we get animal food from third countries with no animal welfare, no environmental issues, but cheaper? Not yeah. mine. I didn't know. No, no, okay, thank you. I, I pick up immediately because this is one of the other t shirt I have to print. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and this is the second. I think we will have the third one. And I'm pleased about that question. And I thank you for the question, of course. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the question. And in fact, um, uh, is again uh, an important um, element to have the data and the knowledge about what is going on in Europe about import. Uh, of um, protein from animals today and uh, export at the same time. Uh, it's clear cut from the international point of view that our markets, as today, uh, we have uh, for certain products like, uh, and Miguel Angel, hi, he's just arrived, but he knows. Our major clients, uh, when we talk about export, uh, are clients that are looking to quality in the majority. And we have clients like UK, Norway, Switzerland, uh, United States, we export to Canada. I mean, that's, that's something that is bring us back some uh, revenue, but it can't go out because we have an high reputational capacity in our. When we talk about the import, uh, first of all, import in animal uh, products uh, is a very limited uh, situation. And uh, in fact, um, we are uh, having a large quantity of imports also from countries that have a certain animal welfare situation uh, and uh, even certification when we talk about New Zealand lamb, for example, or uh, some products for, that we receive from UK. The, the issue is um, that we have, of course, import from countries uh, like uh, Brazil, it's true. And we have, uh, for example, the 1.6% uh, of their uh, poultry production that is coming to the EU. These are data from a few years ago. Eh? So, but I don't have everything in my brain. I repeat, the impact assessment is a large thing. But probably is 1.6%. To be honest, uh, um, this 1.6% is mainly traded from one company. This is a multinational company, owned partially by Chinese. So let's think about is a global challenge this one is a global challenge in which uh, europe must stand strong and this is why we have been uh, analyzing the possibility to requiring and this is in the option of our impact assessment in requiring that animal welfare should be certain elements of it like the phasing out of cages could be reflected in what is uh, the product that is imported into the eu this would be a great breakthrough and will help a lot to answer to this question that come very frequently from citizens that have uh, and feel a moral uh, obligation to be able to really respect animals, not only when they're farming in Europe, but also outside. So today uh, we have several bilateral and multilateral activities uh, we have been working very insistently and constantly with the uh, war as uh, many in bilateral we have some ftas where there is animal welfare uh, it's clear cut that we have uh, the possibility to do more and this is what we can engage that will be important and i probably uh, something to invest in the future Thanks. Now, I, another one to you, as you're already speaking, then I move to the other speakers. Um, well, one is asking uh, if you can share the, the link of this study or the title again, sure, so they can be find it online. So University of uh, Bologna and Naples, Federico II. Okay, I do it. Thanks. A case study on profiling Italian consumers of animal, of animal friendly foods. Okay by Taylor and Francis. So if you if you check online, I'm sure you'll find the link. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. I it's available myself. on the web. Eh? It's no, no, thanks a lot. And no, the other question I was trying to, to understand because uh, can we, okay, I read it as it is. Can we imagine that in the perfect world where we respect all animal welfare, the goal will not be to increase animal welfare, but to stop breed animals. So. I guess uh, it's another provocative uh, question. So if we are reaching the perfect animal welfare standards, what's next? We stop breeding, we stop farming. I guess that's the provocation. 
do we? <laughs> I don't think uh, we have a responsibility here to determine what will happen in, in 30 years. As I said, farming uh, and human-animal bond uh, are stronger than ever. If you see the now, in fact, we are working on impact assessment e even to regulate the breeding uh, of cats and dogs today, that is a multi-billionaire business in the EU, because there is a high level of concern in citizens that are buying uh, puppies uh, for thousands of euros of cats and dogs, and they have a problem of uh, big sufferings in these animals that sometimes are bred and, and commercialized in very poor condition and they are dying. I mean, it's ethically for me not acceptable that buying a car with a guarantee and can be replaced if it's not working is good but buying a, a, a dog, a living animal that is dying and can be replaced because a guarantee, how you justify, justify this to your children, no? It's not surely nice. So, practically speaking, um, I think that uh, the human-animal uh, bond uh, makes animals to be farmed and uh, to be farmed uh, with love, because we love breeds of certain type, we love to see animals in the farms, and we even love to have animals at home. I mean, my neighbor just uh, bought four ants, and they are very proud. They are two teachers, young, and they are very proud of their four ants because they bring eggs every morning. So I tell you, it's quite funny, but it's true. They are not farmer, they are just neighbor. But to say stopping farming is not the reality. The problem is the challenge of farming that will come with the, the changes we have in the reality of every day. I mean, we have to count important impacts. And I could quote another study from Emilia Romagna, actually, that I found after the floods in Romagna. It was a study very interesting, and because it showed also how certain intensification phenomena on a small area, because of the cementification of the surfaces, created even a, a higher risk for the environmental situation. And in fact, uh, how many chicken we have in Romania that are farmed. Several, mi several millions, I suppose. And that's the problem. So that will come to the issue. When we go to the zoonotics and uh, avian influenza, it's clear cut, uh, and I was talking with the GDS farmer yesterday, they are farming calves in France. Uh, and uh, they are saying clearly, the density of farms, the intensification is bringing diseases to carry, to be running through farms more easily. And they say it. I mean, I'm not the one saying. So farming needs certain requirements, certain way of looking into it. And uh, it's not a question of changing the system that will stop the farming. For me, if we don't change the system, we will have to stop the farming. Thanks. You managed to also transfer this provocation, I would say. Um, oh God, again, uh, well, no, wait, I ask also the others and uh, I will go on until we have time because they're constantly coming. So I would change a bit the speakers because uh, please take your microphones because you're, uh, you're all in. Uh, let's start with, uh, okay, Laura Godoy. I start from the top. You said that accredited certificates have to be authorized by ENAC in Spain. What does an act value and what is the difference with a non-accredited certificate? Yeah, trust. Yeah. Whenever we speak about an accredited scheme by ENAC, our National Accreditation Authority or body, this is the maximum, the uttermost authority. There is nobody be above it. So they authorize, they approve certification agencies so that they can carry out the implementation of schemes and evaluation. So we are always backed by the owners of the benchmark. So it is this institution, the one that supervises and oversees that all procedures for conformity assessment are carried out uh, properly and correctly. When, I, when, I, when speaking about a non-accredited 
certificate, we always try to live up to the maximum standards in our ethical codes and working policies. But when somebody is not accredited, it is the owner of the scheme, the one in charge of supervising our procedures. That is to say there is no institution, no authority that supports the scheme. Gracias. Uh, Paolo Ferrari. Uh, no, I've seen another one before because they're still coming and they're one second ah, here. I like this one. Do you think that science has given sufficient support to the current legislative status of the EU? And don't you think there is a need to promote applied research which ensures that the measures actually improve animal welfare? I would say what is sufficient? So I think that Good the, the, Next the, 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 the science provided a lot of information, of course, and sometimes this information is very much focused on the, the animal welfare per se, and sometimes not taking into account uh, what we said before. So the, the compromise with the environmental sustainability, economic uh, and the resilience, as, as said by uh, Andrea Cabinelli. What I would like to tell uh, in relation to the capability of the sector to face the, the, the new challenge is uh, um, that it would be good to promote the network because, between uh, farmers and then farmers association across Europe in order to share technology and best practices. To this regard, there are already some calls of uh, Horizon Europe in relation to thematic network for innovation. And this is a good tool. And uh, I would like to, to promote with more efforts, more funding for that, um, because this is a good way to keep the farmers together and to compare the different situation they have in, the, in, the, in Europe, across regions and countries, in order to learn for, from, from, from the best, for, from those who are more experienced in uh, certain to face the same problems and to share this knowledge and uh, technologies and, and techniques and management between across Europe. And this is a good way to, yeah, to find solutions, even for farmers, to, when they have to switch to a new system, look to the experience of the others, look to the cost and benefits of, of a certain practices in, 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 in economics. And, uh, and learn from, from the others, because this is the oldest system uh, of the farmers to learn from the best. In every situation, farmers usually look to the, to the best one, and, uh, and this is a whole history. And, uh, and so it is important to show uh, what is good in some innovation, what is uh, not good, and how to face this problem in order to fire in the practical and feasible solutions. Thanks. And as you have the mic already on, I go to the next one, which I like. I'm sorry if I'm jumping some and not taking them all, but it's really, there are many, so don't get angry, don't get mad at me, but I lost it. Ah, here. Regarding animal welfare, if we compare the way Australia breed their animals, totally free, in a very extensive, extensive place without real fall of the animal. Is there a way better than you were? So is really the extensive farming in Australia, but I would say also in, in Ireland. I mean, we have also in Europe this kind of uh, livestock farming uh, necessarily better than the one in Italy, for instance, or generally in Europe in stables. I always say when I, I was involved in training farmers about outdoor farming, and when we, are we talk about outdoor farming, I say uh, a farmer running the system should be even better than intensive farmers because there are more, more uh, challenges in outdoor. We have the climate, we have uh, uh, parasites, other kinds of diseases, competition with wild animals. Uh, we know nowadays what is happening about African swine fever. Uh, spread by wild boars, and uh, which is a big challenge at European level, not only at European level, but uh, uh, globally. So, I mean, uh, um, of course, an animal outside uh, 
uh, is uh, yeah, is, a, is a good welfare if if uh, the, the he, if there is a shelter if there is a good management if there is food if the climate is not extreme so um, it's uh, extensivity is uh, is uh, of course can be a plus if you have a a house with a garden is better than a house without a garden. But if you only have the garden, maybe it's not very good in winter time or no summer time. So then back into the what we said before, I would like to tell you about the good uh, um, uh, um, initiatives that is going to start in uh, next year. And this is a thematic network for pig welfare and uh, together with the uh, Chugusk and the other um, uh, research uh, uh, institutions with uh, in central countries in a number of European countries together with the farmers associations so we are going to start this uh, project which is about uh, sharing good practices but also in relation to four main themes which are cages tail biting and um, space uh, and um, provision and, 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 and flooring, which is another challenge in pig farming, and castration, which is another big topic. And um, as here up here, we will do the economic analysis and also the assessment of what will be the environmental impact of these uh, uh, good practices. And um, the, this, as, as the other um, thematic networks, this will be run in uh, three years with consultation at national level and at a European level. Consultation about what are the challenges, what are the um, farmers' needs of innovation, and then, according to these farmers' needs in relation to these topics, look for um, good practices that could be implemented uh, not only in one country but in other countries and the uh, networking i think is very important dialogue and, and networking between uh, research institutions and farmers associations thanks so now i see laura boyle is getting bored no, no, no. yes you do and i have a couple of questions for you of course the, <laughs> the most uh, provocative and difficult uh, brackets as uh, Miguel Angel Higuera is speaking later, I warn people, the, please, the organizers, to, to start maybe prepare the, the buffet. Okay, thanks, because we are anticipating everything. I'm afraid that we stop and it's not ready, so you never know. Uh, Laura, let's start with this one. Um, because it's something I get myself on Twitter and so on about the rich, the poor, you know, the disparities like ah, meat taxation and then we create more disparities, the rich can eat what they want, the poor only junk food. Uh, or uh, here they speak about, uh, uh, basically he's asking food, the good food is only for the rich uh, in, in our society, going on like that. Uh, are we not hampering European production to the point where we do not have enough food for everyone. So it's a bit what we're talking about, uh, food scarcity. So uh, basically, I got myself this question sometimes, are we not pushing so much uh, our farmers that then they shut down their activity? We need to import, it's costing more, we don't eat, or we don't eat properly. What would you say? Yeah, I think like food security at national level is, is, is critically important. I mean, speaking from Ireland, we're very rich in a net exporter of beef and dairy, but we import carrots and tomatoes and basic, you know, legumes, you know, so there's, you could argue that we're a couple of hundred times food secure, but only if you only eat beef and dairy. So, you know, I think there's a need, I mean, my vision is not one of a vegan world, but it's certainly of one with a much more diverse types of farming systems that meet all these different needs like we talked about the you know arguably I, I know that you were saying the cap hasn't you know wants to keep small farmers in business but the way it's working is it's encouraging specialization and economies of scale such that you can only make money if you are huge 
and working in an intensive system. And this is the model that, 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 that needs to be restructured, not to put farmers out of business. There are models there in which everyone wins. Farmers can win. They may be operating a different system. Some will not be able to adopt to a different system and some may just go out of business, but some will adapt. Some will improve their intensive systems through best practice. That model will always be there. But we have room, I think, um, for regenerative systems, for alternative outdoor systems, ones where animals provide ecosystem services. And really, they all align with the one welfare theme. And that gives me the opportunity, because I have to say it, there is, I work with One Welfare, and there is an international One Welfare conference in Burgos in Spain on the 10th and 11th of October. And there's still plenty of room to register for that. And I think it's a really important conference because it is the theme that best fits the picture that I think a lot of us could live with for farming in Europe in, in, in 20, 30 years time. You know, compromises by everyone, consumers may be paying a little bit more for meat of very good quality, maybe eating a tiny little bit more. No one wants to be personally eating insects or, 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 or vegan, but and where farmers may have to adopt, switch systems, but ones that are friendly to the farmer, the labor, the animal in terms of welfare and the environment. And those systems exist. I mean, there's some lovely work at the EAP a week or two ago on silvopastoral systems in South America and that they may not suit Ireland, for example, but 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 there are other types, agroforestry type systems that that could work. And so we need to move away from this monoculture specialization where you can only make money for the farmer by achieving economies of scale. And really, with all the legislation or certification schemes in the world, there's very little room to improve animal welfare in that model. So. Um, I think there's big sacrifices from all stakeholders. I think the animals and the environment shouldn't have to sacrifice because they've sacrificed enough in the past 30, 40, 50 years, and we've damaged them. And it's time that society and consumers and people take a few hits, I think, on, on the little amount we spend on food and our demand for, you know, and as well, it'll bring more high quality food into the market to cater for everyone but that's a utopian vision i know but there that's my utopian vision <laughs> thanks maybe andrea going anyone to say something because i i think i i take the opportunity and the moderator to 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 ask you the same thing because i've been uh, recently last month basically in spain and they visited a, a, a layhen farm two young sisters managing it small family business no more because they had to sell to a group to a big group the second biggest group in spain to survive and uh, there was this uh, because i've seen later there is somebody asking uh, about the end of cage uh, uh, situation um, so they told me really honestly and clearly we needed to invest a lot in putting the cages uh, in, in at the beginning we needed to invest a lot in uh improving the cages say 10 years ago now we are removing the cages giving them to places they mentioned morocco egypt turkey uh, and now we have very high high costs we are producing eggs which are costing more also because of that and uh, we are risking in a free market confirmed also by the fact that people even either don't have a clue about animal welfare or don't care, I realized, or sometimes cannot afford even a few cents more, we are risking to run out of business. Is that uh, an actual risk? And uh, I mean, how can we avoid it? How can we ask our farmers to improve? Because we all say that we all agree that it's absolutely fine. Animal welfare standards without risking to kill them and to see these uh, activities disappearing, not delocalized because it's not possible, but moving somewhere else. So they close it here. And as Carolina was saying today, we import it from Asia, South America. How can we avoid this? Good question. <laughs> I have to say, uh, no, it's an important question. The problem is that the answer will not fit in terms of the yes. time scale. In my oh, but we have time. So but uh, <laughs> to, be, to be clear, is, um, this question is of paramount importance in the sense that um, I think uh, is coming back exactly to what we, we, we are, um, and I share, uh, many of the elements that were stated before. Um, there is um, a question uh, in terms of uh, creating uh, 
opportunities through what is the synchronization and the coordination of the modernization of agriculture towards, in fact, a, a more resilient system. Uh, the fact that you have a certain uh, moral request coming from uh, uh, the citizens uh, when you talk about the, you quoted the NDKJ, that's why. I mean, the fact that you have uh, some uh, elements of reflection from the public opinion that come to the table of the, of the technical people like me or the political tables above, these are elements that uh, are opportunities to open up the box and understand how to plan an evolution of the, sea, of, of the, of the farming. The, the clear uh, uh, problem of the two sisters here is not only for the two sisters, is what was said exactly there, that uh, pre practically speaking, uh, with this type, and we come back when I said uh, we have more than 50 labeling schemes only in the last few years that have been developed in the EU, driven by different elements, merely at commercial reason. I would say these two sisters are paying the price that, in fact, they are not competitive. And uh, the transfer of their price they pay to the final consumer is, is not going down to be back with money to survive. The fact is also that despite that you can get an incredible reputational value doing more welfare and doing proper investment, this reputational value is not monetized today. I was reflecting on this with many of the different stakeholders we met. And, um, the problem uh, is that uh, there are many receipts about this, but very little platform uh, where we can put all this experience together. And I think it could be what you mentioned in the speech of the uh, president is tr is true. Uh, could be for the future common agricultural policy, we could try to put really the small and medium farmer at the center of the uh, common agricultural policy, an instrument that started many, many years ago with an element that was after the war, the idea of the food security. And then we end up to produce mountains of butter, milk quotas, the, even the road premium to, to kill calves. I, I still remember this premium in the 90s where you had to transfer calves from France to, to Germany to be killed. I mean, of course, we have to learn. Uh, men are doing a lot of mistakes, and this is true. Now, these two sisters, if they run out of business, is a mistake. We lose uh, an important uh, element of our uh, resilience. And uh, if they even go out of business because of a particular legislative requirement or a change of a market strategy by a supermarket, it's even worse. That's that's element that are coming into the, the, the need of an analysis and an urgency of it. That's why it's, it's urgent, and I repeat again, to take steps about that. And um, I like very much the possibility to talk, uh, like now, to have this possibility to share, with, thank you to the web, because it's going out of the bubble of Brussels. It's really important to get this message, dialogue must be local decentralized and bring back as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. I hope there is some journalist today <laughs> taking some inspiration. Uh, the, the, the question was saying Laura, Laura Boyle. I don't know if it's they swap the Laura's because it's about again, accreditation. So basically they're asking if uh, so, how can we how do we consumer look at certifications now that you told us that uh, in fact, they're less uh, reliable than accreditation. So if I find a, a certified um, product without an accreditation from a third party, how can I take it? Do I need to do I leave it there? Do I, or it's any way reliable somehow? I, mean, I think they want to provoke today. Yeah. Well, I believe that when we see products with uh, uh, the seal of animal welfare, 
we still need to um, we still need to do the step of uh, wanting to inform the customer when see a product that it's animal welfare certified. We need to inform the consumer that those animals have been bred bred in certified farms with high standards of animal welfare according to standards and legislations. And in addition, uh, we need to inform them that they have been slaughtered in the case of meat products following uh, regulations and they have achieved higher standards than those demanded by the legislation. And also that uh, I believe that in the case of eggs and dairy, it's a different case because we do not need to slaughter the animal to get the product. But as Ferrari said, it is very, uh, it is essential to convey on the label what was, what has been the process that the chicken has undergone to, uh, uh, to get to that egg if they're free range, if they have been bred in cages. I think this would be essential to give that information to the final consumer so they can choose between one product or the other and that they know their origins because that's what we want from the different farms and from the whole um, food chain. And that's the way we take products from the country to our tables on the city, I would say. Because sometimes, for example, people on the city have never been in a farm before because they didn't have the chance of doing it. They don't know how it is to live uh, a life such as a farmer. They don't know how the slaughter process uh, works. That, um, that farmers follow some regulation and legislation to avoid the animal suffering in the ending stages of their lives because farmers do things correctly and that's why we want to convey through those labels. So, okay. So if the, if the products are there, it means there is anyway a series of standards that you need to... Exactly. To okay, but still the, the accreditation is giving more reliability. See, uh Yes, uh, these accredited certifications, apart from having the schemes in the certifications when they're accredited, they have the brand of INAC. And it's apart from being an international recognized label, uh, because we have obtained the signatures and the support of 100 countries in the whole world, it's a certification that provides trust. It generates more trust to the final consumer. Paolo, do you, I have the feeling you want to add something or I just, uh, no, yes. Yeah, you are, you are reading I my mind, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, I would like to say something more about extensivity. Mm. And um, yeah, because we are running a, a project, which is a European project, whose name is Meat Quality which is coordinated by Wageningen University in the Netherlands. And we are collecting data. Uh, we have collecting, uh, collected data uh, this year in 80 far, uh, pig farms in four countries and in um, uh, 60 uh, boiler farms in three countries. And this, these farms are, some are extensive and other are intensive. And we are collecting data about uh, animal welfare, of course, but also about uh, economic resilience. So not only the production cost, but also looking to the relationship between farmers and their uh, social environment and the market environment, the capability yeah, to, to sell their products, not only through the um, big market, but also at a local level, you know, the, and so the carbon CO2 emissions also are calculated for each. And as, at the same time, in, in some of these farms, we are uh, 
doing some investigation. We are collecting samples of uh, meat loins that are um, analyzed for the chemical and physical uh, organolytic uh, properties, but also about the sensorial pro properties. So uh, at the end of this project, which will be in uh, 2025, we will have uh, this uh, collection of data <clears throat> about the intrinsic and uh, extrinsic quality. Yeah. Sorry. <clears throat> Thank you. And, uh, and thanks because uh, now we, in this uh, Spanish uh, uh, lessons I'm getting today, sacrificio is great. I think we should do that in Italian, in English as well. The, the, the slaughtering, no? Is that correct? Is, is a really a good way to 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 express this concept really the, the respect of the animals i really like it sorry i didn't know you were saying like that in spanish now before concluding because uh, uh, i would say that uh, everything is ready and uh, we can anticipate everything of half an hour on top i know that uh, for instance paolo patruno one of the next speakers has to leave have, have, has to leave before so just one last thing uh, Okay, there is one from Gavi again, Gavinelli, but uh, I, I respond. Let's see. If uh, the science has given sufficient support to legislation and farmers, can we be confident in imposing it on third countries or can the same thing happen to us as with hormones? I reply, we cannot impose anything to third countries, but we can require to meet our standards. No? Kind of. It's, a, it's not. A, it's, uh, it's, it's, to, a, it's a question for the lawyers here. Eh? Uh, I mean, talking about animal welfare and uh, what we can require to, to to our trading partner. To be honest, already today uh, the regulation on the killing of animals requires equivalency in the standard system, in the standing system. So that uh, based on the, in fact, the WOA former OAE standards. Uh, we have uh, developed uh, standards in the EU that are required to be uh, uh, applied for all the meat that is tra traded with the EU. So this is already something that we can do by law. Um, definitely, uh, the work we are doing uh, for uh, the analysis and the future proposal is a work uh, that allowed us to analyze also an option to require for certain, require for certain elements of animal welfare to be, uh, in fact, uh, certified in the moment of export uh, to the EU. And uh, we have um, tested this with the legal service of the Commission is an internal work ongoing, but we have also a publication that was a, a communication done by the Commission on that sense that was in fact uh, uh, following the French presidency and about the concept of reciprocity in the sustainable area. And um, it's true, uh, we have uh, elements in the jurisprudence that uh, are giving us uh, uh, the opportunity to require these uh, elements in the case of import. Logically, to do it, we need to have a legislative requirement that are equivalent for ourselves. It's the fair treatment concept. You cannot require something to your trading partner that you are not applying into the EU. That's clear. Okay, thanks. Uh, one last thing before going for lunch. As I said, we anticipate, I tell also the people following from home, from on streaming we anticipate everything half an hour so we will finish at 1 30 uh, sorry at 12 30 now and we'll start at uh, uh, at 1 30 later not uh, at 2 okay so we're also free to leave earlier but i want to ask you all the speakers because no specific speaker could be gavinelli but for everyone whoever wants to reply because it's a topic uh, i like a lot i write about that so the technology in agriculture and in uh, livestock because we we have a vision of you know either bucolic or these uh, old old-fashioned uh, images we have but uh, there's a lot of innovation technology it was also said before uh, not only precision farming but also artificial intelligence another big topic here uh, you have mentioned artificial intelligence Public administrations have databases uh, with countless information that cannot be used to improve animal welfare, and research centers cannot access it. Uh, cannot access it. Sorry. How could could this be solved? Can anybody 
answer to this? I think that big investments should be done in uh, training farmers. I remember years ago, a PC packed into a farm, boat paid, and, and nobody using that. Okay, years ago, eh? 30 years ago. What I mean is that uh, when we talk about precision livestock farming, PLF, there are a number of new technologies which are available and uh, some of them are used in big farms, big farm where, where you use less people, and so technology is useful when you are, don't have the people and you don't have trained people. And training people, uh, worker, training workers in the uh, livestock sector is, uh, is another challenge, also because it's not that easy to find people available and suitable and uh, would like to work in, uh, in intensive farms. So this is the reason why many immigrants uh, are used, uh, are employed. But there is a big turnover very often, so it is quite difficult to have skilled people, well-trained. And um, But this is a challenge. There are new technologies, but new technologies need people able to use them. So information system, you talked about uh, artificial intelligence. There are a number of examples that uh, I could tell you. But um, uh, for instance, uh, electronic sow feeding, it was um, an innovation 30 years ago, and this is still an innovation now. Well, this is, uh, yeah, just, just to tell you. But, um, uh, but the te technologies can provide uh, many solutions they must be tested and uh, and you have to prove the uh, utility for for the farmers and you have to train the farmers learn to, use, to that. use them so exactly. it is not only the availability of the techniques but that you need to how to use it laura can i comment on that because Please. Um, I'm always a bit cynical, I'm sorry, this is just my nature, but I worry about, you mentioned, Andrea, about the certification pushing up costs, and it always falls hardest on the small and medium farmers, and technology is arguably the same. Um, there are risks, and they have been written about, that they will, that, that, that precision livestock farming techniques and technology in general will further intensify the industry. And you could argue, is intensification always bad? No, it's not. But it doesn't necessarily meet with the picture, the vision that's out there for, that society has for farming and that we arguably need to address the environmental labor and animal welfare concerns. So I always feel that technology does not make a bad farmer a good farmer. It cannot possibly do that. It's only as good as the person that's managing it. And it goes a little bit back to what you're saying, but I have huge fears that it's seen as a great panacea, great white hope in solving all our problems on farms. And I do not believe that it will. And I've yet to see evidence that it has done. And I've validated tools that are out on the market for sale that farmers are paying money for that are not working as they say they should be. So there's a huge risk there. Middlemen making a lot of money and farmers and animals arguably losing out again. And I just want to say one thing kind of related to that, which is about the focus on carbon. Because, right, we are all scared to death and can barely sleep at night over all of this. But in a lot of cases, animal welfare will lose against carbon. But if we broaden and maintain a broader vision of environmentalism back to the way it used to be in the good old environmental days, when it was much more than just about carbon, it was about biodiversity, soil health, water health, then you can see areas where there will be symbiosis between animals and the environment. But if it's just solely focused on carbon, which is, this is the danger Thanks. a lot of people Thanks have. Thanks for saying that. Yeah, Thanks, really. you know, this is the danger, I think, of the way things are going. Animal welfare will likely always lose against carbon. So we're gonna have to accept systems that might fail on carbon, but by win, win, win in soil, water, biodiversity, all the rest. So I think there's huge caution around technology and the, the focus on basically zero carbon and not the old fashioned definition of environmentalism. I'm sorry, I had to take the opportunity Thank to Thank you. That. No, no, absolutely. It makes absolutely sense for me. To me, also this obsession with carbon, there are so many factors involved. Uh, Andrea Gavinelli, you wanted to add something about this? No? Okay. So, perfect. So, 
We can go for lunch. Thanks to our speakers, really. Uh, thanks to you for listening and interacting. Again, see you in one hour. Enjoy your lunch. And, uh, well, see you later. Thanks. The bell rang, yes. Hi. So, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome back to the second part uh, well, third round table and second part of the uh, second European Animal Welfare Symposium. Uh, I hope you enjoyed your lunch for the people in presence and also the, the opportunity of networking that we had. I, I met people for the first time in person that I knew since years <laughs> and seeing each other only on screens. So, and I hope uh, all the people uh, on, in streaming are back and uh, sorry if we let you wait a moment now. It was uh, successful the first uh, the first part of the, of this day because apparently from 600 something uh, people registered we are now to 750 so I don't know the, the the registrations are increasing also during the symposium I'm pretty happy about that uh, so another thing uh, operational uh, all the speakers now will speak in English but one the last gentleman uh, Luis Fernando Gonzalez who speaks also English, but uh, uh, is, is more comfortable with Spanish. So I understood that some of you didn't get uh, the message uh, showing which app you need to use. So please, if you have problems, uh, you have time because Luis will be the last one speaking today. But if you don't understand Spanish uh, or you don't understand English because you're Spanish speaking, you can download the app called Interactio or Interactio, maybe in English. So. Uh, interactio with the CTIO, exactly, and uh, uh, you just need to put AW2023 when uh, you will be requested to insert a code, and then you choose your language, okay? If you have headset, it's better, because if not, uh, uh, we're all here. So, we can start uh, this, uh, this uh, second round and, uh, and uh, of, of the symposium. Uh, Unfortunately, the first speaker couldn't manage to be here because on top, I think they're coming from Peru, so it was not really that easy, but they had a last minute issue. Uh, but we managed yesterday to record a very short video interview. I'm speaking of uh, uh, Claudio Sala from Textile Exchange. Actually, he's the standards engagement specialist, specialist at, at uh, Textile Exchange. Uh, which is a global non-profit driving positive action on climate change across the fashion, textile and apparel industry. So, uh, again, my apologies and uh, apologies from Claudio because he's not here, but uh, uh, now to get used again after lunch to, to the place, uh, let's watch this, uh, this short uh, video interview. Thanks. So, uh, welcome to Claudio Sala from Textile Exchange. Unfortunately, there was an unexpected issue, so you cannot be today personally at the symposium, but we managed uh, uh, to, to, to record this uh, short interview. So, Claudio, welcome, even if uh, yeah. virtually. And I'm asking you basically to introduce yourself and uh, to tell us, please, uh, what Textile Exchange is and uh, what is it doing? Great. Thank you so much for the invitation. And we do apologize for not being able to be there live. Um, but I hope the question helps out uh, explain what we do in Textile Exchange. First of all, yeah, my name is Claudio Sala, calling from Lima, Peru. I work in Textile Exchange as a standards engagement specialist. So to address your question, Andrea, uh, what is Textile Exchange? What is it doing? Well, Textile Exchange is a global nonprofit established in 2002. It's dedicated to driving positive impact on climate change and nature within the fashion and textile industry. Our mission is to guide and support a growing community of brands, retailers, manufacturers, farmers, and others committed to climate action, fostering more purposeful production right from the start of the supply chain. With extensive experience in standards development and ownership, Textile Exchange plays a powerful role in the textile industry. 
promoting the understanding and use of sustainable materials and proper verification strategies. It's important also to note that Textile Exchange does not engage in any certification activities. Instead, our sole focus is in supporting the quality and adapt adoption of its standards. Okay, and uh, so basically what types of verification do you use and uh, how does a third party accreditation work? Because today we are speaking a lot about that. Great, thank you for the question, yeah. Textile exchange, exchanges standards address various textile industry aspects, from organic cotton to recycled materials and responsible wool, which is part of the frame of, of animal fibers, of animal welfare, sorry. We focus on environmental, social, and economic sustainability at the producer and initial processing levels. Our standards are developed through an open and transparent process led by Textile Exchange and a multi-stakeholder group, which includes representatives from across the industry and different sectors, including animal welfare groups, industry organizations, supply chain members, brands, and area experts. All policies and procedures are based on the ICEAL best practices. All textile exchange standards are applied to third-party certification. So what does, the, 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 does that this mean? Is that we partner with independent certification bodies that conduct assessments and audits to ensure compliance with our standards. So the process involves collaboration with these accredited certification bodies, third-party certification bodies, which are responsible for evaluating and certifying entities across the supply chain. Textile producers and manufacturers interested in certification apply to these bodies, which conduct comprehensive assessments, including on-site audits and documentation reviews, to evaluate compliance with textile exchange standards encompassing criteria related to environmental impact, social responsibility, labor practices, and more. Following this assessment, the certification body determines certification eligibility, where they grant certification uh, or a recognized label to compliant applicants. Certifi certified entities and go ongoing monitoring and periodic audits to ensure sustained compliance. And in post-certification, they are authorized to use specific labels and claims on their products, enhancing transparency and aiding consumers in making informed choices within the supply chain. So by applying this third-party certification scheme to its standards, Textile Exchange enhances the credibility and reliability of its sustainability, sustainability claims. Independent certification bodies provide an unbiased assessment, and the use of recognized labels make it easier for consumers to identify and support sustainable products within the textile industry. This process helps drive positive change by encouraging end industry stakeholders to adopt more responsible and eco-friendly practices. Uh, thank you, because uh, in, uh, in this third roundtable, we are uh, focusing exactly on the importance for consumers to, to be a bit less confused when it comes to also to labeling. And uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and it's a question of reliability. Reliability, sorry. So that's very interesting. This example. So now a last question already. Uh, what is uh, exactly the textile exchange portfolio of standards, uh, which focusing, uh, which is focusing on animal welfare in particular, and why? Great. Okay, so just to uh, go more in depth about the RWS or the Responsible Standard. This is an, an international voluntary standard that addresses animal welfare in sheep farms and chain of custody of wool from certified farms to the final product. In this case, individual sites from the producer and first processing level are certified by these independent third party certification bodies we spoke about by using annual audits. The material is tracked from the farm to the final product using transaction certificates, which are following the requirements of textile exchange content claim standard. The RWS is designed to ensure that the sheep from which, which wool is sourced are treated in a humane and ethical manner. The standard includes specific criteria related to the welfare of the animals of the wool supply chain based on the five freedoms of animal welfare. While the RWS sets out guidelines for animal welfare, it's important to know that the certification process involves a focus on compliance with these guidelines. Certification bodies assess and verify where wool producers and supply chain entities meet the RWS criteria for animal welfare. So what this standard seeks is to provide a global framework for responsible wool production and animal welfare. But specific practices and standards may be adapted to conform to local laws and customs. 
Certification bodies that work with textile exchange typically co conduct assessments based on status criteria while considering the local text that context and legal requirements. This approach allows for flexibility in certification while maintaining a core commitment to improving animal welfare in the wool industry on a global scale. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it would be nice to, to, to deepen the subject uh, and I welcome everyone to do that. Uh, possibly visiting your website because uh, you're you're uh, acting globally. So it's a, it's a very interesting, concrete example of what we're talking about today. So Claudio, I hope we have the we will have the chance to meet in person one day. And uh, for the time being, thank you very much, and uh, take good care also of uh, uh, with the responsible wood standard and all what you're doing. So take care. Thanks. Thank you so much. And if you want to ask for more info, our website is textileexchange.org. Thank you Thanks, so much. Because, because I didn't remember the domain. <laughs> Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Perfect. Bye. So that was a brief uh, interview with the Textile Exchange. Again, if you want, you can check online what they're doing more specifically. Now, I'm asking the last uh, speakers of the day to to join me on the on the stage and i will start uh, asking mar maestre ladies first but i don't let you speak first don't worry uh, paolo patruno please uh, felipe medina uh, and uh, well uh, luis uh, fernando gonzalez uh, and michel angel higuera finally <laughs> so maybe yeah, I take this place, so I'm closer to the... Okay, let's do that. let me step inside. So please, uh, just uh, from the last one, wherever you want, then I jump here and there. Take what you like. I, I just stay here. Hi, <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, so, okay, in the middle, right. Okay, you leave me close to the lady. I like it. Okay, so I, I'll ask... Uh, uh, Paolo Patruno to begin because uh, uh, because you have a quite important app uh, appointment suddenly. Paolo Patruno, no, it's uh, I know that uh, also you and Felipe need to leave because uh, you need, we need to get, to be flexible. So I will start with you too. Um, Paolo, Deputy Secretary General of Clitravi, which is the professional organization of the meat process, uh, processing industry in Europe, and you're also the chair of the European List of Voice. So we are in touch uh, pretty often in the last period. European List of Voice is a, um, a communication project uh, run by 14 members now, organizations from all the sectors, uh, sorry, all, all the areas of the livestock sector. There is uh, animal health included, there is uh, meat processors, there are uh, uh, beef, uh, poultry, dairy, aquaculture, leather, e everything all together to communicate, to inform the general public and possibly the decision, the decision makers what uh, livestock, how livestock really operates. So uh, you are the chair of this project and, uh, and uh, I'm going to ask you, as I did before with Carolina Cucureja, a very obvious question, uh, which is how animal welfare is impacting, uh, well, processed meats, but in general, animal origin products. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. I want to thank you also for this invitation. Uh, animal welfare is a very important topic for us, too. It's one pillar uh, uh, where we are working uh, very seriously. And uh, at the same time, it's a very complex uh, concept. It's not very easy to understand. We saw during the, the other presentation, also this morning, the, the, the opening speech, the, the keynote speech, about uh, uh, the perception, the different perception also of animal welfare, and how, at a certain extent, uh, there is a common ground to define what is animal welfare. But at the same time, with different perception, with the ideology entering into this discussion, it's quite, uh, uh, from time to time, it's not easy to define a specific uh, area where we can uh, enter into the concept of animal welfare. This is one of the challenges that our sector, for sure, uh, has faced in the, in the last years. 
but uh, having told this, I must be, um, uh, I'm open to say that animal welfare has an impact on what we sell into the market. So animal welfare is, uh, is um, one of our assets that we have to, to guarantee. We are not the one going, uh, uh, taking care of animals directly, but we have a due diligence uh, uh, duty with the consumer in order to select and to follow that the process and the rings of the chain before us are consistent with the animal welfare rule. At the same time, as we saw this morning, animal welfare is interlinked with the animal health. Uh, more and more with the concept of one health is something that has also an impact on uh, human beings and uh, uh, for other different things, for ethical concerns, for uh, uh, personal uh, behavior and so on, it is much more important uh, for uh, meat processing uh, companies to guarantee that uh, the products that are uh, put into the market uh, are consistent with the high level uh, of animal welfare. So this is uh, something that is not under discussion and cannot be compromised for us. At the same time, uh, and, that, and that's why we, uh, Paolo this morning made reference to a project to meet quality. We are in this project to meet quality because we wanted to assess uh, the, the scope of the project is to assess, uh, first of all, the intrinsic quality. So to define uh, on some objective uh, criteria, what can be defined as, uh, what are the, the uh, criteria to define the quality, the intrinsic and the extrinsic quality of a product and how some specific uh, uh, farming uh, techniques, including also the respect of a high level of animal welfare can have an impact on uh, the quality and the intrinsic quality of uh, meat. We are doing this uh, uh, project, meat quality on two species, pig and poultry. And uh, we, we as meat processing industry are processing uh, um, the species that is much more interesting for us is pig. So, that's why we entered also in, uh, in this project, but uh, it can have an impact, uh, generally speaking, on all kinds of uh, uh, pro animal uh, uh, food source, this exercise. So uh, coming back to your question and uh, closing uh, a little bit the loop, yes, it's, uh, it's, it's very important, but at the same time, we want to guarantee that uh, uh, animal welfare and the uh, impact of animal welfare in our product is not uh, becoming ex exclusive but inclusive, which means that we have to look also into the affordability. We have to guarantee at a certain point that uh, uh, respecting and going uh, increasing uh, the animal welfare is not uh, making uh, uh, those food stuff in exclusive food stuff, mm -hmm. but we have to guarantee that. Uh, anyone can consume animal source food and especially processed uh, meat products without uh, having ethical concerns and without having concerns in terms of animal welfare. So this is the challenge. I must be honest, I saw during uh, uh, the last years, uh, several um, companies, also integrated companies or uh, agreement between companies and farmers to deliver those products. They are working seriously. As this morning, uh, Carolina was saying, uh, we are used to see from time to time the worst part because it's, it's uh, you know, uh, during uh, uh, when it, it comes to communication, in many cases, it's much more uh, uh, profitable for media to show the worst case rather than the best case. But I can ensure that there are there is a serious implementation of best practices, and this is where I see a room of improvement and also a room to become profitable in terms of implementation of animal welfare, always looking into the affordability. Yeah, so affordable food. No, um, it makes uh, much more room or, you know, the, the, the tree falling than the forest growing. And I know that myself because I'm, I'm writing about, mostly about what works properly in animal agriculture and I could have so much more, uh, many more followers and, uh, and selling uh, more copies of everything if I were doing the opposite. But that, anyway, that's my choice. No, I confirm that uh, as, as a journalist, in these times in particular, uh, some unit, they tend to have too much um, 
scandalistic, uh, alarmistic approach. So I know what you're talking about. No, it's also interesting that uh, I ask you this question because uh, it can it can sound obvious, uh, but uh, uh, it's not because I, I'm really. Um, I, I like to hear you saying that because when I was asking the first time I was, I was dealing with this subject, so with the processed meat and, the, and their impacts, in my case, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, they were telling me, we don't know, we don't deal with the, As you said, we are not responsible of animal welfare. So the first time I asked to a meat processor uh, company or a, it was an organization to tell me something about animal welfare, the answer was, it's not, no, it's not our job. So I say, okay, but you don't find a salami on the trees. So th this, this, this product is coming from somewhere. So, and, 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 and I'm pretty glad to see that you, you, you understood this and you take it seriously. Uh, no, for, two re for two reasons. First of all, because in the, the growing the debate and the interest of consumer, the consequence was also the growing interest of uh, producers and especially processors in delivering something consistent with the consumer's expectations. But at the same time, I must be honest, uh, talking, uh, um, it, it was also, we can say something that uh, in many cases was not uh, uh, perceived completely within the, the, the meat processing, even if it was carried on in uh, uh, I, I'm, when I started working into the food sector, I was not dealing with meat, but I was dealing with the, the entire food chain. Uh, and, and at the beginning, I was in the Italian Food and Drink Industry Federation. But I had also, uh, st I started knowing what was happening in any sector, including the meat processing sector, because I had a very strong association that is now my member within Clitravian. They were my member at the time within Federal Alimentare. And looking into those companies, uh, going to the exhibition, the first, I saw that despite there was not a huge, as you said, it was more or less the same time 12 years ago, there was not this big uh, knowledge of animal welfare, neither advertisement of animal welfare. But in many cases, I showed that already at the time, uh, companies were working even if they were advertising it less. So it was due to the consumer perception, which was not uh, the same as today on animal welfare. The ethical, uh, uh, the ethical concerns were a little bit different. At the time in Italy, there was much more the debate on origin labeling rather than on animal mm -hmm. welfare labeling. So, you know, the waves uh, and companies were following the waves, but, but it is a very, something. very long time ago that companies started also in the processing chain to look at the due diligence level into what they were sourcing. And but they were, they were not sourcing. communicating. It. They were not communicating. And, uh, Maybe, yeah, the problem is the interest and now how the market is changing because these are also revolution that are market driven i must speak let's speak about the market revolution the no, no the the consumers because uh, i you mentioned the meat quality project and also paolo ferrari before and i'm following it a bit from from far on the social media i check the website and i know there are also some interesting studies reports that uh, that uh, uh, that you have published through this project. And uh, I want to ask you something in particular, speaking of the, of the consumers, because we all uh, demand uh, uh, animal welfare and we want uh, animal welfare to be guaranteed and blah, blah, blah. But, <laughs> so Andrea Gavinelli was uh, speaking before about the, the knowledge, let's say, of these topics, uh, very low in Italy at least, but are really people willing to pay more because I see a lot of noise, but then when I speak to now not uh, uh, I mean, on average with average people at the supermarket, friends, neighbors, when they have to spend a few cents more, particularly in this period, they are not really keen. That's the, the man of the street. No, that is. Uh, do you have any data uh, showing that people are willing to pay more if a new legislation, uh, uh, accreditations, or whatever? are uh, elevating the wealth, animal welfare standards? De depend, uh, it depends on uh, at what stage you are uh, assessing this consumer willingness to pay. If you are assessing at the entrance of a store, at the entrance of the supermarket, 
more or less, I think 90, 95% maybe are, can, can confirm mm -hmm. our willingness uh, uh, to spend more in order to have uh, more. So they ask you when you enter the wealth. supermarket, if you, you say yes. Then if you look into the purchase decision, you see that it is not consistent in many cases with what consumers are saying before starting. Uh, uh, and the, you have data about that because I see yeah, Felipe we, nodding we, already. We, uh, <laughs> when we started assessing also in the mid quality project, the consumer perspective, we uh, looked into a very interesting study carried on by IRTA. They started in 2015, also mapping uh, the decision of purchase with the specific glasses that were, so they gave to consumers some questionnaire, consumers answered the questionnaire, and then when they were buying and they were making their decision of purchase, this was in many cases not consistent with what the consumer declared. We have different elements inside. First of all, not always, and any of us, I include also myself, when we buy, we are uh, not always rational. So it makes, we, we, we start with an idea and then we can finish our courses with a different, a completely different idea. And this is one, one, uh, one reason behind that. Then there is the second reason, the price. When it comes uh, to make your decision of purchase, you look into the product and for sure you are also looking into your capacity of spending. And in many cases, despite you would like to spend more to get something more, you can't afford this. And so the decision of purchase, once again, is not consistent with what you told at the beginning of your, uh, uh, we, we can say, a, the beginning before entering into the supermarket. Then there is, uh, there can be other 1000 of different reasons. The uh, only effective thing that we have is that if we make a questionnaire before and then we look into what we have into our uh, shops bag, into our shop bags, it's quite different for the overall majority of consumer. Then there are the ones who are coherent, they go, they want specific things and they select. But in the majority of cases, it's not like that. So that's where studies are also from time to time demonstrating that there is a completely different approach in terms of the uh, willingness, the declared willingness and the real and effective willingness of consumers. Yeah, so you're confirming a bit the feeling. And maybe we'll go back with the... Uh, but with, uh, she can, uh, Mark yeah, can also, also Mar yeah, Mark can, uh, with... can confirm this and can also give a, a better insight on this, I think. And uh, thanks. I ask you one last thing before letting you go. Um, would you think promoting better integration uh, of animal welfare uh, into uh, existing uh, veterinary operations because uh, we spoke also about the you know the beginning of the of the production chain is uh, is possible it can be yes it can be a good a good option i look into one uh, one system uh, you know uh, as this uh, morning andrea was uh, andrea gavinelli was explaining uh, we have a lot of different schemes now in place uh, in uh, in the european union and this is also one one challenge that uh, I think the reform on animal welfare should tackle in order to arrive at a common, uh, with a, we can say, a common ground applicable for everyone, which can give also a certain degree of certainty to consumer. On this, on your question, I look with uh, interest since a long time, a system that is, uh, um, uh, that, that was uh, designed in Italy, a scheme which is classifarm. And, uh, with a sort of classification, uh, multifactorial classification, including also animal welfare, but not only, also animal health. Again, the approach looking into the one health approach, which is very important and which I look and I believe it, it will be the future of, uh, uh, of the, the, the animal welfare system, because we have to, to look and to consider animal health and animal welfare as two sides of the same, uh, we can say the same, the, the, of the same shape. But at the same time, uh, this, this classifarm system is also answering to this question, integration of 
animal welfare into the veterinary control. So for the, the vet authorities, it would not be an extra effort, but they would also have something ready to eat included into the normal system of official control, which can be very inter interesting for sure, for sure. Uh, this is uh, an exercise that should not happen at national level, but it should happen at the EU level, as we, as Andrea Gavinelli was saying today, with a reform and with some common grounds that can help implementation at national level in the way of classifying, but with the common, with the specific and common references for everyone, because we should not find ourselves confronted with systems that are giving different perception of animal welfare so that what is animal welfare in the Netherlands is not animal welfare in Spain and either in Italy. That, that's what, uh, as European Association, we would like to avoid for sure. Great, thanks. Uh, I, I go to really to Felipe, not only because uh, he's the next one who needs uh, to leave earlier in case uh, we finish late, but uh, is also the general secretary of the Spanish Association of Distributors, Self Services and Supermarkets. So, <laughs> retailers and so on. So, it's, it's uh, really as uh, in this third part, uh, uh, in this third roundtable, we are speaking of uh, the importance of animal welfare for consumers. You are the best uh, one to, 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 I can speak with. And I ask you, of course, uh, in your opinion, according to your experience and your expertise, what is the best way to guarantee high animal welfare standards to consumers? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, I would like to say thank you for the invitation, which is a pleasure to be here representing the Spanish uh, food retailers and, and wholesalers. I think it's easier. Yeah, yeah just leave it. I think, uh, I think they can it, regulate the volume in case. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah. So um, I was trying to ask you a question. I think we, we have a very, very, very great experience in Spain uh, and the, the work that the interventions have developed during this last year, during last years, I would say, it's not been easy, it's, not been, it's been very hard, but they have uh, focused extremely on having all the collaboration of all uh, links in the food chain, all members and try to put uh, everyone together with, uh, with uh, well, a common view to uh, a common objective where uh, we want it all to go. Because we have the problem uh, at supermarkets level, we have the problem that we, that we receive every day people who want to put their, uh, their stamp in the product. And there is no place to put all the stamps that everyone wanted. You know, EGPs, uh, origin denominations, uh, organic farming, uh, this bottle is okay with the plastic directive or blah, blah, you blah. You cannot see the products the, anymore then. <laughs> uh, and, and at the end, what we see is that consumers don't, don't many times don't understand what the, the stamp say. Even when I have a, 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 well, a personal example uh, with my uncle that she was buying uh, uh, chips uh, uh, with the brand Lays, thinking that they were light. They oh. were they they were very well to to eat them because they, they, they she she was not going to become fat so that's a, a key example <laughs> poor okay. poor health but but it's a key example about the the confusion that uh, there is at at the consumers level that I would like to say they are not stupid so this is not the message that I want but but, no, but you get confused sometimes it's quite confused what we are what do we want to communicate i think uh, the stamp that has received more support economic support during last 15 20 years i would say it's organic farming if you go around the street and ask everyone what these stamps tells you or what sometimes what the people think that is better for health and things like that which is not the focus or or the aim. so it's quite difficult to introduce the, the the information that there is the behind a stamp and in the in the in the mind of the consumer but at the same at the same time what we are having is these mega trends asking us all in the food chain as paolo has explained that we have to go further to go step by step going in the way of the sustainability of assuring uh, food security and 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 the higher quality that we can uh, assure. So, so this is something that we cannot forget, and this must uh, make us give these steps, go walk, walk in. 
trying to not to lose anyone during the process because i think if we create uh, a system we have to try to keep all farmers keep all industry keep all operators in and not forget these three or four that are not going to be allowed to 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 uh, to, to invest to to be okay with these obligations i think is this process must be tasteful i would say and that's something that the, the Spanish interbranches have had very clear since the first day. And, and I think this is quite one of the key elements of the success. We are better today than we were five years ago, I would say. Probably worse than we will be in five years. But I think we are going uh, straight and, and, and doing this, this work together, which is the only way to try to. And then what we have to do together is to explain consumers what does it mean, what we have built. And probably we have to find a way to to communicate that in a very, very, very simple way, because for us it's very difficult and, and it's not simple because all the work that is behind the work that we have done during the last year, it's, it's quite, quite big. But we have to look at uh, to look for the, the way to communicate easily with three, four messages that make everyone to understand that they can have confidence on these products and uh, how the animals are treated during the process. When you say we, you mean, uh, I mean, also your sector, because uh, I think uh, it can be done a lot. I've seen the example now without uh, advertising anybody of Coop in Italy. They, they, now I don't know, but in the past they were uh, informing a lot, but also about environment in general, environmental impact, not only about uh, products and uh, and this kind of so I, I think you can uh, have a quite big reach <laughs> you yeah. see? so the, the, the problem that we have sometimes is that we want to communicate very fast mm. and what we communicate uh, ha have consequences to the operators that we have behind so we have to take care about that and we cannot go it's uh, well it's something that we have discussed internally we cannot go faster than the rest of the sector because yes. this this will not work. And it's, for me, it's it's one of another key element to to to, to take into account. Yeah. And uh, sorry if I stress this point, I insist, but uh, you are surely again the right person to ask this question. So you are having all the data about the purchases and what people are buying, and uh, you are monitoring that pretty close. It's, I, I I would say so. Uh, how are consumers reacting to animal welfare higher standards are they really caring of it well now it's connected to what paulo was saying yeah, yeah, yeah i am fully agree with him i think there, there is a mega trend behind that the consumers are asking for that but when their their habits their consumption habits are uh, influenced by other variables that we we should not forget uh, all the studies that you can read about the variables that impact uh, consumers to decide where they buy their food products. Uh, you can read the same results. There are three variables, which is proximity, the store is or not close to their house, price, it's always on the table, and quality. And it's in this part, the quality part, where animal welfare has an opportunity to, well, to, to explain how can we translate the work that we do uh, on, on in terms of uh, animal welfare how is translated into quality, into, uh, quality. quality. and but this is the 30 percent of the herd of each consumer so we, we 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 do not we should not think that we are able to to well to to occupy all the the whole herd because the consumers make uh, use other variables in their formula to decide what products and and uh, they buy diary so and that that's the that's the field let's play there let's explain them that we have done a very very hard job and very rigorous job and which is uh, the, the part of the first question that you did that i haven't answered how 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 must the, this be managed i think it's very important to present the consumers a very serious system because we are responsible of what we are writing in the labels and what we are writing in the messages that we send to the consumer. So for us, it's very important. I, I know I'm not an expert about our system, but it is also audited by third parties, as the, the colleague from the textile sector has explained before. And for me, that's crucial also because we have to be uh, well, 
we have to have the capacity to explain the consumer in every moment that what we are writing in that label is clear and it's right and, and, and there is a, there is people working to 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 assure that this information is quite but at the same time this allows us to adapt the 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 production systems the 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 the, the product the presentation to the consumer because the market the market is very dynamic so Sometimes regulation is very uh, well. It has not the, the 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 flexibility that we all need to to respond the consumer demands very fast. And for us, it's quite relevant to uh, to, to 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 use these kind of systems that we uh, are all concerned that are easily and, um, and and more useful for achieve the new demands and and requests from consumer, which is our job at the end. So. Yes. And for that uh, aim, the connection and the collaboration among the food chain uh, members is it's relevant. It's quite important. And speaking about the, the food chain, I, I ask you what uh, I asked before, Andrea Gavinelli, when I took the opportunity to speak of these uh, sisters in Spain, which is a story which touched me pretty much. Uh, so I ask you kind of the same thing. Uh, if the regulation about animal welfare on animal welfare is becoming too demanding in the EU, in the EU. Who's paying for that? Are the costs uh, finally going uh, on the on the consumers? I guess, or 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 is spread uh, along the the production no, chain? Uh, it's clear that because it's a difficult time. I mean, it's, uh, I, I see myself big increases in prices so so yeah, it's it's quite clear i i think it's uh, we, we we have to to be clear and to uh, be able to explain everyone that put more ingredients on the soap and uh, make a, an exp a more expensive soap this is quite clear and and um, we have the the well sometimes we have the discussions also with 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 farmers for example last week i was discussing at the economical social committee about this demand that the honey producer have to to they want the industry and the retailers to identify clearly the percentage of honey and the origin of this honey uh, in the label so it's i i understand perfectly what they want and, and in terms of transparency for consumers is quite quite good to know i would like to know if this honey is from china from spain from argentina is is it so important how, uh, the percentage of how much money from argentina how much money um, honey sorry from uh, mexico does it is in the, in the bottle that i am buying because i think this is not relevant for the consumer decision but the problem is that to assure that uh, this information written in the label is exactly what the bottle has is so 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 expensive so mm. if the final price of this barrel of honey uh, is 20 euros and nobody is going to buy it what are we doing we are losing our focus which is the consumer and and, and we have said before that price is one of the three variables that impact and influence more the decision the, the, uh, of, of buying uh, uh, agri-food products. So I'm not saying that we have the same problem here in this sector. I think this, this is, uh, the, of course, there has been the discussion about the origin. And, and of course, I'm, I'm in favor to give the consumer the information about where the, the, this meat comes from, of course. But we must look at the, the balance to assure that the final price of this meat or this product to, uh, available for consumers is, uh, is is on the market because then there are other products and the consumer will uh, move to other we, we are seeing now the problem that we are having in Spain with the prices of olive oil it is uh, a product that it, it was about the price was three euros one year and a half ago now it's 10 euros so the, the consumers are moving because they cannot pay the price that we have today for 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 the and, and the volume the consumption the volume has decreased 25 percent in one year so the question is are we going to uh, uh, have uh, these consumers that we have lost in the future i think in the meat sector this is a question that we have very clear if you lose a consumer it's very very difficult to yeah, to take back. them back so i, I think we, we must be uh, very clear on this and have this this idea on the table always in the discussions and and the decision that are finally taken. So 
the regulation, the question about the regulation, I prefer the, the system that we have created, which is more flexible and, and easily adapted to, uh, uh, to consumer's demand, which is our most important issue in this, in this work. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, now, Mar. Maestre, the, the only lady, strangely, this afternoon, you are a minority. It was not like that this morning. Uh, managing consultant, food policy, not, with, uh, not to do with animal welfare this time, at uh, ICF Consulting, which is a company operating worldwide and providing data, insights, and deep implementation expertise. And you made, uh, as, a, as a consulting company, quite a few reports for the European Commission as well. Uh, one of these... Uh, was a couple of years ago the study on uh, animal welfare labeling and you are you were and you are one of the main authors huh? so uh, i'm asking you of course what what were the main findings of this study and uh, Filippo was speaking about uh, the prices now compared to uh, the prices two years ago prices are not the only things who which have changed these last two years in Europe and in the world. I ask you, of course, what are the, the main differences that you see now uh, compared to two years ago? Thank you. Thank you very <laughs> Thank much. You. And <laughs> easy question to answer. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so as Andrea was mentioning, we published a study I think it was actually, it was completed a bit before that, but it was published early 20. 22? Ah, okay, less than Yeah, please. so it's okay, less so. than, yeah, I, I thought it was before that. Uh, and it was a study that the DG Sante Commission asked to do, and it was trying to understand the state of play of animal, animal welfare labeling in the EU. We looked at it from the consumer perspective and from an industry perspective. So from the consumer side, we completed a consumer survey that asked all consumers in the 27 EU member states, it was 400 consumers in each country, questions around their awareness on animal welfare. We asked them questions on willingness to pay, on purchasing behavior. And then we also did a mapping of 51 labels across the European Union. Unfortunately, the label today was not yet available, so it was not included on our mapping. But we did look at a range of labels in the European Union, trying to understand what animal species they cover, whether it was led by an NGO, by the private sector, by governments, what level of certification, auditing they had, what type of animal welfare, whether they were covering just on farm or also slaughter, killing, transport, etc. So it was quite comprehensive. <coughs> And then we also did a series of case studies to try to unpack a little bit more what impacts the label had on the different actors of the supply chain. I mean, this was only eight case studies. We've talked about 51 labels in five countries or six countries. So it's not representative, but it gave us a bit of a flair of what it means to be part of a label, why farmers choose to be part of a label, what it means for processors, retailers, etc. So what we found and it's kind of all been more or less said today but what we found is that consumers were very keen on knowing and understanding more about animal welfare they don't know what animal welfare is they don't understand how animals are kept they don't understand how animals are processed that there was no understanding of what it actually means what it actually implies and that's probably because what we've been saying there is no consumer awareness, there is no information, there is, so I, th I think that is really interesting and quite linked to, again, there was a high willingness to pay, but on the purchasing behavior, the responses were much lower. So that again, there is this willingness of consumers wanting to, they're like, well, of course, I, I worry about sustainability, I worry about animal welfare, but it's really hard. We all have on our heads multiple things that we are thinking about every day. And if you don't really understand what an animal welfare means and what the label is trying to tell you, and you have to pay a bit more money or a lot more money, it might be quite difficult to then choose or prioritize that. So it is true that there is maybe not a follow through behavior for, from consumers, but it's difficult to know whether that is because they don't want to pay more, 
because they don't understand what it means, because they're confused by the labels. That was not very clear on the study. Uh, on the industry side, some of the findings that we found was that, interestingly, there were 51 labels. But they're only present on, I think it was 11 or 12 of the member states. There are 16 member states that had no national level label. So that means that the, the labels in the EU are quite concentrated in a few countries. Some countries, most of the countries had more than one label, sometimes more than one label for the same animal product. So again, that creates confusion. You go to the supermarket, you're going to buy poultry and you know some chicken fillets. And there, one has a label, another one has a different one. Prices are different. One doesn't have a label. You just don't know what, how do you choose? It's, it's quite complicated. So we did find that it could create a bit of distortion in the market, this kind of presence of labels. And labels were, of course, when you are increasing your welfare as a kind of, as a farmer, as a processor, as, a, as an industry, you want to show that to the consumer. But if there is no overarching framework, which Paolo, you were mentioning too, it's difficult for the industry to say, well, how do I prove that I'm doing a bit better than the, than the legislation? I differentiate my product, but the consumer is not going to understand it. So I put my own label, but then my competitor is doing their own label. And then it just, it becomes a bit confusing for industry, not knowing what to do for the consumers, not knowing what to choose. Also for intra-EU trade, we found that, for example, Spanish producers were producing at a high welfare in Spain, following certain requirements, being audited in Spain and having a label there. But then if they wanted to try and sell their products with that label in Germany and in the Netherlands, the certification companies in the Netherlands were like, no, no, we need my auditor to audit that, but I'm not going to go to Spain. So you can't use your label here because we don't really know so what you it certify says. It in, in the Netherlands and you cannot uh, use this certification in Spain. Yeah, because it's a national level one. So then it leads to consumers in a specific countries linking label to higher quality or to national preference against just, just distorting the, the capacity to perhaps trade for some uh, producers as well. So, so I think some of the findings led to a proliferation of labels in the EU market, some really high quality, others maybe less so, but just kind of creating a bit of distortion into how industry can trade, how they can move freely their produce and kind of compete with other national level producers, and then consumers being a bit confused around what to choose. Yeah. And <laughs> so, yeah, so that kind of led to kind of the roadmap that Andrea Gabinelli was talking about. The, yes, the impact two, two years ago. This, that was two yes. years ago, and things have changed today. I mean, it's difficult to know. We know that new labels are appearing, so the, there is going to only increase potentially the number of labels in the EU. We think consumers are still interested and want to understand better what it means. So yeah, it, it's, hmm. it's chicken and egg situation. Exactly, and the, and the question is, uh, is the same. So what Felipe was mm. saying is that they're costing a lot on top. And again, who's paying? So that is another interesting element, who's paying. It, it mm -hmm. depends on the label, it depends on the criteria. It is not a clear, it depends on the animal. Some animal, in order to have high welfare for certain animals, you do need to change your farming, your facilities, your infrastructure, that will cost a lot of money for the farmers. For other animal welfare criteria, it might be a bit more affordable. It's not that difficult to apply. It's just maybe changing the way that you're treating the animals, changing the way that you're daily caring for them. Or So it, it, is a, a, it differs. On the case studies we did that we looked at different products, we found that at the end of the chain, some products with higher animal welfare standards had a very high price difference. So for, there were certain types of products that are considered more luxury products that you can price at a higher point from a high welfare quality perspective. But then we found that products like the more basic products like milk didn't really have that premium price. They were very high welfare as well. The farmers would have done the, the same kind of invested in the infrastructure, et cetera. But at the kind of final price point, it, it wasn't that because consumers are not going to pay a lot more for milk just because it's a basic product. So if you're looking into cheeses, 
maybe at the end of the chain, there is a, you know, there are retailing pricing strategies and you can use those to kind of up the, the price premium on certain products and not on all, on all of them. So the cost was distributed across, across the chain. Farmers were bearing a lot of the cost. That's what we found. I guess mm. it was a select number of case studies. Uh, mostly a lot of the costs are one of cost in terms of infrastructure and changes. Some were recurring costs, but those were smaller. Uh, and then in terms of the price premium and who was receiving that, what we identified on kind of the case studies that we did, it was the farmers were not receiving the price premium. That was, I think, they, the, the price premium was distributed across the chain, but the farmers were kind of investing more and covering the cost. They were not losing any money, but they were also not maybe being able to really experience that premium as much. We did find a couple turning, of examples where there were cooperatives mm. Mm. that they, the farmers had got together. They were able to negotiate better pricing points for their higher animal welfare, and then they were getting a bit more money. And that was in, in countries like in the Netherlands and Germany, we identified a few examples that there were some strategies where, where farmers were able to. But yeah, everyone pays a bit. No, if that's an answer <laughs> it's uh, no no absolutely thanks must be difficult to be a farmer i would say nowadays and um no thanks for the time being miguel angel higuera the one and only finally you were supposed to be the first one speaking today you're nearly the last the second last one which is nearly record no thank you for joining i know it was quite a, a journey so thank you very much you're the president of the Animal Health and Welfare Working Group of Copa Cogeca, so, so the farmers and agri cooperatives in the EU, and a member of the European Animal Welfare Platform of the European uh, Commission. So <laughs> you, you can speak about animal welfare, I would say. And uh, what I ask you, of course, uh, considering your, uh, your role, is uh, um, what is the view of uh, European or the European Union farmers when it comes to animal welfare. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And also thank you for inviting me and, and, and apologize also yeah. for <laughs> this morning because uh, my flight was delayed. So unfortunately, no, no I don't be able to, to participate in my panel. So thank you so much also for the Old College for allowing me to, to share the stage to, with all of you. So thank <laughs> to you. To hosting you in the room. Thank ranking. you so much for that. Thank you so much for that. Animal welfare for us, for us, a farmer is, I think, a key element. I think one of the things that we have to work every day in the farm is with the animals. We used to call them the welfare as uh, to take care of the animals because at the end, it's our role. So when we are talking with the farmers, the farmers, I think they have first, related with animal welfare, they have first um, an, one important emotional impact because it's a uh, is day by day. They go to the farms, they go seven days a week to the farms to take care of the animals. So sometimes with the, 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 the consumer and also the society are questioning if we are taking care of the animals appropriately. Okay, the, the farmers, the, the first is like, they feel a little bit frustrated because at the end it's very complex to try to explain to the others what are you doing in, the, in, your, in your day, in the, your day life in their farms. So first, of course, is that the animal welfare is the key element in our farms. We take care of the animals, but right now the animal welfare is not only take care of the animals, it's to try to show to the others that you are doing in the proper way. So not only to be sure that you are okay, also to try to show to the others. Because, of course, when we are talking, when we are farmers and we are in the farms, we are working with the animals, we are considered that we are doing our best, but maybe in the eyes of the others, the difference is that they can find this difficult that I that I can do in my farm. So the question right now is, for sure, is something that is improving every day, is that, that we have as producers, and also in, in the first step of the change, we have to satisfy the demand of the consumers, and the demand of the consumers are very huge. It's sometimes the prices, sometimes the quality, sometimes also the animal welfare. So at the end, as a farmer, we have to try to find what is the proper way to get a product uh, for the uh, acceptability of the of the consumer because at the end the consumer has to pay for this product i don't know if they will be able or not but we have to do it. 
The problem is that the consumer is uh, a lot of difference. Also, Felipe has thought about that. There are a lot of different consumers, and, and we are a, a small producers in a farm. How also we can satisfy the demand of the consumers? So one of the things that we are doing is, as, as a farmer, is to try to to make a diversification in the products and there are diversification of the production also in the same in the same species we have different productions and also to try to allow to the to the to the consumer to choose different products one of the example also has told before that is the, the geographical indicator so you have specific products for specific consumers that you can put there and of course there are the other consumers that they try to get the food in a affordable way and also are asking for more quality in the in the in the food. I remember I tried to show that the quality is not the quality of the nutrients; it's more the quality of the production that is more related with the animal welfare. And also, we have to provide it. Uh, one of the ways that we have is the proactive approach. The proactive approach for the farmer to try to teach and also to inform to the consumer what we are doing in animal welfare is the animal welfare labeling. So for us, maybe. From the point of view of the consumer, the labeling, the most important is how I can inform to the society how I keep taking care of the animals. The second one, of course, is the certification of the system that the consumer trusts in all the chains. This is clear. But for us, for the consumer, is wow, we are trying to reduce the gap between the consumers at the farms, how inform every day what I do. So the, the, the system that, that we have also in the, in the animal welfare labeling is something very, very interesting for the farmers for these views. Uh, of course, everything has to be paid and this is a big world. So the consumers want to pay as less as they can for the same product. And also you have a higher product in the quality on some properties and it's in the best in the same price you are going to buy it so at the end on the link between the price and the and, and the products for the consumers as we as producer our consumer we are going to try to pay as less as possible but as we have to provide this this uh, this food for the for the consumers uh, in this relation what is the problem that we have problem this is not a problem this is our concerns the concerns is that the increase the requirement in animal welfare is linked with increase of the cost of the production. But not only is increasing the cost of the production, the principal problem that we find it is if we increase the requirement, some of the farmers is not going to be able to, to, to adapt to the new requirements. So the first action, reaction that we have in the animal welfare rules is that we are going to lose producers. So this is the first action for sure. This is good, maybe. This is good for the other producers that at the end, the market is a little bit more clever than us. And the market um, to try to, to try to transfer the prices from the producers for the consumers is going to depend about the offer and the demand. So if you reduce the offer, you can also try to increase the prices. This is the only way. How we can try to avoid these circumstances that the consumer is going to pay more because there are less productions. Try to inform to the consumer, try to teach to the consumer, try to drive to the consumer how it's value. So, and this is, I think, the way, because at the end, we represent the farmers and we don't want that many farms close the farms. So we want that all the farmers be here today in 10 years and in 20 years. And we are realizing that this is not the truth. The truth is that the more difficulties that we have in the farms, more difficulties to be a farmer, and more difficulties to produce the food. And, and this is something that is happening. The animal welfare is something that has to be in our day job. We have to transfer our the things that we are doing along the chains. Well, I think the animal welfare labeling is maybe one of the best. But be careful with the extraordinary requirements that we can have because at the end if we have an extraordinary requirements and the third countries have not nothing and we was discussing this morning with andrea gavinelli he's also joking about that but at the end is something that we know is happening is going to happen it's fantastic that the european consumer will be paying more for the producers or for the for the products but at the end if they have the same product coming from another country they are going to buy meat telephones cars whatever you want because the same situation that we have today with the electric car, we can have with the meat in two, three, five, ten years. So we create yeah. an environment fantastic for the electric car, 
the Chinese car are arriving to the European Union and now we can create rules against the Chinese electric cars. Imagine if I change the word electric car by meat. It's the same. Interesting parallel. Um, what uh, now practically as you are representing the farmers uh, on the field, uh, would the farmers need to improve animal welfare? Because uh, the animal welfare for the farmers is linked with the productivity from the point of view of the farmers. So they know that as better you take care of the animals, better productivity you are going to have, more efficiency you are going to have. What is our concern that uh, um, this movement about the increase of the animal welfare and the productivity have to be driving for the farmers because at the end they have to choose what is the best option to do that. Farmers always want to improve and also in the livestock sector in Europe, we are a farmers that are very innovative and also the farmers that would like to implement new solutions in the farms. So this makes me very happy for me because when you see what is the, the, the quality of the farms that we have in all the species is fantastic new to the fantastic farmers that we have. So the farmers per se we would like to increase the animal welfare, the animal welfare requirements because also they feel more for the emotional point of view also for the farmers will be better because really they are satisfied every day with the work that they are doing. What we need, of course, to try to drive these farmers. We, this morning, also Paolo Ferrari was speaking about this thematic network to try to share knowledge between the farmers. So at the end, a farmers usually is a little bit alone in a farm, in an individual farm. So try to help farmers uh, to try to teach uh, one farmer to the other, learn from another country, have more this kind of information, implement it and practical information. Because uh, when a farmer or any any company would like to make an invest, they have to be very sure that it's going to work. So and sometimes when we are talking about animal welfare, you really don't know what is going to be the result of this invest in your farm. So how is working one system and another system in another farm Trying to learn from another is fantastic. So this is the, the way that we usually work as a farmer. The opposite, but it's not the opposite, is uh, can be the legislation that you have to do by mandatory law. So this action and practice approach and also learning is absolutely disappear when you have a legislation. You have to implement it, work or doesn't work. And this is our concern. So we would like to drive our, our, our way to improve the animal welfare better than being imposed. And uh, you're speaking about uh, um, knowledge, information, communication, because sometimes I have the feeling, because I, I like these efforts, like the European Life of Voice, of which you are part. By the way, you are one of the most active people of Somos Ganaderia, who is the Spanish branch of the European Life of Voice, also to inform, uh, as we said. I have the feeling that uh, farmers need to be informed them themselves, not only about the knowledge, but about the importance of communication. I was uh, uh, meeting uh, quite some, uh, some farmers in Italy who didn't get yet what's going on. So it's probably interesting also to communicate internally <laughs> because the others, uh, all the others, let's say the opponents of farmers are doing that pretty well. So. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I agree with what you say. So I ask you basically um, one last thing. So what is the role of communication in uh, taking the consumer to know more or uh, because as we've seen uh, many times today that uh, they, they, don't have a, they don't have clue mostly. So what is the role of communication in taking the consumers to know more about animal welfare? The communication is the key. Also, you know, you are also expert in the in the communication, and this is um, a, a place that we are not used to play with because we are in a farmer, we work in the farms. Not your so job. So we was no. No. until few years ago uh, very comfortable working in the farm, thinking that our job has to be take care of the animals and produce safe and quality food. But at the end, it's not enough. It's not enough because at the end, the food has to arrive to the consumer and the consumer has to know what we are doing. And this is the only way to do is the communication and the communication is so much difficult. We don't know 
And also we have a strong power. That is that every single farmer, every single worker that is in a farm is a possible speaker of what we are doing. So we have a power of a hundred of thousand souls that can speak what are doing. And the problem is that this new system of communication with social media, with uh, this new platform is not arriving so good for the farmers. Maybe because we have a problem that is clear for all the species is uh, the age of our farmer. We have all the sector, we have the people, the average of the people is more than 50, 55 years old. So we have a, a, a lack of new generation of farmers that also will be involved with this kind of proactive uh, communication. So the only way and the only possibility is to try to do as a sector. So consider that we need a professional people who make the communication, who try to create a plan, what have to do, what have to create. And also all the communication, apologies for that, but at the beginning has to be created in the truth. So you can't communicate something that is an imagine or something that is not true. So you have to create the environment that we are going to communicate and this try to show to the others. Realize it, do it, and then improve it. Because at the end with the, the communication is not going to go to solve the problem in the distance between the consumer and the farms. But it's one of the points that we think that we can try to, to, to have a, a better position with the, with the consumer because uh, other people are doing it and we must do it. So all the people are speaking with the consumer about what we are doing in the farms. I think the correct way is that we, that as farmers, yeah. try to explain and say to the consumer what we are doing. So don't speak for another that also are trying to misunderstand a little bit the consumer. So I think the, the communication can be one of the points because at the end, all the measures allow you to improve the animal welfare, improve the quality of your productions, improve also the rural area, Everything is based that the society and the and the consumer realize that uh, we are essential for them in the in the everyday. No, no, I completely agree because okay, that's my job. But uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's not easy eh, to to speak to write about agriculture, animal agriculture. I've seen important agency communication agencies struggling with this topic when they had to produce a press release. So, but about the farmers communicating themselves. Uh, there are some, I think, mostly France, UK, uh, young, mostly young farmers uh, showing what they do on Twitter, and it's incredibly effective. It's transparent, it's honest, uh, people are learning, people are getting uh, involved. It's, uh, it's really useful, but you know, first is not their job. Second, I see in Italy at least uh, many people have an uh, anagraphic problem, so they even don't know what Twitter is. So understand it's not your job. You wake up at four to take care of your animals, you're not going on Twitter. But uh, who is doing that is very effective and, and helpful. So I think that, that, that this communication, maybe as a farmer, is powerful than a TV spot. So yeah, because absolutely. it's a real absolutely. communication. It's so honest. It's, 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 it's what you're real. doing. You're not, you have nothing to, to hide. It's not a, a multi-million <laughs> euros uh, production. So no, it's, uh, it's very effective and I hope more farmers can do that. Uh, do you need to leave, gentlemen? Because I didn't, I didn't check that. So thank you. Wow, three o'clock, sharp. Thank you, uh, gentlemen. I, I let you go. And uh, so Felipe and Paolo, if there is... Uh, any question for you, I write you tonight. Thank you very much. Gracias. <laughs> Pablo, right, take care. So, um, okay, let's move on. Let's do that. Ah, how nice. Ah, ah, finally. <laughs> God. Okay. Um, Luis. Luis Fernando Gosalves. Buenas tardes. Now is the moment to turn on your app if you want the translation. If you have, you had all the time to download it now, so you cannot complain because uh, you are more comfy in uh, in Spanish. Um, you are from the Spanish Society for the Protection and Welfare of Animals, Seproba. So you're basically the scientific authority when it comes to animal welfare in Spain. So what I'm going to ask you is of course a double question i ask you two things together what's according always to your experience 
the consumer's view on animal welfare, again, and the producer's view on animal welfare. Now, not uh, from, from uh, again, exactly in the farms, but not in the retailers, but uh, scientific, from the scientific point of view. Gracias. I would like to start by saying that I it was a professor at the university for a long time. I work 35, 40 years old as a, a university professor, and I worked in the platform of animal welfare, and I worked with Miguel Angel, who created a very important model. I would like to say thank you for inviting me to be here today to share my experience. And I would like to reflect on your questions. The thing is that I have been being witness of these situations since 30 years ago. And yes, what I will share now, it's my opinion, but I would like to share it with you. First of all, I'd like to say, what is animal welfare in the European Union? It's two words, animal welfare. If instead of being two words that transmit something very positive, uh, this was called HU, it would be different. This was a concept that was born in the 70s in Europe. And this was not born thanks to the demand of consumers or of the industries. This has its origins in a very big European framework. And how that's how the ethical and social standards started to be developed. And when we talk about animal welfare, I, uh, well, I, it, uh, I realized that we haven't talked about the aerobarometers today. And uh, I think uh, generally the, the European Union has tried to justify all the changes through legislation. I think there's a real demand. Since 1977, the year those agreements were signed, things have changed consist consistently. So our moral convictions are different. And uh, 150 years ago, people didn't eat so much or couldn't choose, had no choice. But today, things are completely different. And we even have shops open 24 seven, by the way, open all day, thanks to breeders and, and farmers. So I've been reflecting about this obsession about justifying and giving a rational to, for regulations. So, so those should be a conditioning factor for production and uh, they want us to produce better, cheaper, etc. But everything needs a set of rules and standards. So consumers are asking for more, more and more. So I, I always look at the Eurobarometer data. So by 2005, they said that there was a significant demand. They carried out around 44,000 telephone interviews, so an important sample. So, of course, everybody wants welfare. Nobody wants to be distressed. So, when, but the very first problems arrive when people have to start paying a cost and making a sacrifice. I mean, the I mean, I'm referring to all Eurobarometers 2005, and uh, in subsequent uh, editions, those trends were confirmed. So, 
there were international agreements in line with that. So producers try to do things better and better. And the same goes with consumers in how they demand and ask for, I mean, appropriate standards. So as a consequence, we can say, let's assume that from every 100 persons, nine, 90 would want some more welfare. Let's think why the 10 others don't want to, don't ask for more welfare. And this is a real issue because, for, first of all, we should criticize some practices that uh, when, when, when people are doing a great effort and doing their very best to do things better, they are 21st century breeders. They all have their families. And uh, of course, they evolved morally the same as the rest of consumers. So, of course, not only consumers demand and request. So, so and uh, of course, you, pay, you talked a lot about prices. What do we stand by welfare and well-being? This is the implementation of international agreements dating back to 1976 and following years. So those who developed the content of the agreements in the very first directives, they prepared a condition, the operationality, how everyday work would, well, do, unveil. Consumers do not know anything about that. Consumers are concerned about buying suitable and ideal products. So, of course, products, maybe their guidance are organolective properties, you know, with smell, color, there we are a problem, we are facing a problem because what we ca can sell, same smell, same taste, but paying 10% uh, more price. Thanks to those sensory or organoleptic properties. So since 19, the 1990s, everybody uh, speaks about welfare. It, was, it became a hype. But nobody know it was about. I had the experience and the opportunity to collaborate in the publication of many studies and reports. I've been here more than 40 years. So people wanted chickens to fly. Have you, have you ever seen a, a, a chicken flying? They do not fly. They all wanted them to be comfortable and to go everywhere. They wanted, they wished. So that was a solution for, for some of the respondents. Well, those are gener some general considerations about this issue. So let's not pay too much attention to demands, to, 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 to crazy demands. What would... Yeah, if you want HJJ, they don't know what it is about, but uh, animal welfare sounds very nice. So consumers are, I mean, we don't know what they are asking for. So, of course, labeling is important, but you are paying X euros because of this, 10 euros because of that, and so on and so forth. So, so what can European consumers buy. Most of the products are imported. They have no idea the standards by which they are regulated. Just to not go too much against Mr. Gavinelli, it's not controlled. European, regarding European products, if you do not abide and fulfill the standards, you are making a crime. You are committing a crime, a felony. So the
So just to avoid any obligation or duty to communicate the public, the consumer. So we have some standards and uh, it's up to public authorities. But if you are demanding a plus, an added value, that will come with different seals and labels and you'll have to pay 32% more for the same product as a consequence. Do you agree with that or not? So I can see the discussion about labeling. So maybe we should tell consumers that some labels are compulsory according to regulations by the EU. From the very moment we slaughter a, a, an animal controlling the quality of life that it had and also to ensure traceability from the slaughterhouse to the table. Regarding pre breeders, farmers, if we are handling with 21st century consumers that demand clarity, transparency and choose freely depending on, on what we tell it, tell them producers also belong to the 21st century society. They don't live in another planet and they are our relatives, our friends, our colleagues, and they evolved same as the others and they are fully committed. They are not criminals. Let's stop, you know, making them blame, putting the blame on them for everything that happens to us. It's a paradox. And uh, these are irregularities. Let's go back to science. I've directed more than eight uh, PhD doctoral theses. So science sets some goals. So why not set a goal to improve operationality in real farms. So, so this dissertation has a goal and an application. So that's how science should work. So of course, professors and students and, and people from the academia have the freedom to choose what to study. Let's assume you do not transport females, female, heads on a certain species. So what would be the point of doing a, a study, a very costly study to study, to consider animal welfare of transported females? So we need direct applicability. I went too far in my explanation. Sorry for taking so much time. Thanks. No. Um, so I ask you one last thing, <laughs> the question I think today. No, uh, no. I mean, even if we didn't understand completely if or when the, this revision of the legislation will be occurring, my question is, do we really need it, in your opinion? I mean, the current EU animal welfare legislation is not enough to uh, guarantee high levels of animal welfare. I mean, do we, again, we've, say, we've said it today and I agree there is always room for improvement, so that's not what I'm saying, but uh, is it really so necessary in this moment? Thanks for the question, as they said on TV, because I had forgot, I've forgotten to mention that in my thoughts. As I said before, I've been working for the European platform of animal welfare, welfare, so as to improve uh, implementation conditions and circumstances. I could give you an example that can clearly illustrate what I mean. And uh, hopefully I can answer your questions. I was lucky to take part in most of the discussions for nearly four years in the previous regula regulation on transport for animals. Mm? 20, regulation 1-2005. So two, three years attending different uh, meetings for the commission, scientific reports. It was finally approved in a well, highly curious way. 
So, of course, I attended meetings at the Agricultural Commission at the European Parliament, the plenary session in Strasbourg in December that year, and the Council of Ministers approved it at the end of December, beginning of January of the next of the following year. And I have a vivid memory of that. I was 20 years younger, by the way. So I clearly remember we had a representative of producers, Spanish producers, that attended to debate, to discuss potential corrections, amendments uh, to the regulation in April 2005, after it had been published in January. So only three months after that, they were thinking about amending it. In my opinion, it set the highest standards for animal welfare, for transport all over the world. So it's one of the best ones. So the very moment it was pu published, they were already thinking about modifying it. And Mr. Andrea Gavinella didn't want to reply to what he said, but the, the, we developed the agreements by the council, but I don't know whether we should go to a plus, plus, plus after uh, animal welfare, but we are well above and beyond worldwide standards. I mean, across the board, obviously there is always room for improvement. In my opinion, generally speaking, ev everything is fine, considering all the um, links in the chain, because we have a very high ethical and moral commitment. Do you want to change things? Great. Let me know where, when. In quality of life for animals, can we improve their quality of life by doing by implementing this or that measure? So if you provide scientific evidence, Okay, let's change, but not for the mere sake of it. Hmm? We will, otherwise, I mean, we will go crazy. I was doing a, a literature review some days ago. I'll stop here after this statement. We have a problem here in transport. So minimum age of, of uh, young pigs. So I found a, 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 an essay, an essay, in an published in an important journey journal where i read that they the that uh, heads and animals had to go to undergo at least 40 hours of transport whereas here we set the maximum at eight hours either canadians uh, i mean rejoice in harming animals or i mean we are just all over the top. Of course, it's the aspiration to do things better is always good, but just being reasonable, all of us need to abide by the same rules, not only here in the EU. So let's assume that the primary sector, I mean, has to close because we say it doesn't work. How can we? Get, where will we source meat from? Or will we stop eating meat? What's the solution if we are harsh and too radical? I do not go against demand. If you lose money raising cattle, of course you love them. But of course, we need to be reasonable hmm, and logical in our statements. Well, a lot of food for, th for thought here. Thank you. Thank you, Luis Fernando. Um, so, question time. Uh, I would say we can, uh, we can move to the, to the last question for the last panelist left. Uh, I go to my nice podium. I have also the... <sighs> The Madonna microphone now, so I don't make damages like before because I was playing a bit too much with the microphone. I was making some noises. Uh, so I'm expecting loads of questions for the ones who left, of course. Um, oh, okay. Felipe and Paolo, okay, no. Uh, some question. 
Question, Felipe Medina. Oh, God. Are, guys, it's really for the, for the ones who left. Help me. Come on. Where is the gentleman collecting the cards? Uh, okay, maybe I ask you guys. Okay, Michelangelo. Okay, no, no, they're coming also. Mar Maestre. Uh, okay, I start with uh, Mar Maestre. Ladies first this time. Uh, after having listened, my God, how, how long, guys, <laughs> and how small. After having listened to the explanation that Laura Godoy gave us this morning about what accredited certifications are and the importance of the accreditation body being a non-governmental non body, sorry, which means that is an entity that has an international consensus and therefore generates reliability and guarantees for the consumer. And in this new context of dialogue that has been opened after the latest statements by Ursula von der Leyen, do you think that accreditation could be a tool with which we can generate the reliability that the consumer needs and at the same time serve to simplify the numerous and confusing labeling certificates that are emerging every day? Please write shorter questions <laughs> from now on. Thanks. Don't tell me that I don't read it again. Either you got, got it, it or we gone. I got it, I got it. Yes. <laughs> uh... I mean, of course, it depends, uh, as everything does in research and with these studies. I think accreditation can be a way to provide, kind of give consumers more trust and provide reliability. I think the main question is, well, what are they accrediting, right? What is the content of that label that the accreditation system is looking and checking and making sure that it's valid? Because I. I I think what we found on the study, and I kind of got into the whole, a lot of the problems, is like, well, what, what next? What is the solution? Is, is that one of the recommendations we gave is that need for a harmonization, that need for a common understanding across the EU of what animal welfare is. It was being discussed, well, what animal welfare, so what? What are we talking about? What does it mean for a chicken? What does it mean for a cow? And that harmonization is what we are missing. It was true on the kind of literature review we did around consumer trust and what type of labels consumers trust more, that consumers trusted more third party or EU level kind of accreditations or labels or criteria than private sector or national level labels, whatever the reason. They, they also seem to trust more multi-tier systems, kind of similar to what happened with the nutrition type of scoring, where they can have information and, and consumers can have that space to say, well, there are three tiers with three different price points and I can choose with some information what I want to choose from, but it's common across the EU. I go to France, I want to buy some cheese, and I have one label that tells me more or less the information, and then I go to Germany and I have the same criteria across all the products. If it's third party accredited, that would probably be a necessity for that harmonization criteria. It would require the EU to set the common indicators, the common criteria, and then the national accreditation bodies to make sure that that is being certified. So yes, it, it could add, but the question is, well, what is in the label? What's the content? But it oh. would definitely help. Please. Thanks. Yeah. Because uh, for us as, as producers, we know that the accreditation of the system, maybe the, the, the consumer is not going to understand what's the meaning of the accreditation. But at the end, our value that they have the accreditation of the system is to try to avoid look, the distortion of the competence between different animal welfare labeling systems. Because at the end, you can create your labeling systems. You have also a stamp in your products. But at the end, what are behind this, this stamp? What are the, behind this label? I don't know. It. I don't know it. how I see that when I go to the market with this system or this system, how it can be comparative with an accreditation. So for me, the, the value of the, the accreditation is to be sure, to be honest, that this system works and you are doing appropriately what you say that you are doing. And there are not any distortion of the competence because I can create a soft label than you and also market my products with a label. So this is my view. 
Thank you. And uh, um, there is another question for Miguel Angel. Okay. What percentage rising costs are there for a farmer implementing a high welfare system versus a standard system? And what is the percentage increase in price of, high, of a high welfare product versus standard product on the shelf? So in percentages, what are the in increase? I want to start for the second part. That is the percentage of the increase of the, of the price to the, to the consumer. If you have not an, a special system based on a, a geographical indication, or maybe because you have a fantastic animal welfare label, you are not going to have any differentiation in the price for the consumer. But you are going to have a differentiation in the cost. The differentiation in the cost is going to be, of course, depending on the species that you are and also the system that you are reproducing. So I apologize for that, but I am specialist in pigs. So I'm going to also to try to have an example that we are doing in, in pigs. When we compare a farm that is produced the animals with cages, uh, with cages in the part that we are allowed, that is in the far wing and in the service units, with a farms that are free of cages, um, only to build the same farms, because I have very first, very first the, 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 the figures, because the last week I was making this comparison with what some of my companies, they would like to build a farm of 3,000 sows in the conventional way and 3,000 farms in an animal welfare procedure. So the difference is 1.5 million of euros, the same farms with the same number of animals. So this is the difference is only in the invest. Then they have to realize that they are going to have a loss of the productivity. We are with the hypothesis of a reduction of a 5% of the, of the productivity. So at the end, the increase of the cost for, for the, the increase of the cost for, for the same product that arrive for these different farms is around in this, this situation between 10 12% more. So that has to be clear in the situation that we have today. Um, the decision that the farm take is to go for the animal welfare farm. Imagine that. That is something that also was speaking about uh, by, by, by Luis. Uh, the farmers would, would like also to increase animal welfare. They know what is the, the society are demanding. They know that there are right now bigger costs, but also they know where have to be moved and what maybe is going to arrive in the future. So this farm is going to build with a free farrowing house with not any cages. Why? Because really the farmers has decided that this is the way that they have to work in the in the close future with these farms. Also knowing that he has an increase of the cost and it's not possible right now for this farm, the example in the farm, to transfer this increase of the cost in the market. There are not any possible because at the end these piglets go to another farms, these go to another farms and go to the market, to the slaughterhouses, and this mix everything and you can find a chorizo or a salami with a percentage of pigs that are produced in this farm from the 95% and another. So it's not possible to transfer the cost of the production for this place. But at the end, it's more for the emotional and also because the farmers think that this is the way that they have to do. Hmm. And uh, yes, please. Well, I was going to say, if I, if I here, just to reference again the study we did, which the eight cases studies, which was across six countries, one of them was dairy cows in Spain, we had poultry in the Netherlands, pigs, I think, in Germany, poultry as well in France, and I kind of was trying to find the details, I couldn't remember, but we did, for they were all kind of diff, three different animal species, all working with labels, and we did ask and got some details, mostly at farm level, it was difficult at processor and retailer level, but we asked each one of the kind of members of those labels to tell us the cost linked to joining the label and what it meant in terms of in infrastructure cost, recurring costs, some of the labels they have to pay for the audit themselves, other labels they don't, it, it varied a bit, and what benefits they got. So it's, I, I was trying to find the details, but we all have it on, on the study we did. It depended a lot, as you were saying, on the animal species, on the label and on the final product. But what it did look like that final products, what I was mentioning before, that were a bit more luxury products had a prior price margin 
but the farmers were not really seeing that price margin. That price margin ended up being mostly with the retailers and sometimes with the processors. There is a, thanks. There is a question for Felipe uh, Medina, so for the retailers part, but I think maybe you two can, can say something. Uh, I lost it. Uh, is there an issue with how high welfare meat products are priced in supermarkets? Yes, I answer. <laughs> no, if consumers are saying they would be happy paying a few cents more, but then it come out without high welfare, they come out without high welfare products, is this because they are priced significantly more than a few cents higher? Sometimes two, three times the price of standard meat products? I, I would like to start. I think it depends about the products uh, and also about the higher standard that you would like to provide it. Uh, from my point of view, uh, unfortunately, when we are talking about the retailers and also the position of the products in the price, in the, the price in, in the in the in the supermarket and also and also the price is uh, a huge problem because at the end you realize that these two different products with the label of animal welfare and without the label of animal welfare can arrive to the same price in the supermarket. So sometimes the decision of the consumer to buy one product or other is not the price is because it's quite similar. It's because you have not labeled or you have labeled. So at the end, I'm going to choose the label because maybe this product provide more information or I think that this product has more credibility. But at the end, really, what we are happy right now, we have a sample with the meat, with the milk also in, in Spain, that the products per se uh, has not a very huge difference in the prices. So at the end, what is our views as a farmers is that the animal welfare labeling, maybe it's not going to be something positive for the market. It's going to be something that is going negative if you haven't it. So if you not have a perfect welfare uh, label, the, the consumer is not going to choose you. Not the sole so question of the price. So we are not talking about is maybe if at five percent, I would like to choose ten percent. No, uh, this is not also the, the the differences in the price. It's also try to have also the credibility, the trust of the consumers, and they provided the information. So this is so, and at the end, the consumers, not the consumers, the producers can produce the, the product quite at the same price. So we are not talking about the organic products with sign requirements. We are talking about the difference in animal welfare. And also we can adapt our production to be also competitive in, in, a, in a good animal welfare labeling system. Yeah, just to build on that, there are, I mean, we've been saying, what is animal welfare? What level of animal welfare? So there are kind of, I guess, layers or hierarchies or however you want to express it. And not always the more money you invest in a product is going to lead to higher welfare, to higher price. So it's, it's, it's also about the day to day work. What we found in the study is, as you were referring to, is that some products didn't have any price premium. Some products had up to 94% of a price premium, but that wasn't always linked to a higher welfare per se, it was maybe even more linked to the type of product or the type of supermarket chain that was selling that product because that supermarket chain was considered kind of attracting a, a higher end consumer. Uh, we did find quite interestingly, and you were referring to this, that some supermarkets in some of the countries were already demanding producers a higher welfare than the legislation. And if not, they just would not enter into agreements with them for their product to be sold within their kind of supermarket label or etc. So sometimes you even had high welfare product that doesn't have the label, as you were saying, a high welfare product that has it, but it's coming from the same farm or from the same. So it, it sometimes is not only dependent on the welfare, but on the supermarket strategy, on the demand of the time, on kind of whether the supply chain dynamics are changing or not, whether there is a lot of that product at the moment or there is a scarcity of the product, other things, yeah, kind of we saw the supply chain dynamics, retail pricing strategies, sometimes high, if the production costs are really, really high, that will be passed on because otherwise the farmer goes out of business. 
so that it mainly it does come to a point where, where you have to pass it on, but that was not always the case for a high price point. Yeah, yeah, there are another exception that is if you produce a, a small and different product. If this is the only way that you uh, run away about the market, so you are out of the market and you can create any special. But if we as European and also the legislation, we would like that this special niche of the products will be spread in all the production and you are starting another time in the market, in the market between the offer, demand and the prices, at the end it's very difficult to the farmer. So the only possibility is you try to run away in the market and a special short capacity production for special consumers. But this is not the, the reality. So the reality is that we have to provide food for everyone. And it's interesting what you're saying also about the, the, the strategy of supermarkets sometimes, because uh, I have again to think of these two sisters in Spain. I swear I'm not in love with them. But, uh, but they were telling me that often the, 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 the demands about animal welfare are coming from supermarkets to them. It's not the legislation, it's not the consumers. It's uh, for any reasons, uh, a particular chain uh, asking for these things. Private sector, if they have demanding consumers, they would respond to that faster because legislation, as we know, can take quite a long time. So sometimes in certain areas, it can go faster. Reflection is also the uh, apologize for that, the tricky situation of the retailers. So sometimes we face the problem that if you would like to supply some products for this retailer, you have to comply with the requirements of this retailer, not the legislation. The legislation doesn't mind. This is the requirements. So if you would like to have maybe the 20% of the share market in a country because it's in this retailer and you would like to produce, to put your products in this retailer, you have to comply with that. So will be a requirement also to put your products in the market. And this is not any consumer uh, concern. It's only because these retailers decide in the politics that they would like to have these requirements. You comply, you are in. You don't comply, open for the others. And this is also something that is a little bit difficult for us because you have not an add value. You have not a differentiation, a positive differentiation. You don't have nothing for the farmers. It's only to comply what is the requirements of a, another company, no the society, no the legislation, no a label for them. And despite that, they told me again, now connected to this, that uh, despite all this, the demand of this uh, higher quality, sometimes even only or organic products, is so low that it costs a lot to produce free range, organic, and so on and so forth, but then they have to sell them uh, with the same price uh, of the regular uh, product. So it's really, I, I, I'm sorry because I insisted with this, uh, with this story about Spain because I, I was shocked in so many ways after this visit that, uh, that I, that's why I still mention it, uh, or also about the, the, no, the raw material costs. The energy prices, because they had uh, now real story. They had uh, also the the free range, no chickens, and the free range was uh, of course. So I was there in at the end of July, 41 degrees between uh, um, Madrid and uh, and the Mediterranean, basically 41 degrees, everything open. So they had uh, at eight hectares, which is quite some space for the for the free range chickens. Every night, by the way, uh, a fox uh, or some, so somebody is, is killed by, by some predators, uh, risk of diseases. Yeah? But uh, they had everything open. The chickens were staying uh, also because it was fresher towards the, the, uh, the, the, the stable, let's say, and because they were feeling more secure altogether. So eight hectares of desert, huh? not used. and. Uh, they had these big uh, air conditioning machines on the on the roof because you need to keep you know the animals while in the stable the other stable we were there uh, and we had 22 degrees there it was a bit fresh inside but not that much and uh, all the air conditioning was constantly going outside so i mean i was i was impressed by many by many things um I would like to talk about the three main ideas that Felipe talked about, the keys of the decision making. 
for example, that's what you're talking about, using eight hectares to have free range chickens. Another thing in all research, we see that, for example, all these needs to be funded. If you cannot fund all these premises, you cannot sell these products. And thirdly, we have quality. This is just a part of quality. And the problem is that the conditions of the quality of norm at the end do not have a great impact on the flavor of the meat. So maybe some consumers think about quality when they think about the, the color of the meat or the smell of the meat or maybe the origin of the production. That is, at the end, it is just a part of it. And it's a very emotional thing at the end of the day. Gracias. I have three questions for you, actually. Um... I know that we were uh, early and uh, and, uh, and we're going on, but uh, I need to, to focus on these things. Uh, okay. I oh, know well, there is a question for all three. Let me, sorry, one second. Uh, Luis, in your view, so from your point of view, what is going on, what is going wrong in the communication of scientific evidence to farmers? Because that's your... <laughs> okay, it takes too long, I understand. No, 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 no. <laughs> I believe that the problem is that scientists, uh, at the end of the day, they're really far away from reality and not to talk about politicians who do not know what's happening on the field, but the demands of scientists when they propose a study or a project, they do not do it to improve uh, the conditions of life. It's because maybe they have a preference on one issue or the other. And it is also about variables, about studying variables, maybe about studying uh, the weight of the animals, the hormones on the animals, and not on actually improving the situation on the field. So at the end of the day, these, let's say, progress, scientific progress, it doesn't have an impact on the field because it's not useful, so to speak. And there many companies in several countries and where entrepreneurs do not want to invest uh, they do not want to invest in the well-being of uh, the farmers because it does not translate in a because benefit I for them agree with you, and also is because uh, we as a farmer we have also to have more commitment with the with the scientific so uh, we also are complaint with the scientific that they are making studies in a labs uh, in a special condition so it's in our hands to provide commercial farm for the farmers to the scientific to make the test so at the end one of the things is to try to put together the science and the farming in the same place and in the correct place the correct place is a commercial farm so everything that you can develop provide and get information in a commercial farm can be spread in every place in the world. If you make it in a lab, ah, we can make in a question talk about what is will be the result. So, but this is our hands. We have also to open the farms, to also to make different research, different investigations, because it's going to be also in our benefit. I agree. Um, comment. In my opinion, the animal welfare legislation is well done. There is no reason to increase the production costs. On the contrary, the higher the welfare, the higher the profitability. Another thing is to legislate without taking into account the reality of the market and animal management. What is your opinion in this regard? 
I would like to start another time if you allow it, because, because, because I fully agree with, with, the, with the, who has making this, this affirmation. Um, for sure, one of the things that we have to be clear that the European Union, we have the higher standard in animal welfare. Also, that we are also invest during a lot of years to have a quite good harmonization in the different countries. So right now, the, the balance in animal welfare in, in Europe is, is quite well. So why we need to do another step? And also for my question and also for, for our problem is will be the results of these new steps. One of the things that we have to face every day in the farms is to try to get the authorizations to rebuild, reform, rework, or build a new farm. So this is something like try to cross the desert. So it's quite impossible. So if we would like to ask for a permit to increase the size of the farm or build new farms, can take it three, four, six years to do that. So in the context of the animal welfare legislation that also I think the person who make this affirmation is in this line, uh, uh, the requirements is go directly to the reduction of the productions. So only for example, if we go in the situation to the remove and, and eliminate the cages in the farrowing, in the farrowing pens in peaks, uh, we are going to change 4.5 square meter that we have already the sub with the piglets and maybe we are going to move for 6.5 square meter. In high five, not any possible to, to increase the buildings. We have an increase of square meter to 40%. So that means that to fit the same, to fit the animals in these new requirements, I have to reduce the production in a, in a 40%. And this is the average in Europe. So at the end, what are doing? That is the direct impact of the animal welfare. It's a dramatic reduction of the productions. Uh, some of the of the sectors are exporters and others are importers and another are very balanced. But at the end, in our study as Copa Coyeca, is that the results is the same for the other species. Is that we are going to be under the self-sufficiency if we implement the high standard on animal welfare. So uh, at the end, what is the impact directly of that? That we are going to depend on the other third countries to feed the European population. And this is a high risk. So we are not against about the animal welfare or no, we are not against about the requirements. We are going to be also to try to say to the people what will be the impact, what is the result of that? This is your demanding, this is the result. If you want to have this, you are going to have that. That is clear and this is the views that we have to do. Also consider that we have the higher standard in animal welfare. We are not starting in the sub zero. We are also in the high levels. We are, we have inspired another question, which I ask you, and, uh, and then uh, a last one for all of you, but please, yes, uh, Mayor. Legislation? No? Okay. Well, I just wanted to jump in on, on these, just link to a few comments. I can't really speak to all the areas of legislation that kind of were presented by DG Sante in the roadmap we've been mostly involved on in the impact assessment on animal welfare labeling it's not public yet so we can't say much on that but what we can say is that building on on the study we did on animal welfare labeling it identified a series of challenges i think with labeling it might be less controversial and potentially with with the other legislation areas is different but but there is a work of thinking through well, these are some of the challenges that we have identified currently and then what the impact assessment studies do and that's what hopefully will kind of be published soon enough uh, is that they look at different options so they look at what happens if we don't do anything and then it looks at three other policy options trying to explore what, what i mean it, it's an exercise in in imagination based on stakeholder consultations, based on desk research, based on examples from other countries and national level kind of legislation, if it exists, trying to accumulate data to try to understand if nothing happens, this is how the situation will evolve. If this policy changes this way, these are possible impacts for farmers, etc. And then on the basis on that is, is when the commission can potentially take 
a decision or not, but I just wanted to also explain that that maybe for people listening to us kind of how, how you just, it doesn't change out of thin air. There is a process of, of research and kind of then, well, yeah, we're all aware of that. So it, it is an exploration of, of the challenges. And I know we've worked on that on the animal welfare labeling, which is the one I could talk about and not the other areas of legislation, but just Great. wanted to. No, thank you very much. Uh, Luis, you wanted to add something? And then I, I think we stop here because Time flies when you're having fun, but I, I see that we are risking to go over time because we're, but if you want to add something, no, please. No, 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 no please. No. Come on. Don't make no, no, me, I please. feel guilty forever now. Okay. Okay. No, thanks because it's 10 to 4. Uh, so I forgot to tell you before that uh, uh, you will all receive uh, via email, uh, I don't know, later today, tomorrow, uh, an email. Uh, asking you a few questions because uh, this wants to be a can i say co2 neutral carbon neutral event so we, they're going to calculate how much we have we have impacted to be here in person and uh, once uh, all this has been calculated will be uh, take it, taken into account to uh, provide uh, uh, activities in spain to uh, to balance the, the carbon production to be here for us today. Uh, so now, there were other questions coming. That's a very good sign. But as I said, we, it's getting late. So I ask, please, uh, uh, the president of uh, Interovic, uh, Raul Muniz, to, uh, to join me here to give some closing remarks before our final institutional uh, greetings. Thanks. Yes, of course. I'm so sorry. Thank you very much. And for you. Yes, thank you. Close, please. But you were so comfy there. But I'm sorry, but thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here today. And I would like to thank my colleagues and the other speakers that we had today. We could all see their expertise and they have shared very interesting input and insights. Also, thank you to all the attendees, both the attendees on site and the attendees uh, on streaming. I've seen that we have had over 700 visits online uh, but thank you to the people that have been here today in person with us because these exchanges have been really useful uh, and fruitful for all of us in this second symposium of animal welfare we celebrated one thank you to this european campaign to promote animal welfare we gave us the opportunity of reflecting on very important issues of the livestock and meat sector reflections to improve our society our jobs and the day-to-day -day of the industrial workers and livestock workers of europe but also of the final consumer Workers that are part of our interprofessional society associations, and thank you for making this possible. I would also like to thank all the participants because their participation has been very active and they have asked very interesting questions and share very insightful comments. I need to confess that, well, it is a little bit of a challenge to be brief for me. I will try to be brief in this closure speech. I will briefly go over all the discussions we have had today. The Interprofessional Provacuno Interovic and JTT, uh, we have worked together over these two years to um, increase the welfare of our animals. Thank you to this program co-founded by the European Union with aim of harmonizing our legislations and to be an example for other sectors. In this second symposium that we have organized, 
uh, to unify the willing, the European will to better animal welfare. And I hope that there's no doubt that we have a strong will to improve the welfare of our animals and that we're working to achieve so uh, from the livestock and meat sectors. And I think this conference is a proof of it. And also that uh, we will, uh, in the first, and the first panel, we have talked about the situation of animal welfare, both in Europe and outside of Europe. We had Esther Hamelin, Carolina Cucurella, and also Ines Aguda. Esther Hamelin has talked about the development of um, animal welfare in the last 25 years and how from the uh, of the WOH, WOAH they have worked to protect animal welfare and to guarantee basic normative uh, for animal welfare in country. We have also heard about the European perspective on this from Carolina Cucurella. And we have also reviewed some of the animal welfare initiatives out of Europe. We have underlined in the first we have underlined in the first panel that, he, that a strong legislation is needed for livestock uh, workers to be able to guarantee animal welfare. And the importance of consumers knowing what they consume and also underlining the passion that livestock workers feel toward their animals and their jobs. A very important pillar. Carolina Cucurella has talked about the importance of the livestock workers being proud of the products they produce and that legislations and institutions have a great role to guarantee this and to keep livestock alive. She has recalled us that the role of livestock uh, workers, uh, they have the role of providing society with the protein society needs to uh, keep existing. In the second panel, we also had uh, Laura Boyle, Andrea Gavinelli, Paolo Ferrari, and Laura Godoy. They discussed the different ways of creating trust in the final consumer. And they discuss the importance of accredited certifications. And they gave us the explanation of how to distinguish what is a certification, an accredited certification, and the different schemes in the, in the schemes of animal welfare. It gave us some insight in order to understand this situation better. Also, Laura Boyle gave us examples from Ireland and how to take the science uh, to the table in a, viable, in a viable way. She recalled us the importance of using indicators related to animal behavior when it comes to evaluating animal welfare. Paolo Ferrari talked about the work of his in institute and how they share the progress on animal, animal welfare. And he encouraged us to exchange all the experiences and 
information and knowledge that we have on animal welfare in order to improve together. Then we had Andrea Gavinelli, who received a lot of very interesting questions from the audience. He explained that more than 50 labeling systems have been created in the last years in Europe. And that these and that these labels were created due to commercial reasons and not to the demand of customers. He explained how from the European Union initiatives can be created to improve animal welfare, especially through dialogue, which is a very functional and effective way to learn one from the other. He also discussed the lack of knowledge that the audience, specifically the Italian audience, has about the concept of animal welfare. It was also discussed the transfer from, of the price of um, products that guarantee animal welfare and how it affects both the farmers and the consumers. And we also analyzed, well, of course, we had the lunch where we had the opportunity to do some network and to meet each other, where we could go over some very interesting questions. And we closed the symposium with the third panel, the third panel that was about welfare and consumers. We started with a very brief but very interesting uh, interview with Claudio Sala, who couldn't be here today. And he gave us a very interesting, a very interesting case of a certification scheme, not of a meat product, but a byproduct. And uh, how this happens in the textile world, which is a whole different world to the livestock and meat one. And it's a very interesting vision because it takes into account the all the work that takes place in the in the farms when it comes to the creation of textile products. It reminded us how important it is to value also uh, the collaboration with other sectors. Paolo Petruno, he encouraged us to, uh, to remember the objective uh, recommendations of animal welfare, the importance of having objective criteria to be pragmatic and also sustainable and to always take into account the scientific evidence. Also, we had Felipe Medina, he talked about the difficulties that consume, the consumers live when it comes to identifying different labels, different seals, different geographical indications. He explained the complexity that the consumer faces when choosing products. How sometimes, uh, how sometimes at the end of the day, the consumer, for example, favors proximity or other circumstances and not so much animal welfare. And of course, that we need to take into account that we have different consumers and that quality is more important for some, but less for others. Mar Maestre from ICF Consulting said, pointed out that consumers 
do not really understand what we mean by animal welfare and producers do not well uh, perceive a, a higher price so there is this binomium or dichotomy entailing several issues and problems and without clear solution miguel angel higuera the most awaited uh, speaker today, representative of Copacogeca. So he represents a European platform. So he gave us his insights. So he criticized how hard it is for producers, for us producers, farmers, having to explain what we do on a general basis and uh, give a rationale of for why we are doing things correctly, justifying ourselves. So the higher added value is hard to get. To, it's hard to get more added value due to um, further certifications and labels. She expressed the difficulty of uh, among producers in communicating so final consumers well uh, i mean pay a lot of attention to labor to 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 communication so that is not our job our profession so we need the help of professionals for advertising to use the proper communication tools so that we come closer to the consumers need professor fernando gonzalvez president of acedas Uh, Felipe Medina, he spoke about, he has a very extensive record. Uh, he worked, uh, he's mentioned that he's been there for more 40 years. Some of us hadn't been even born. So that is, that is nothing new, no? that doesn't come out of the blue. So he gave us some history, presented the history and the track record of Eurobarometers everything that has to do with the labeling differences between compulsory and voluntary so that our legislation is clearer in that regard and what it implies for animal welfare so that we all have everything clear in front of uh, and uh, a near a clear cut differentiation needs to be made he also I spoke about the applicability of reports of researches so we need all well, practical side it's always important and he firmly believes that things are well done at, in europe we have the consensus of everybody and we have the most stringent systems across the world and we all need to believe it and sell it for what it is we are doing things very, very well. We are doing a great job and, uh, and uh, persuasion is important. So we need to demand exactly the same for what we import from abroad as we do for our exports so that uh, we play on a, on a level ground mm, or with the same rules of the game. That's all on my part. Thanks for your attendance here today on the second European um, seminar. And I'm giving the floor to the representative of the cabinet of the DG, Ms. Joanna Stawowi. She's member of the cabinet <laughs> of the commissioner Janusz Wojciechowski. Oh, he said, oh, okay. <laughs> our, <laughs> not Dostoevsky, as <laughs> the you. speakers mentioned. Yes, thank you also for. Uh, for the summarize and for the to sum up everything yes please Joanna Stavovi member of the cabinet of the EU uh, agriculture commissioner Wachikowski sorry I'm sorry and uh, thank you for being here because uh, first I didn't see you anymore I got a, a bit of suspense you know and uh, I've seen you already here for the opening remarks so I really appreciate your presence and please give us your institutional closing remarks yes, thank you good, good afternoon everyone and it's really a pleasure to be here and to be the last speaker because no one after me can disagree with whatever i say um, but uh, i will try to be very inclusive because as we said it's important to have a dialogue and to bring everyone around the table and to see the common grounds that we have because we do have so well uh, from what i heard in the morning i wanted also to, to comment on some things 
um, admittedly, there is room for improvement in our in our standards, but we do have already quite a high level of standards. So any discussion that we want to have about increasing them should always have a very assertive and strong external dimension. This is absolutely a necessity and we need to be more confident when working with third countries because this is really crucial for our producers to know that we support them and that uh, we really care about level playing field for them. But there are also different standards inside the European Union. So that's why there was this opportunity of bringing forward maybe those who are lagging behind a bit to nudge them, to encourage them to, to, to raise the common denominator. Uh, that, was, that was an important opportunity, which for the moment is put aside, but it's not forgotten. I think it will be taken up by the next commission because simply it is a mainstream discussion. Sustainability is just uh, clear for everyone. We agree that this is the, the way to go. The question is how fast, what exactly we can do, but there is no discussion about actually doing it. And to those who are a bit discouraged today, I always uh, recall that we do have organic farming. So people who want to actually eat in a more sustainable way have that opportunity and personally for me i think what would have been a very well important added value of that legislation was labeling so i also wanted to to bring back this topic of labeling because it is for the i mean consumers need reliable clear and comprehensive labeling to know that the extra money they pay is actually going into increased standards but at the same time, it is important for them, for everyone, to raise awareness, to, to bring information about what animal welfare is, and to give value to the work of farmers. So I thought that labeling would have been really a, an important part of this future legislation, while in the meantime, we remain with all the existing schemes, uh, local, national, which is already a good beginning. But Labeling is also important because we want to work with incentives for farmers, so to have this market premium for them, to have a certain level of uh, what is compulsory, but then those who are willing to go further can do that with, with labeling and get the market premium. And why is it important to be careful about raising the standards is also because ultimately farmers do pay. I heard in the morning that uh, farmers don't want to pay. Well, nobody wants to pay. <laughs> it's uh, quite clear that uh, we, when we have to bring extra money from our pocket, it's not easy. And consumers can opt out. That's, uh, that's why we have this, uh, let's say, divergence between what they declare, that they want more welfare, and then what they actually do when they go shopping, because they can opt out from these higher standards. Uh, while farmers remain with the higher costs, so to, to bridge somehow this gap, the labeling would be very, very helpful. And finding the right balance, the combination about the common denominator and the extra that is hopefully covered by the, by the premium on the market is really the political exercise we need to work very well about in the future. And I think that's why the structured dialogue that we hope to embark on will be a very important opportunity. And this opportunity that we really have to seize because we don't want more of the same people just talking but not listening and everyone with their arguments. We really need to focus on this common ground uh, as we were saying here and to find the ways to, to bring this agenda forward in the spirit of one health because it is in the interest of everybody. So my own little contribution to that not polarized discussion and to breaching the gap would be let's not have this dissonance or um, competition between between big and small farms i heard andrea gavinelli saying that the small farms are the problem and i could not disagree more because of course the big ones have the means to invest in the in the latest technology that's very good but the small ones maybe can do agro agroecology they have also their own uh, advantages their means of uh, implementing higher standards so I think we should truly embrace the richness and diversity of our food system. We have a lot of potential in the EU everywhere, and we just need to create the enabling environment for everyone to thrive with higher animal welfare standards. So thank you very much. If I said something that you absolutely disagree with, please let's discuss over coffee. <laughs> and I think uh, we are running over time, so it's really the moment to thank you all and uh, yes wish you all constructive discussions in the future thank you
Yes, exactly. We, we managed to be late also today. So it's, not, it's unbelievable. Thank you. It was a great conclusion for a very intense, but I hope interesting and quite balanced uh, day. Uh, and thank you also for this uh, inclusive approach. Thank you, everyone, uh, for uh, being here today. Thank you to those uh, who have uh, followed uh, from remote. I hope uh, that really we can stay on this path of uh, working all together because, as uh, Johanna Stavovia said, uh, it's important for everyone. And, uh, well, I hope to see you again, and I wish you a very nice evening. Take care.